Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Marine Biological Association of the UK. We're delighted to host this event for the CPR 90th from our world-class facilities here in Plymouth. You know, we're really sorry that you can't join us in person during current COVID times, but obviously we look forward to welcoming you back here soon. In case you aren't aware, here at the MBA, we offer a variety of training and events opportunities available to our staff members and non-members. So please do keep an eye out on your membership bulletins, website and social media platforms. And we'll also be sharing some of the details uh, on these and the holding slides in the break time. So please take a look. I should say that whilst we're holding this on Zoom, we will be live streaming to a number of social media platforms as well. The sessions will also be uploaded to the MBA YouTube channel in the coming days. So you can watch this at a later date if you cannot stay for the whole meeting and perhaps at a more sociable time for some of our overseas viewers. I'd just like to say a quick thank you for all the work of the organising committee in getting this sorted. And to all the speakers and to all our attendees, you know, thank you for taking the time to come along to celebrate virtually with us. So as you all know, the reason why we're here is the 90th anniversary of the first tour of the CPR by Sir Alistair Hardy from the SS Albatross in the North Sea. You know, I can't imagine that Sir Alistair could have possibly thought we'd still be here all those years later, reaching over 7 million miles of tow, a Guinness World Record, surviving a world war, a global pandemic, and more importantly, thankfully still receiving funding to run our unique time series. His ideas about helping herring fishermen have grown dramatically over the decades, and today's talks hopefully give you a good idea about some of the areas of our work. You know, it's truly a testament to his design and vision, as well as the dedication of all the staff who've been involved over the years, that the survey has been such a success. But perhaps more importantly, we couldn't have achieved what we have without the support of the shipping industry. We're truly indebted to everyone involved, who braved some truly awful conditions at times to tow for us throughout the world's oceans each and every month. So here today, we're gonna to celebrate our 90th with a series of talks, and they're gonna be in four sessions. You know, firstly, we felt it was important to look back to the past to see how we, we arrived here. So we have talks on the CPR history and development, the survey, and importantly, a talk about why we should take care about plankton and taxonomy. For the first session, our opening talk will be by Professor John Spicer, and that's entitled, When the Wanderer Met the Hardy Baby. John will also be acting as the first session chair. Then we'll have Professor Chris Reed uh, at the MBA and a former director of SAFOS, who give a talk on 90 years of the CPR survey, a potted history. Next, it will be Dr. Alistair Lindley and Tony John, a couple of happy retirees formerly from SAFOS, who will give a talk entitled Conversations Around the Microscope. And lastly, in the first session, Marianne Watton, who's the senior analyst here at the CPR survey, a talk on what are plankton, what is taxonomy, and why should we care? Our second session will concentrate on how we have grown from that first toe in the North Sea to a global community of CPR surveys, with talks showcasing research from around the world. Thirdly, we wanted to highlight the impact and the applications of our CPR data. You know, yes, we collect plankton, but those plankton sit at the base of the marine food web and those resulting data can be applied to higher trophic levels such as fish and seabirds and new societal issues. And finally, we take a look to the future. You know, what next for the CPR survey? All of you who've been involved with our work know that we constantly strive to keep our work relevant, always looking for how we can apply our data, our samples and our network to future issues. With climate change, always so important to us, being very high on the agenda now, it's timely we have this opportunity to share our work with you. We'll also be sharing a short survey after the event and we'll give the opportunity to, see, to say where you see the CPR survey and research going in the next decades. So a couple of details about how everything's going to work. Um, each talk is going to be around about 15 minutes long and most of them have been pre-recorded to help with the timings. And each session will have four talks. There'll be a break of 15 minutes between sessions one and two and between three and four and a longer 30 minute break for lunch between two and three. You know, whilst we're here virtually, we do want to make this day as interactive as possible with time for questions. So I'd like to introduce Maya Plass, our head of comms, and she'll quickly explain how that will work. 
But I'd also like to say that you know any of us will be happy to be contacted by email if you want to discuss any other sort of work or color collaborations or access to our data set. Lovely, David. Thank you very much. Before you disappear, can I just ask you, you're doing a very good job of modeling our beautiful T-shirts. Um, could you just stand up and show our lungs of the sea, the plankton? Nicely done. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> so these are our T-mill T-shirts. So you can get these um, from our T-mill website, which I'm sure one of the people behind the seats will be able to share the link to. So thank you for that, David. And welcome to CP90 event. It's been an amazing year and there seems, as David has said, to be endless celebrations for CPR 90 this year. And it is a shame not to have you attend uh, physically with us here, but the wonder of virtual events is that we're able to have you attend from all over the world. So we've already had Karen say that she signed in from New Zealand. Sonia is in um, Canada, I think it is at 2 a.m. So thank you for all you early birds joining with us. Our registered attendees are from Pakistan to Poland, Australia to Argentina, South Africa to Seychelles and Singapore to Sweden. And I think that sort of represents that global reach of the CPR survey over the 90 years. So a very big welcome to you all. So just to explain the question and answer um, functions and how it works. So at the bottom of the screen, if you put, run your cursor along the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A function. If you click on that Q&A function, you'll be able to ask your questions. And once they're in there, I'll be looking through those. And then at the end of each theme, we'll ask, I, I will ask those questions to the panel. The alternative, so that it makes it a little bit more interactive, is you should also have a, a raise hand function at the bottom there. If you raise your hand, that means that we can then allow your microphone to be switched on. Somebody's just said, don't forget the small eye on the Cypress. Welcome from to Cypress as well. Um, and if you switch your microphones on, you then are giving us permission to record you talking. Unfortunately, we don't have camera functions on due to consent, um, but it'd be great to have a bit of interaction should you want to ask questions through raising your hand and speaking verbally, that'd be fab. Um, behind the scenes, we've got Neri on social media because we are sharing this on our social media platforms live on Facebook and YouTube. Welcome to our viewers on Facebook and YouTube. And if you've got any questions, feel free to pop them in the comments and Neri will transfer them to the Q&A function here so that we can all see. Um, behind the scenes, we've also got David, Maz, Jennifer and Gemma who can answer sort of more specific questions about CPR or any sort of particular contacts, but the general questions will be asked at the end of the panel and hopefully we'll be able to get through all of those. Um, as David also mentioned, we've got, um, so I've got somebody else saying, John Kitchener from the Australia, Australian Antarctic Division here, 7.15pm, hope to last until midnight. Strong coffees are recommended there, lovely to have you with us. Um, and then just to just remind anybody that's uh, joined the site later, we have a survey that we're going to be showing a link for. It's a very short survey, but it does really help us understand our audience, see what's working well, see how we could improve for the next event, the 100th event, which is Monday, the 15th of September, 2031, should you want to put that in your diaries. Um, so please do go straight to that link if you could at the end of this day and fill that form in. That would be really helpful for us. And before I pass back to David, I just wanted to introduce our special guest next. So I wondered if the special guest could please turn their camera on for me. Hopefully we can spotlight that for you as well. I don't know if you can see that. Um, so we have a rather special cake and we are very sorry not to be able to share this with you. Are you all able to see the cake? Hopefully you can. Um, so this is a rather lovely cake with a, um, a cake topping, which is of the SS Albatross, which David mentioned. So it was on this day in 1931 that the first CPR was towed from Hull in the northeast of England to Bremen in Germany. So 90 years later. So this cake represents all those years of tows. And um, it's got a raspberry and cherry sponge inside. As I said, we are very sorry that you can't share that with us. I hope your taste buds are tingling now and we'll let you know how delicious it is. Um, so thank you to Conradi Cakes for delivering that. It was very petrifying drive to the building to make sure that it doesn't, didn't fall apart. Um, so I shall now pass you back to David. Hope you have a wonderful day and thank you for joining us from all over the world. Thank you, Maya. So right, well, to kick off, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor John Spicer uh, from the University of Plymouth. John has been a great supporter of the CPR survey over the years and in fact opened at the 80th anniversary as well. So I'm hoping John has now penciled in for his diary for the 100th. Uh, John's also going to act as the chair, as I said, for the first session. So, John, thank you. Over to you. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, well, it's good morning where I am in St Ives, where I've been doing my impression of the CPR this morning out swimming and not closing my mouth properly. A great kick off to this history and natural history. Um, a personal history, a, a history of the CPR and an introduction to plankton. What more could you want um, from such a, a celebration? Um, three great speakers and you've got me starting. Um, and I'm going to address something which is something that I quite like, you know, riddles. It's a bit of a riddle for you as well. I'm going to share my screen, so just give me a second to get sorted here. And around this riddle, if you want to put it like that, hold on, I'll just get rid of me. Um, when the wanderer met Hardy's baby, now if you looked at that, first of all, you might have thought, what on earth were you, you coming to? I'm hoping by the end of um, my talk, which should introduce the other three, um, you'll have a much better idea of what the wanderer is and what Hardy's baby is as well. So let's kick off. So here's Kate, who's in a, a, a shop called The Green Space in Plymouth, and she's holding up a picture of a piece of plankton done by Debbie Mason. All round about we have fish and you know, whales and everything else, but people here are buying images done by Debbie of plankton. I talked to some of them um, at, the, at the shop, because my wife runs the shop, and they have no idea what they're buying. They just think they're beautiful. They just look and they still have no real idea what these creatures are. And when I sort of said, you know, what, what this was, they were sort of fascinated, but clearly had not really thought about it. It's interesting, we've still got an awful long way to go to teach people about what these tiny plants, animals, algae in, in the ocean actually are. And yet there's been a really good history of public communication. Alistair Hardy, who gives his name to the foundation, put together what was originally supposed to be one book, a book on marine biology, but in fact it was just far too much for one book. And then the New Naturalist series, a, a series which shows the natural history of the UK and its waters, there are two books. Two books with the same sort of title, The Open Sea, Its Natural History. But notice the first part is entirely about plankton. The World of Plankton, published in 1956. Absolutely amazing book. And we'll say a bit, a, a bit more about that in a second. But notice, this is the natural history of the sea. And yet the part two is not just about fish, but it's also about fisheries. Because straight off the bat, Alistair Hardy and everyone who has worked in marine studies, certainly over the last hundred, you know, hundred odd years, has realized that the natural history of, of the sea is in one sense a little bit unnatural now because we have made such a large impact on what's there. Fascinating um, set of books. If you haven't read them, if, if you've heard about them before, great, that's wonderful and you can reminisce. If you haven't, go and buy them, particularly if you can get the original version because you can see the incredible paintings and drawings that Hardy illustrated his work with. Incredible set of books. Here's here's the page which introduces the plankton. Now, of course, I don't want to steal any of Marianne's thunder, but here is Hardy starting off trying to tell everyone and anyone, as well as marine biology students, what plankton is. And it's, it's interesting that when he was at university, I mean, he was very, very much um, into the, the idea of agriculture and helping and sort of this idea of doing good. Um, and even in this book on, on plankton, he starts to be a marine biologist. He starts off with this, let us suppose for a moment that the herring is not a fish, but a land animal. And he starts painting this idea of, you know, if, if you could look at the, this, the, the sea, the amount of what he calls plant material that's there, that's the basis of all, all the life. If it was on land, it would look incredible. And he uses amazing pictures to try and get across to folk what is actually in the sea, and in particular, what plankton looks like. And he gives in the next page a really lovely definition of plankton. And he explains it's from the Greek Greek word planktos, which means the wanderer. So, and, and he gives a, a, a beautiful little piece. I won't ruin it for you. Go and read it yourself. A, a beautiful little piece where he's saying, yeah, but the Greek 
So it's, it's not just one word. It gives a whole feeling. And he goes into this idea of the feeling of the wanderer not being able to, to look after yourself, being passively dispersed, all this sort of stuff. B beautiful to read. Go and read it after the conference, of course. Hardy himself um, got involved in the love of plankton, really, when he was at Naples. Um, he, he won a, a scholarship to, to Naples and he says, and, and I don't exactly know why, but he says in one of his diaries that he, here he was fascinated by marine plankton. 1921, with his scholarship over, he gets a chance to actually take part in plankton research. Um, it starts on the 1st of August, assistant naturalist at the fisheries laboratory in Lowestoft. And his, you know, his job is involving plankton. How did it come about? Because in, in the 1920s, um, there was a report in the, the, the British media that the French were spotting pilchards in the Bay of Biscay. Therefore, questions were asked in the House of Commons. Why was Britain not doing such surveys to help her fisheries? And so that's, that's what happened. Um, a research vessel, George Bly, operating out of Lowestoft, was if you like, commissioned to try and work out just what is the natural history of herring. And there was four or five people who were dedicated to this, one of them being um, Hardy, and his job was to, to study the, the feeding of the herring, um, now not just as its adult stage, but from its um, young stages as well. And in particular, in relation to the plankton that occurred in the North Sea. And the picture that you can see here is actually um, from from Hardy's um, book on the plankton. And it's, a, it's an image which has been used through ecology texts for a long, long time, um, looking at the food web behind um, the, 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 this particular fish species. It, it, it's classic, even now, it, it's, it's classic. Now, why, why tell you about that? Because this is 1921, right? This is 10 years before the first deployment of the the, the, the CPR officially. And yet what I want to put to you is that the birth for the idea of the CPR and why the CPR came around, came about, I think is because of something that happened, something serendipitous that happened when Hardy was engaged on board the George Bly. So here's the George Bly. Um, one of the one of the, the main researchers, William Wallace, not the, the great Scotsman who shouted freedom and all stuff like that, but someone who was involved in asking where the young herring um, actually were. That was his question. He normally looked after the cruises, but this particular time he was ill and there was a, a cruise into the southern bight of the, the North Sea um, and Hardy was asked to, to, to sort of head it up efficiently. Yeah, very efficiently. In fact, they had a, they finished the, the, the cruise a day early, which was incredible, really. Well, a day to spare. Day early is perhaps the wrong way to put it. But with that day to spare, Hardy says, well, let's go back to the part where we caught the most fish and just actually see what happens when we sample again. Because it was an, uh, apparently it was an incredible catch of herring. So they went back to this particular station where they were looking for the, the herring. They'd found a lot. And he repeated the same process four times, looking for young fish um, at the surface, mid-water, um, and at, at the bottom. Repeated the sampling process four times. And what they found in that one day was that the difference in the numbers caught in the four repeated samples was greater than the entire variation in the numbers at all the other stations. It was also the same for the sand eels and the plankton. Now, <laughs> clearly, that must have been really disheartening <laughs> because how can you say anything if there's no repeatability? And of course, at the centre of this is the whole ecological conundrum of how do you deal with patchiness? And it was in that 1921-22 period that Hardy set about thinking about how on earth can you actually quantify these planktonic creatures? How can you account for patchiness? And that's where the idea for the, the CPR 
really sort of came from. Here's a picture from um, Chris, Chris's paper from 2003. Um, but the actual caption I've given is from Hardy's own book, Great Waters, Proud Father and Son. Because this is this is one of the the early CPRs that was um, that he he was um, trying out in, in the Antarctic waters. Um, after he left Lowestoft, he, he went on to to to, to work in the, the Southern Oceans, and this is Hardy's attempt to address this idea of patchiness. So instead of thinking, goodness, this is just far too complicated. It's just really you can't get the same data. He set about trying to work out how you could sample patchy environments, something that the ecologist Elton was really, really um, sort of amazed at just exactly what, what Hardy ha had achieved. Now, the reason for the proud father and, and child comment was because when Hardy was in the, the Southern Ocean, um, when, when they were trying to put this thing over the side, it was, it was I was going to say it was a side issue, that sounds a bit strange, but you know what I mean. It was something that they were trying out and the crew kept on calling it the camel's bump, you know, when it had a cover over it, it apparently it looked like a camel's bump. One of the, the crew, not quite so kindly, would call it the horse's bottom, probably the horse's bum, knowing a low stuffed type um, approach, but you just don't know. Horse's bottom anyway, HB, and it became a sort of popular thing that it was called um, HB. When they were down in in, in South Africa, a, a dinner party um, off, off the boat, Hardy was approached by some rather posh ladies who said to him, well, can you tell us why this device is called HB? And Hardy's response was, well, it's rather embarrassing. I've only just got engaged and they will keep on talking about Hardy's baby. And so in the, the, the book that he wrote about those trips to the, the Southern Ocean, Great Waters, here's a picture of the proud father and child. So when you hear about Hardy's baby, HB, they're talking about the, the CPR. So here we have when the wanderer, the plankton, meets Hardy's baby. One other part that I want to introduce, though, is a painting that Hardy had when he was at Oxford on his wall. It's a painting which many people describe as being despairing. Certainly Hardy himself talked about this was a time when he was he was really finding it difficult to see a way ahead. The painting's called Hope. Now, you'll notice that Hope, that the character sitting in this globe, is, is blind. And she's holding a lyre, which has only got one string in it. It could be despairing. But one of the things I want to put to you is that the attitude that Hardy showed through his life even when he was at Oxford as an undergraduate about to go into the, the First World War, um, I mean, yeah, First World War, pandemic, all sorts of things happen to students, don't they? He he had this painting of, of which was called Hope. Yes, and he was depressive, but notice that he, even in that case where they're working off Lowestoft, he sees that this is a major issue with patchiness. But rather than giving up, he presses on in hope that he has the hope to get something that works. And his entire career with the CPR, and also when he retired and then headed up a centre for religious experience, the investigation of religious experience, the idea of hope, even against hope, hope for the human race, spiritually, hope for the human race through a lot of the plankton work that he was doing, it is a key feature of Hardy's work and approach. I put together this tiny little um, riddle. Hardy would have loved this sort of thing, although he would have done it much better than me, and he wouldn't have been critical about it. He would have just smiled and said, well done, Spicer, I'm sure. I am small, but a mighty global engine. I wander far, but can't move fast. Embroiled in HB twisted mesh, I expired, but now live forever in the mind of sages. Breath is my heritage but you take mine away, you who shot the albatross.
what am I? I hope you realise that this riddle isn't just about plankton, but it's about the plankton that have contributed to that CPR and have done far more than just about any other plankton. Um, not only giving all these e ecosystem services, but contributing to our understanding of how the oceans work through the work of the, the CPR. One of the challenges that I would like to put to not just the next three speakers, but all the speakers who are, are going to address us is how will what we do with the information that we're going to get during this conference be driven by our hopes and not by our fears. Hope is a central feature of the scientific and personal life of Alistair Hardy. In what way is hope reflected in the life of the CPR? Thank you very much. With that, stop sharing. And next we have an amazing, I would, I would thought, talk um, by Chris, Chris Reed. If there's anyone who can give a history of the CPR, it is Chris. Thanks, Chris. We're celebrating today the 90th anniversary of the first tow of the continuous plankton recorder across the North Sea on the SS Albatross. The photo on the left shows Alistair Hardy holding the CPR attached to a davit in hull docks before the ship left for Hamburg. What a fantastic legacy he's left us. More than 7 million miles of the ocean have been sampled uh, since 1931 and more than a quarter of a million samples of plankton analyzed. And now we have 12 uh, other CPR agencies, uh, other agencies that are working in partnership with, with the uh, CPR program in Plymouth. A large preserved sample archive exists for other work, and we have more than 2,000 publications published since the survey started. The survey's gone through a number of ups and downs in its history. The first major down was in uh, the Second World War when, when everything stopped, starting again in January 1946. In 1989, uh, a, a number of people were made redundant and the survey was stopped temporarily over a weekend until a rescue package could be put in place with the help of Bob Dixon, who was then at Math, Mike Whitfield and Gerald Bolch at the MBA until the Sir Alistair Hardy Foundation for Ocean Science was established to run the survey. This foundation carried on and, until uh, 2018, and in 2017, a, a second round of the redundancies started that carried on through uh, until the survey was, uh, was amalgamated into the M Marine Biological Association. Uh, we've now, against this background, we now, I think, have moved into a new uh, phase of growth. Uh, I'm certainly, uh, I hope and expect that this will be the case. Uh, uh, and the CPR survey is recognized as a world leader in ocean monitoring. I particularly want to thank the many ships, uh, over, over 130 of them that have helped uh, the survey operate over these years. Very many thanks for your assistance and to the port managers, to the transporters to the ports and to the ship and crew and captains. Really appreciate it. Very many thanks for your help. It's pretty impossible for me to summarize in uh, a few slides the fantastic work that has gone over this period of time. Uh, I recommend that people have a look at uh, 2003 paper that summarizes the first 70 years. Uh, and again, I've tried to summarize it in a word cloud. Um, you might recognize one or two of the names in there. And in this period, uh, I wish for the years 1956 to 1992 that it should be dedicated to Michael Colebrook because he played such a fundamental role in that period of time uh, in the CPR survey and in particular in the computerization of, of uh, all of much of the survey work and in research. In the next, for the next 20 years, uh, again, I would like to uh, 
proposed that it be called the Gregory Vaughan years because he again played a fundamental role in this interval of time. He published more than 80 papers uh, dealing with the CPR, including a large book. I, I've got two illustrations from his work, but I just draw attention to the one on the left, which is the uh, showing the very clear uh, northerly movement of warm water plankton to the west, west of the British Isles, a thousand kilometers in only a matter of a few years. One of the clear evidences of major changes in the ecosystems around the UK that can be attributed to climate change. I also draw attention to work on fish traits, on copepods and on fish using CPR data. And on the left hand side, the continuing decline of Calanus vimarcus demonstrated by the survey. Uh, with on the bottom left, the alternation that is seen between this cold water species and the warm water species, Calnus elgolandicus. The diagram on the bottom is from a recent paper by Martin Edwards and colleagues that has looked at krill euphorsids in the North Atlantic, and he has seen a 50% reduction in their abundance. And it, this is one of the few groups of organisms in the plankton that hasn't moved to the north. It, and so it uh, seems to be constrained the area that it can now live in. And it's such an important group of organisms for other higher trophic levels. A number of papers have been published on remote sensing over these years. Uh, I know in particular work by uh, Dionysius Reitzos, uh, who intercalibrated and validated the phytoplankton color index from the CPR, a visual index of, of chlorophyll with uh, fluorometry measurements taken on the PR route between Plymouth and Roscoff. He went on to uh, intercompare the CPR uh, phytoplankton color index with uh, CWIFs and CZ satellite imagery, uh, allowing him to produce a 50 year time plus time series of chlorophyll in the Eastern North Atlantic. And in this diagram built on the bottom, you can see the clear jump that took place around about 1987, the 1987 regime shift. The subsequent papers will, will be, uh, or topics will be covered by other speakers at this meeting, and but I wish to draw attention to the huge potential for uh, the use of molecular tools now in CPR, uh, CPR archives. Uh, due to initial work by uh, Richard Kirby, who made the breakthrough to, sh to show that the polymerized chain reaction could be applied to formal and preserved CPR samples. Uh, this work's gone on to look at DNA metabarcoding, uh, a number of other studies, and in particular work by Luigi Vazuli uh, on uh, a range of organisms, in particular bacteria. And I draw attention to a paper uh, which was published recently on cholera in uh, pathogenic cholera vibrio in Lake Tanganyika at 700 meters above sea level. Um, and I would like people to clap at this moment for Lance Gregory, who went along uh, and brought the CPR and at the same time brought all the samples back uh, for analysis in Italy. He did a fantastic job. And I note at the bottom a recommendation by Luigi that a biodepository of nucleic acids should be produced from CPR archive material. Science policy has been a, a really important area of work in the CPR ever since it started. And Abby mcgottis Scollop has taken this to new levels uh, and showing one diagram on the right where she has uh, used data from the CPR uh, with other colleagues from other laboratories at single point sites. I remember early on discussing with Richard Thompson the potential application of the CP archive to looking at uh, plastic pollution. And he, he's taken that forward uh, in a great way uh, with a recent paper with Claire Oslich shown there that shows the huge increase in large particles. And again, this is work that is largely based on uh, the uh, results produced by the workshop uh, of the CPR group. In 2009, uh, I uh, gave a presentation at Ocean OBS in Venice that recommended that a partnership of global CPR programs should be set up um, to uh, expand the survey to the whole of the world. Uh, in 2011, a global alliance of CPR surveys was set up when, Rich, uh, when 
um, Peter Burkle was director. Um, and one of the recommendations of this group was that regular global marine ecological status reports should be produced. And some of those that were produced have been fantastic. I draw uh, by Martin Edwards and I draw attention at the bottom, uh, or perhaps I should note that I was really excited uh, earlier this year to see this paper from, uh, from Campbell and colleagues, which uh, used the data from all of these surveys to intercompare um, Calanus as copepod species with temperature uh, to test the Bergman's rule. And I know the uh, stars on the map uh, showing the locations of the samples, the areas that have been very poorly sampled in the tropics, a future area for the CPR. And I wish to thank in particular Graham Hosey, Sonia Batten, Sani Chiba and Anthony Richardson uh, for the leadership that they've shown in setting up these other surveys and leading them. The tropics is one potential future uh, frontier for the CPR, but also uh, the, uh, the Arctic Ocean. The diagram on the top left shows from recent AMIP report, uh, shows the uh, modeled uh, likely positions of uh, sea ice in the Arctic uh, over the next century, uh, with the black line showing the actual observations. And they are going down faster than any of the scenarios produced by the IPCC models really concerning because of the huge impact that that is going to have on Northern Hemisphere climate. Um, I note that we have been sampling on the edges of the Arctic for many years, but in 2018 we started sampling regularly on a route to Svalbard through the Barents Sea. And uh, now we're also sampling in the Bering Sea uh, with the help of uh, icebreakers from Canada and Jonathan Fisher will be talking about this. And I note the paper on neodenticular diatom that came through into the Atlantic Ocean from the Pacific for the first time in 2000, uh, 180,000 years, which uh, based on data from the CPR. What a fantastic set of achievements uh, over 90 years that, uh, that has, the CPR has made possible. Uh, it's been possible uh, really because of the maintenance of standard procedures over the whole of this period of time. That is what the survey is built on over decades and may it continue for many future decades uh, to provide the material that has proved so valuable up to now. At the same time, we do need to uh, develop further technical approaches to both sampling and to analysis uh, and to investigation and research but these should not be done at the expense of the core survey. And I draw attention right at the very bottom here to these points to the need, I think, to provide some support for analysis and technical staff in particular, who have gone through uh, a lot of trauma in the last, in recent years, uh, and that also the staff that are no longer with the survey should be given similar support if possible. And I know here also that my great sadness that that, uh, that Gregory Beaugrand, um, Martin Edwards and Richard Kirby are no longer associated with the survey. Um, my very last slide is to try and emphasize how important it is that the ocean be sampled and in particular the ecosystems of the ocean because of their role in climate change uh, and their impact on living resources. The diagram on the top shows temperature change over uh, uh, from modeled results using the Bergen climate model. And the vertical lines uh, show the boundaries of the plot on the bottom, which are actual observed temperatures from the GIS program in the United States, showing the zonal mean temperature uh, for all the different latitudes. And what really astounded me when I downloaded the data from GIS was to see that the same pattern of Arctic amplification is evident much, much earlier than shown in the model results from 20 years ago. Uh, I've been highlighting this in lectures on climate change for many, many times, but people have ignored the fact of the urgent urgency of climate change. Um, many thanks. Uh, look forward to seeing many of you, hopefully before too long, and best wishes from New Zealand. I was going to say thanks, Chris, but I mean, it's recorded, so I'll say thank you um, when you appear in person. If only we could weather 
um, our climate change um, as well as the CPR survey has weathered um, political and, and scientific and funding changes. Next, we've got um, Alistair Lindley, Tony John, definitely people who are worth listening to in terms of the per personal history behind the CPR. Really looking forward to this. Um, we, we can't hear you at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, can you just check your microphone for us? Yes, experiences. This will be a short talk. Good morning and welcome to the history of the C CPR survey, the people who worked in it and their experiences. This will be a short talk covering the first two thirds of the survey. The CPR was devised by Alistair Hardy for sampling from the discovery in the Southern Ocean in 1925 to 27. The version he used is now known as Mark I and he and was rather unwieldy. The, according to Hardy's account in Great Waters, it was known to the crew as the horse's bottom. His association with the expedition and the Southern Ocean was commemorated by postage stamps which feature the CPR Mark II. This was developed when he was professor at Hull for sampling from ships of opportunity and we commemorate the first tow on the 15th of September 1931 today. During this tow Hardy broke his finger saving the CPR from being lost. The start of the survey. This was at the University College of Hull and other scientists involved at this time were Cyril Lucas, second from right, and George Henderson, who is third from right, and shaking Sir Alistair Hardy's hand. Alistair Hardy was appointed professor at Aberdeen in 1942 and he became Linacre Professor at Oxford University in 1946. He was knighted in 1957. He wrote two books in the Collins New Naturalist series, The Open Sea, The World of Plankton, and The Open Sea, Fish and Fisheries. He also wrote the one about his voyage to the Southern Ocean called Great Waters. Cyril Lucas was officer in charge at Leith from 1937 and became head of department in 1942 when Hardy moved on. He became director in, at Aberdeen Lab in 1948. He was awarded the CMG, Call Me God, in 1956 and knighted in 1976. George Henderson stayed with the survey until his retirement in 1969. Regular sampling started in 1932 on three routes from Hull, shown here in black, with the extensions later in the 1930s, shown in red. An outstation was opened at Leith in 1937 to service the more northerly routes. The staff increased, including Peter Ray, who succeeded Cyril Lucas as head of department when Lucas moved on and headed the survey until 1957, when he was appointed Professor of Biological Oceanography in Agricultural and Mechanical College of Texas, and subsequently went on to the University of Alaska. Colin Rees, from 1937 to 56, was very productive in the post-war years, including much work on meroplankton. However, the use of concentrated HCL, which reacts with formalin, to clean bivalve larval shells may have contributed to his premature death in 1956. Most analysts seem to be relatively long-lived, despite routine exposure to formalin and tobacco smoke, which was normal before health and safety regulations were enforced after the move to Plymouth. In a 1937 paper in Oceanographical Research at the University College of Hull, 1931-36, Talking about the CPR, Alistair Hardy said, we aim at linking up the variations in the plankton distribution 
with climate changes on the one hand and the fluctuations in the fisheries on the other. This shows how far ahead of his time he was. From September 1939, there were impediments to navigation due to World War II, with many members of the team serving in the armed forces until the survey resumed in 1946. Roland Glover, shown here top left, was appointed to the department in 1945, and he became officer in charge of the Edinburgh Laboratory on Peter Ray's departure. He became director of the lab in 1967, and when IMER was formed, he became director and moved to Plymouth. He retired in 1983. Sampling was re-established in the North Sea and the V route to Iceland in 1946, together with tows to ocean weather stations in the eastern North Atlantic. The British Ocean Weather Ship base was in Greenock, near Glasgow. CPRs were delivered in laboratory vans from Edinburgh, and analysts were occasionally taken as a special treat. Among the staff appointed in the early post-war years were Dora John, shown bottom left, who moved to Plymouth with the survey. Gordon Cooper, who retired when the Edinburgh lab closed on the right-hand side of the other photo, and William Brown. William first worked on early de development of the UOR and developed the BrainCon recording thermograph in the mid 1960s. First, this was the first recording of physical variables in the CPR. He moved to Plymouth in the early days of IMER and worked on other programs. Dora is shown preparing a figure for photographing for publication in the first days, long before computerized image preparation. Gordon and the other person possibly Colin Rees, uh, were notably without lab coats or any form of protection from or extraction of formalin fumes. In 1950, the department at Hull was closed and the survey was concentrated in Edinburgh under the Scottish Marine Biological Association, soon being established at 78 Craig Hall Road, known as the Oceanographic Laboratory. Jerry Robinson, shown on the left, was appointed to the survey in 1951, specialising in phytoplankton. He became head of the survey and was appointed assistant director of IMER. He continued as head of the survey until his retirement in 1986. Michael Colebrook, shown on the right-hand side, was appointed in 1956. He introduced statistical rigour including changing phytoplankton methods to make the data compatible with statistical methods and eventually introducing computer use. He was the scientific face of the survey at conferences for decades and Colebrook and Robinson were the co-authors of many papers. Michael was head of the survey during a critical period from 1989 to 1991 leading to the start of SAPOS. From 1957, under the direction of Rogue Lover, the survey was extended to the Western Atlantic, initially on the Z route from Iceland, with other routes further south, and including the routes to the Western Atlantic weather stations. This was supported by a contract with the United States Office of Naval Research. There was an increase in staff of whom Harry Hunt deserves a particular mention. He was appointed in 1960, working with Michael Colebrook on developing data processing methods and computerization, as well as being a full-time analyst. He was for a while senior analyst and manager for the, data manager for the survey into the early days of SAPOS. Another long-serving analyst was John Roskell, starting in 1962, and staying with the survey until his retirement in the early 1990s. On the retirement of George Henderson, ex-merchant Navy captains were appointed to maintain relationships with the ships due to increasing 
complexity and frequency of change in shipping patterns. John Beetson uh, from 1969 to 1991 and Peter Pritchard thereafter. Without the willing cooperation of the shipping companies, ships, masters and crews, the survey could not exist. We owe them a great debt of gratitude. Uh, Alistair and I were appointed respectively in 1967, me. Uh, I overlapped with George Henderson, the only remaining member of the 1931 staff, and in Alistair in 1969. Computing became important in the 1960s, but even when we started, cards were punched at the laboratory and sent to the regional computing centre with the output on fan-fold paper returned the following day. Routine data processing was still manual, and each of us had to spend about a third of our time on data processing. Over the next few years, computerization took over, but some of the characteristics of CPR data processing dated from the limitations of punched cards. And now I'll hand over for the second part of the talk to Alistair. A notable appointee in 1967 was Bob Williams, uh, who you see uh, third from the left on this picture, uh, who initiated and ran a programme of sampling from ocean weather ships with the Longhurst Hardy Plankton Report, okay. 1971 to 75, okay. withdrawn. This mainly provided information uh, yeah, on the vertical distribution of the sampling of the CPR. In late 1969, the intention to create IMA and the move to Plymouth was announced. The following year, the Rothschild Report introduced the customer contract principle for scientific research funding. This led to the contract from MAF, which uh, later DEFRA, which was critical to preserving the survey. New members of staff in 1970 included Chris Hopkins, whose red hair you see on the left of the photo, uh, who became professor at the University of Tromsø before uh, becoming secretary general of ICES from 1994 to 1999. Uh, Chris Reed joined the CPR team in 1972, and we will mention him again. The move to Plymouth was piecemeal. We moved in late 1975 to 76 uh, into temporary accommodation in now de demolished buildings on Mill Bay docks. Through the long dry summer of 1976, this was not bad. However, when the rain started, the buildings leaked like a sieve. New staff were beginning to be recruited to the team, notably Tanya Budd, later Tanya Jonas, who eventually became senior analyst. The IMA building, now PML, was opened in 1977 and yet Edinburgh Lab was closed with the departure of many staff, so further staff were recruited in Plymouth. The Edinburgh lab was gutted and all the furniture, fixtures and fittings were sent to Plymouth. Much of this was not needed and staff were allowed to help themselves to items they could use. The new building had been designed with features to accommodate the survey, uh, uh, which had been intended to be using UORs by this time. These would have been delivered through the gate on the extreme right of the, of the uh, picture um, to, to the workshop, which never performed that function was, and was completed as the seawater hall. Health and safety regulation, together with the need to exclude formerly infused from parts of the building where experimental work uh, was in progress, led to the development of extraction systems so that analysts were no longer inhaling the fumes. By 1976, the end of the US uh, Office of Naval Research Contract and other budget limitations had led to the sampling being suspended west of 20 degrees west, so the uh, diagram um, on the left shows most of the routes in uh, use at the time. Jerry Robinson resigned in 1986 and Bob Williams took over as head of the uh, Oceanic Ecology Group. In 1988, PML was formed from IMA and part of the MBA. At this time, NERC was moving to the direction of prioritising funding projects with defined out outputs within three to five years not open-ended programmes, and the CPR survey was declared a unit of redundancy. Some analysts were redeployed to other PML programmes, in some cases returning to the survey later. But almost immediately, the significance of climate change and the need for long-term data sets were recognised, and eventually, NERC became a substantial supporter of the survey. 
survey was salvaged by the ongoing MAF contract and the contract from the Department of the Environment, now part of DEFRA, to which Chris Reed was to seconded at the time. From April 1979, a reduced team of five analysts continued, uh, financed by, MAF, by the MAF and DOE contracts, and with Michael Colbrook in charge. Sophos was formed with notice, notable support from Bob Dixon, the right hand photo of MAF in the late 1990s, um, in late, late 1990, and was functioning by spring 1991. With renewed funding, the survey exp expanded back into the Western Atlantic. Michael Colbrook retired in 1992, and John Gamble was appointed director. The survey was re relocated to the NBA. At Citadel Hill in 1993, and other new staff were recruited. After John Gamble's untimely death in 1994, Chris Reed was appointed director. Under his dynamic efforts, more funding was raised and surveys expanded to include routes in the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Guinea for a few years. And the first pilot tow in the Pacific in 1997 was followed by regular sampling from 2000 onwards. The CPR was deployed by other institutions in other parts of the world. The staff numbers increased, including Martin Edwards, who eventually became deputy to several directors. Sonia Batten, who went in, on to Canada to run the PCR, the Pacific CPR routes, and David Johns and Maz Wood, who remained mainstays of the survey. Later arrivals, such as Gregory Beaugrand and Anthony Richardson, were responsible for some of the most highly cited papers resulting from the CPR survey and the recognition of the importance of its data in studies of, of the impact of climate change. Claudia Castellani was the driving force promoting the production of the book Marine Plankton, to which many members of the CPR team contributed. Richard Kirby developed a method for anal analysing DNA from the CPR samples, enhancing further the value of the historical sample. Directors following Chris Reed from 2007 were Peter Burkle to 2011, Nick Owens to 2015, and Willie Wilson thereafter. Knock-on effects of the financial crisis of 2007 to 2008 fed through to reductions in public funding, and once again, financial problems mounted, resulting in the, uh, reductions in the survey, painful redundancies, and the merger of the SAFOS with the MBA. We have uh, men mentioned only a few people that are involved in the survey, concentrating on scientific staff of the analysis team, but we apologise for many omissions from this talk. We should also acknowledge the work of the workshop and admin staff without whom none of this would have happened. Wasn't that absolutely incredible? Goodness. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> what, what, what do you say? Just a history of people as well as a history of science and both equally important, both equally impressive. We're going to um, finish this session um, with uh, an introduction to the plankton. Um, Marianne Wooden is going to do what um, Sir Arthur Hardy did in the 1950s, We're going to introduce us to the beauties of plankton, taxonomy, and why we care. Hello, my name is Marianne Wooden, and I'm Senior Plankton Analyst for the CPR Survey here at the NBA in Plymouth. And I'd like to talk to you today about what is plankton, what is taxonomy and why should we care? Hopefully this will be an introduction to the flora and fauna of planktonic life in our oceans. And hopefully we'll look at the hidden beauties of the microscopic world and the huge variety of life found within the plankton and talk taxonomy, carrying in tedious or powerful tools to catalogue and capture biodiversity. Or what is plankton? Imagine if you will lying on your back in the sea and in the ocean carry you. This is what plankton do. The word plankton comes from the Greek word planktos, meaning to wander or to drift. And aptly named, these tiny plants and animals are at the mercy of the elements that support them. So what type of organisms then do we find in the plankton? Well, let's take a look. Let's start with the phytoplankton, the plant plankton. And these are typically algae, you can have some examples. And these guys will possess pigments um, such as chlorophyll. Uh, they will take in carbon dioxide from the water, sunlight, and they'll use those things to produce sugars and then pump out oxygen. We also have the zooplankton, we're animal plankton. These 
zooplankton will feed on the phytoplankton. And within the zooplankton, we have a whole range of organisms. We have some simple cells and zooplankton and simple predators like the chick. So zooplankton will feed on the phytoplankton, if that's the point. And of course, zooplankton themselves will be food for other organisms, such as larval fish. So plankton, actually, it encompasses quite a big size range. So bacteria and viruses are part of plankton. And then everything in between, the size range goes all the way. Hello, we just seem to be having a bit of an issue here with the audio. Just bear with us for two seconds, please. This is the nature of virtual events. So, okay. and they will take in carbon dioxide from the water, they'll use sunlight, and they'll use those things to produce sugars and then pump out oxygen. We also have the zooplankton with animal plankton. These zooplankton will feed on the phytoplankton. Within the zooplankton, we have a whole range of organisms. We have some simple cells and zooplankton and some multicellular life too. Here we have a, a type of polychy worm, here we have a type of mollusk, and here we have a, a small crustacean. So zooplankton will feed on the phytoplankton, the plant plankton, and of course zooplankton themselves will be food for other organisms such as larval fish. So plankton actually it, it encompasses quite a big size range. So Bacteria and viruses are part of the plankton. And then everything in between, the size range goes all the way up to jellyfish. Yes, jellyfish are part of the plankton too. And plankton are found from the very surface of the ocean all the way down to the deep ocean. And this means then that plankton forms a huge part of life on Earth. They're single cellular, they're multicellular, and they're found on a vast part of the planet. Well, why do we study plankton? Well, very briefly, phytoplankton produce around half of the world's oxygen. So every other breath is a plankton breath. Phytoplankton are known to produce a chemical called dimethyl sulfide, which we know is involved in some cloud formation. Plankton are deeply involved in the biological pump, drawing down carbon down to the deep ocean and thus drawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So plankton are hugely important for the carbon cycle. Of course, phytoplankton and zooplankton form the very base of the marine food web. So no plankton, there would be no fish, no crabs, no starfish, and of course, no charismatic megafauna, such as whales and dolphins, seals and turtles. Plankton are very sensitive to their environmental conditions around them, such as temperature, nutrient, salinity, and thus, these make ideal organisms to study changes in the ocean. And some plankton, some of the algae, have human health impacts too. They can form harmful algal blooms, which produce toxins, which if they're ingested by us or other animals, well, they can make us quite poorly. So what organisms do we find in the plankton? Here we have a diagram of the tree of life. This represents all life found on the planet. So hopefully you will agree with me that there's a huge range of life that we find in the plankton, almost all of the tree of life we find in the plankton. And I've just got a few moments to, to try to um, put across the beauty and the diversity of plankton. It's a tall task, isn't it? <laughs> but let's have a go. So what <laughs> organisms do we find in the plankton? We have the plant plankton, of course, the algae. And here we have an illustration by Sir Alistair Hardy. Sir Alistair Hardy, of course, the inventor of the CPR. He was a scientist, but he was also a very accomplished artist, and he would draw what he saw down the microscope. We have a range of organisms here, mostly they're diatoms, these big cells here. We can see some form chains. We can see some are long and thin. We have a chain forming species here. We also have some dinoflagellates here. These are single-celled organisms that photosynthesize. These have a, a flagellum that goes around their middle, their girdle band. I'd like to talk perhaps a little bit more about the diatoms, an incredibly common uh, group found in the plankton. What other organisms do we find in the plankton? Well, we don't necessarily always need 
a microscope to see some of the phytoplankton, to see some plankton. Here we have a man who's walked along a beach and where he's walked we can see these blue flashes. And these blue flashes have been caused by this organism here. It's a dinoflagellate known as Noctiluca scintillans, which translates as night sparkle. What a beautiful name. So these single-celled organisms are able to bioluminesce. They contain an enzyme called luciferase, lucifer as in the bringer of light. And when they're disturbed, they bioluminesce. And we can see this with our naked eye, at least when it's dark anyway. On the left, we have a picture, a satellite picture of the UK, the southwest of the UK. Plymouth is somewhere around here. And here we have an organism called a coccolithophore. This is known as Emiliana huxleyi. It's about one hundredth of a millimetre in diameter. And this organism can form huge blooms. And this milky blue area that you can see on the map down here has been caused by millions and millions of these organisms. So huge blooms of plankton can be seen from space. Well, what other organisms can we find in the plankton? We find plants, we find animals, and also we find things in between. They're known as mixotrophs. Here we have an organism, a single-celled organism known as dinophysis. It contains chlorophyll, it can photosynthesize, but also it will actively prey on other smaller types of animal plankton. So imagine that, imagine if, if you yourself, says perhaps you've missed your breakfast, you're a bit hungry, you haven't got time to go out and go shopping and get a snack. You could just sit outside, get a bit of sunshine, top yourself up and then get ready for the rest of your day. How amazing is that? What an amazing adaptation, mixotrophs. Here we have another dinoflagellate. These are known as warnoids. And this time these guys have this structure here. Let me just highlight that for you. They have an eye. They have an ocellus. They have some kind of rudimentary retina. They have an eye lens with, pig with pigment. And this one on the right here, we can see that it's engulfed, it's ingested a copepod, an invertebrate egg. So imagine that, a single-celled organism that's managed to develop its own eye. And we know that eyes throughout evolution have evolved independently of each other. And that's what's known as convergent evolution. But who would have thought that we would see eyes in a single-celled organism? I just find that amazing. And we see these guys in the plankton. No talk about plankton would be complete without talking about a guy called Ernst Haeckel. He was a, a naturalist in the 1900s, a scientist and a very accomplished artist. And he drew lots of types of plankton. I'm very quickly running through some here. These are copepods, my favourite uh, type of plankton. Very beautiful creatures. And we have some single-celled organisms here on the right, known as radiolarians. And here we have another example of an artist who is inspired by plankton and by Haeckel's work. We can see this image of a jellyfish uh, drawn by Haeckel on the right. And we have this artist and architect known by the name of Hendrik Bellage, known as the father of modern architecture in the Netherlands. And here we can see he's drawn this image of an Art Nouveau electric lamp. Also Hendrik, uh, still inspired by Plankton and Haeckel's work, he, he, he drew these, these lovely pictures of jewellery and, and chains. And for those of you who know your Plankton, you might recognise the links in this chain, this necklace, as the cell Odontella. So how wonderful is that? The, the beauty of Plankton is captured in some of the art around us. Let's look at the animal plankton or the zooplankton. And we can split the animal plankton into two groups, one of which is the holoplankton. These guys will spend their entire life as part of the plankton. And here we have some examples. This is a, a krill or a euphorsid. And we know that these guys form an, a very important part of the diet of whales. Of course, they eat them by the ton. Here we can see some eyes at this end. These little red dots, this pigment indicates the presence of photophores and we know that photophores are cells which emit light they bioluminesce here we have another small crustacean known as a, a copepod copepods are an incredibly important food source for things like larval fish and copepods are a very diverse group there are over 2,000 species of marine planktonic copepod some other interesting organisms here these are pelagic mollusks 
this is known as a sea angel and this is known as a sea butterfly. They're given very romantic common names, aren't they? But in real life, well, perhaps they don't quite deserve it because this guy will feed very voraciously on this guy here. Then we have the other part of the plankton known as the marrow plankton. And these guys will only spend part of their life up in the plankton and then typically they will settle down and form a part of the benthic environment, perhaps as, as, as crabs or barnacles, that type of thing. So the meroplankton are usually larvae of, of other animals. And here we have a crab larvae or a decapod larvae. You can see its eye here. We can see these spines on its dorsal or its back and this big spine on its, on its front, on its rostrum here. These spines just aid in flotation and I guess they're also a deterrent to predators. You wouldn't want those nasty prickles in your mouth, would you? But interestingly, let's look at the form of this guy. And it's something we see a lot in the plankton is that the larvae don't look anything like their adult form. And if we think of the terrestrial environment on land, well, that's similar to tadpoles and frogs, isn't it? So we know that tadpoles undergo some kind of metamorphosis and eventually they turn into frogs or toads. Well, we see that same kind of pattern um, in the plankton too. And here's just another example. Here's an echinoderm or starfish larvae. And again, we can see that it's larvae. Well, it looks nothing like its adult form, does it? What is taxonomy? Well, in its loosest, all-encompassing sense, taxonomy is just purely describing organisms. And if we think about ourselves, how would we describe ourselves? How would we do taxonomy of the human? Well, we'd perhaps start with a drawing or a photograph, and then we'd add some description. We're a vertebrate, we've got two arms, two legs, fingers and toes, two eyes. We'd describe the environment that the organism was found in. So in the case of us, we're... we're found on land, we breathe air. And then we'd look at, we'd try to describe, well, who are the other family members? Who looks like us and who doesn't look like us? How are we similar and how are we different? And then once we'd done that, we'd attempt to kind of put ourselves in some kind of evolutionary context. This is essentially what taxonomy is. And we use this hierarchical system here. Who was this system was pretty much invented by a guy called Carl Linnaeus in the 1700s, and this system is still used today. It's a system of um, essentially cataloguing all organisms, and we use this hierarchical terminology. So again, let's think about ourselves. We know that we're animals. We belong in the kingdom Animalia. We're part of the phylum Chordata. We have a backbone. We have a spinal cord. We're mammals. We're part of the primates, and then very, down, very much down the bottom here, we're known as Homo sapiens. So each species, each species on Earth will have two names associated with it. It's what's known as binomial nomenclature, two names. And of course, we're known as Homo sapiens. And this, this method of, of cataloguing organisms really does help us. If you think there are millions of organisms on the planet, how do we keep track of them? Well, we very much sort organisms into these different kingdoms, phylums, class, orders. That's how we keep track, really. And the further down the hierarchy you go, that's just the finer detail. So if you imagine perhaps that all life on Earth is catalogued in some library somewhere, well, this system would tell you perhaps on what floor in the library to go to find a particular species, on what shelf you would find a species, in what book you would find that species, on what page and on what line. But taxonomy has had, well, a bit of an identity crisis, I guess, in the last 30 or so years. It's not seen as a particularly sexy science, let's face it. And it's definitely difficult to get recognition and funding to do taxonomy. So imagine, if you will, all of the books, all of the, the, the programmes you've watched about animals, about organisms, when you read about an, an ecosystem and you read about all the biodiversity there. How often is it that you see in the references the person that first described the organisms that you've been reading about? How often is it that you see the reference for perhaps the identification books that were used so as that the scientists could identify their animal they're talking about in their, their ecosystem paper or, or their TV programme that you're watching? It just doesn't happen very often, does it? And so, because of that, it's difficult to get funding. And, OK, taxonomy, it can be a bit tricky, can't it? 
So there's generally name changes. Yes, names keep changing all the while. And with advancements in technology, with molecular work, when we start to look at DNA, we can find species where we didn't think there were species before, perhaps. But taxonomy really is just a filing system that we use every day. And if I were to present you with this group of animals here and ask you to separate these animals into two logical groups, I imagine what you'd do is you'd split them up into cats and to dogs, into the felines and into canines. And I'm pretty sure you would find that quite easy to do. But what you've done there is a bit of taxonomy. You've identified your organism and you split them into similar looking types and you've labelled them differently. That's essentially basic taxonomy. So we do do it every day. It doesn't have to be hard. So why is taxonomy important? Well, let's perhaps flip that question and say, why is taxonomy important to us? We're a very egocentric species, aren't we? Uh, we like to know what things affect us. Well, for us to be successful, we need food, we need water, we need clean air, we need shelter, we need medicine, and perhaps maybe when there's spare time, something nice to do and something nice to look at. And so that means we need our planet, we need our, um, the life on Earth, our ecosystems to be healthy, don't we? And those ecosystems, it could be big, it could be the whole planet, or it could be a small ecosystem, like perhaps one river. But we need to know what's happening in that ecosystem, and whether it's healthy or not. And a part of measuring an ecosystem's health is to look at its biodiversity, isn't it? But biodiversity is taxonomy. Biodiversity describes the, the number of animals in an ecosystem. Well, how do we get to that? Well, by using taxonomy, of course. So all of those millions of creatures we find on the planet, they're all deeply involved in taxonomy. So without taxonomy, we can't understand biodiversity. And thus, without taxonomy, we just don't understand life on Earth. Thank you very much. Hopefully I've given you a small introduction into the world of plankton its beauty, into taxonomy, and why taxonomy is an essential science. Thank you. That was great, Marianne. Um, a really simple, but actually quite detailed and wide-ranging introduction to plankton and why taxonomists should be paid. Um, so we're now moving over to our d discussion time, and Maya, you're going to help by giving the questions, I understand. Yeah, lovely, thank you, John. Um, could I just ask all of the speakers from that first thing to please switch your, your cameras and your microphones on so we can all see your lovely faces, that would be fab. Um, we have got a couple of questions. And again, if you wanted to ask a question and say it live, then please do. You can do that by clicking the raise hand button and then we can activate your microphones. Um, so feel free to do that. Always nice to have some interaction. Lots of lovely comments from people saying what fantastic talks and great to have such an amazing overview of all of the, the great and good that have made CPR what it is. So um, thank you to all the speakers. So one of the first questions that we've got here is from Michael Poulston, who's saying, Chris, what are your thoughts on industrial krill fishing in the Southern Oceans and Antarctica? There seems to be increasing evidence that the fisheries at such scale is negatively affecting the wider ecosystem. Chris, might you be able to help with that one? I will do my best. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think I, I think you can make the analogy with uh, with, with the the seas around the the British Isles and the North Sea, which uh, are are overfished, and we've hardly got uh, any large fish left, and there would have been in the past. Uh, and it's the larger fish that produce more eggs. Uh, we've overfished that part of the world, and. I think we're possibly doing the same in the Southern Ocean and certainly we have with the whales. The whales are coming back, but there are no way that they are anywhere near the numbers that we've had in the past. Great. Thank you, Chris. And, and does anybody else have anything they'd like to add to that? 
No. Okay, great. Thank you. Great question. And we've got another one about modern technology. So obviously we've got lots of new bits of kit out there. This is a question from Facebook that, that allow us to be able to identify species through imagery. So how does this compare to our, our extremely experienced analysts who can identify it by tiny little details? So do you think there's a sort of a possibility that this technology might advance um, our and exceed the skills of our analysts? It would be good to hear Marianne, Alistair, and Tony on that one. <laughs> Hi, uh, can, can everyone hear me? Yes, you can. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I might just jump in there, to, or at least to begin with. Um, it's a really good question. And it's something that uh, lots of people in the plankton world are looking at. It's this kind of uh, automated AI um, form of analysis. Um, superficially, it, it, it looks that like that type of analysis, the computer generated stuff, would be a lot quicker than traditional uh, microscopy. But I guess um, one of the success stories of the CPR uh, is that we identify taxa to species level. And that's really important because different species uh, will perhaps inhabit different thermal niches. So uh, different types of copepods perhaps might like cold water or some might like warm water. And you would only tell the differences between those different types of copepod by looking at the really fine detail. And I mean, flipping the animal over, perhaps feeding through its legs, getting in a needle and kind of digging in through the legs and looking at maybe, you know, a small part of its body and looking at the shape of the curve on maybe one part of its leg. And that that feature that you're looking at to discriminate between species might only be one hundredth of a millimeter in size, you know. Um, so I think modern technology just isn't isn't up to that kind of standard yet. It can't flip animals over. Let's imagine that you've got image analysis and you have your animal lying on your glass plate or whatever. It might be lying in the wrong orientation for you to tell what species it is. It might have legs overlaying the bit that you need to see. Um, so until we develop the technology to flip the animal over and flick through its legs, well, then I think we've got some way to go. But having said that, of course, um, technology can identify things to broad groups. So it could be that this um, AI type technology could identify something as a copepod or a decapod or a worm, uh, which of course has value too. Um, but to species level, I don't think we're quite there yet. I think I'd just like to say that uh, uh, ever since I started uh, being an analyst, we've been told that within a few years, uh, computer image analysis will replace the um, uh, microscopy. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. And, but uh, uh, technology advances, we'll wait and see. <laughs> I would agree very, very much with that. Um, the, the, the importance of identifying individual species cannot be, under, uh, cannot be overestimated. Um, Great. So it sounds as if our analysts are still going to be in work, which is fantastic. Lots of very skilled people here within the MBA and that work on the CPR survey over the years. So um, lots of inherited knowledge there. And um, we have got a hand up in the audience. So Paul Hart, if I just um, switch your microphone on and then if you'd like to ask your question to the panel. Jack, that might be down to you to switch the microphone on, just uh, dealing with the technology one second, and then we should be able to hear you, Paul. Is that it? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Paul. Tony and, and Alistair, your talk was very interesting, uh, obviously from uh, someone who's been involved. It was interesting to hear the story. Um, I think one um, person who you left out, who I think had very significant influence on the data analysis was Mark Williamson who was employed uh, at the CPR uh, in Edinburgh for a, a fairly short space of time. But I, I think I'm right in, in remembering that he was the one who introduced um, principal components analysis into the analysis of the data. And, and then, of course, Michael then took that up and ran with it and developed it much further. But uh, I think Mark was someone who set the, the, the process going. Am I right or am I wrong? I, th I think you're quite right, but uh, um, I think we 
uh, excluded him uh, from the talk because he wasn't actually a CPR analyst. He was employed at the Edinburgh Laboratory. It was on plankton indicator samples. And of course, the plankton indicator was uh, um, another of Hardy's uh, developments, but uh, he wasn't actually in, uh, directly involved in, in the CPR survey. But you're quite right, it was he who introduced well, uh, pro probably the first to use com uh, computing and uh, the first to use the uh, piece uh, critical components analysis. I, I, I mean, just uh, as a, an aside and completely irrelevant, really, but Tony, you must be one of the greatest survivors, having survived uh, years of working with Dora John in her office, who smoked like a chimney, and also breathing in formalin over the years from uh, an open stage. <laughs> Yes, it was, it was very different in those days. Um, the, um, the fact that um, we breathed in, in some cases, very, uh, in, um, very concentrated formalin. I mean, I, I do remember Anna, um, cutting some routes um, where we were working with 40% formalin and no formalin extraction, which <laughs> seems uh, almost impossible to believe nowadays. Um, but in, in fairness to Dora John, um, admittedly, she did chain smoke in the same laboratory as we were analyzing samples, but um, she had the goodness to have the window open. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pleased to say that the uh, practices today are a lot tighter and, and our, our team are well looked after. Um, <laughs> we have got another question. Thank you, Paul, for that. And um, we've got another question here um, asking about funding for taxonomy and how best to improve that. OK, I, I guess that's for me. Funding for taxonomy. Wow. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I, I think um, taxonomists are kind of we hide our light under our bushel, I think, a little. And um, and don't quite state the importance of taxonomy enough to the right people. So I think it's kind of having those kind of wider conversations. Like I said in my talk, you know, if we want to understand biodiversity, well, we need taxonomy. You can't do one without the other. You need good taxonomists to inform biodiversity studies. Um, so I think it's including taxonomists in those kind of works and giving them reference. Yes. Yeah, when, when, as I say, when someone uh, writes a paper and they give you a long list of organisms, well, you should have somewhere referenced the person who first identified that organism, surely. Yes, uh, has I anyone else I, got any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I would like to say that uh, yeah, uh, taxonomy is the, the foundation of all biological work, really. But uh, uh, the trouble is that the tax, taxonomy is, uh, is not highly cited. Uh, you get the few papers which are directly on taxonomy, which might uh, cite uh, taxonomic work, but once the species is uh, categorised, then uh, you don't uh, you, uh, tend to list the um, authority uh, in, in the uh, uh, bibliography. So uh, citation indices are uh, underrate. The, uh, very highly, I think, the importance of taxonomy. Mm. Mm. I, I do remember in the, the 1990s, the government realised that there were not just running out of taxonomists, but the work was suffering because they hadn't actually employed people, particularly to academic posts, because it was said taxonomy was mere natural history, as if that's something bad, but they wanted proper scientists. And a lot of the, the research in universities was grinding to a halt because there weren't enough taxonomists. And one of my PhD supervisors, Jeff Moore, I remember in my PhD, I mean, I'm an ecophysiologist, him saying to me, you should read Paul Ehrlich's book on a world of wounds, where he recommends that every biologist should sort of give back one tenth of their time to, to something in biology that no one's going to pay for. And he said to me, you know, okay, you're an ecophysiologist, but make sure you do some taxonomy of the groups that you're working in as well. Um, it's, it's an interesting idea. I don't know how many people ever took Ehrlich's one tenth of their time up, but um, it'd be a shame if taxonomy was only one tenth of the time of practicing scientists. 
Great, thank you. And that sort of answers the next question, John, actually, which was about whether there's enough focus on taxonomy in university courses to find the work workforce for the future. Um, and if there's anything that we can done at the universities to improve that situation, which you've you've sort of given a sort of potential solution for. Does anybody have any other comments on how it could be improved within universities? Yeah. Okie doke. Um, and just a couple of comments. Oh, Willie has got a question. Hold on, let me just um, unmute you there, Willie. Uh, yes, you should be able to speak now. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Yes, it was just a comment on that. Um, I mean, I think it, it is pretty sad that universities don't teach taxonomy like this. And uh, I, I've been involved in quite a few taxonomy workshops over the years. And one of the things I find frightening is the, the age of the teachers at, <laughs> at these, that it's the same teachers that have been doing it for about 50 years. Uh, and there really isn't uh, a cohort of, of new academics coming up through the system. I mean, the CPR survey and, um, and it's it all, you know, the, the, the sister surveys in Australia and, um, uh, over at the uh, Pacific as well, and, and, and Rana and Cy in Cyprus, uh, there's there's a sort of few examples of it, um, but there's just at university level, it just doesn't seem to be done at all, um, and I, I'm not I'm not quite sure why. I mean, I mean maybe I mean John, do you have a comment on that? I mean, I guess it's uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of uh, I mean even in you know, some of the classic departments like Cambridge or Oxford or Reading or, you know, Birmingham, some of these places. I mean, are, are they even teaching taxonomy? Maybe at some of the, the higher levels, but I'm, no, I'm just not aware of anybody that does it. That, I mean, we've always had this problem with um, te teaching taxonomy. There, there just aren't the people to do it. And then it gets to a critical level and the government says, oh, we need to invest in this. And I do, I do remember, I think it was the late 1990s, the government actually put a lot of money into putting taxonomists into universities. But it was a, it was a sort of one-off panic because things got really bad. And I suspect it'll be the, the same again. I mean, I, I teach biology and marine organisms, um, and I'm probably the, the most qualified in terms of you know, um, knowledge of systematics and taxonomy to, to, to do that within the university which is quite sad really because I'm an ecophysiologist you know but um, yeah it, it doesn't seem to attract quite as many people I'm saying that but there are some students who come through and they just get really excited about what taxonomy is for and will learn taxonomy but but then keep getting jobs in that well, I think we, we have to wait till there's another crisis and we can't actually identify our biodiversity before the government does things yeah, and, and I think that, I mean, there's a lot of school of thought that thinks that uh, molecular biology will replace uh, sort of classical taxonomy or, or even, I mean, there's comments being made around um, the, um, the, some of the, you know, some of the work that Pierre's going to be talking about, the, the um, particle imaging. But uh, I mean, my argument every single time is that you, you, you can't verify any of these techniques unless you, you know, uh, under the lens of a proper um, a taxonomist, really. Yeah. Um, and there, there is a, a severe lack of taxonomists coming up through the system. Yeah. And I think we need to be jumping up and down to sort of try and help with this. I mean, molecular biology, is, I am a molecular biologist, and you know, I'm one of the biggest advocates for um, DNA-based uh, uh, technologies, but it's, it's only a starting point. You need to have that taxonomic the physiological expertise to actually make sense of what the dna is actually telling you so uh, mm. uh and, and but but the other thing the other point i was going to make particularly around some of the imaging techniques one of the ways i often explain it is that i'm a big fan of these and, and also molecular biology but it should be uh layered you know so if you sort of layer it on top of the the, the a core of taxonomy data and you can and sort of start increasing the granularity of the type of data that you're getting, and you can make, you know, there are strengths to some of these uh, techniques. And Maz said that sort of quite eloquently. Um, there, there are other uh, things that you can get from these other techniques, um, and, and but it, you'll never replace taxonomists. Yeah. 
I got into trouble by the CPR taxonomists by putting a, a, a slide up once of uh, the, uh, an imaging system and a flow cam system and said, meet our new taxonomist. And I got um, quite rightly hammered for it. So. <laughs> I mean, you say we'll never replace taxonomists, but I don't think we'll have many taxonomists to replace. Yeah. And, and, and teaching very large classes, not, not just at first year level, but even in honours level, where you've got 50 and 60 in a class trying to teach taxonomy properly. It's quite a challenge. We need we need different ways of thinking about this, which involve the bioimaging, which involve the molecular, and involve that ability to, to look and to see. I mean, looking and seeing is the hardest skill for, for any biologist. <laughs> Interesting discussion, which seems to be um, causing a little flurry of hands to go up here. So um, we've got Dr. Tom Doyle and Paul Hart and Gerald Bolt. So just wondering if any of you are um, wanting to respond directly to that discussion on taxonomy. Yeah, I was just going to come in on that because I, I teach um, invertebrate zoology second year uh, students here in University College Cork in Ireland. And um, I guess the thing about it is that class sizes, I think somebody's just mentioned it there on, on the chat, that the class sizes have increased and it's become increasingly difficult to, to, um, to, to give students enough time under using stereoscopes and identifying particular organisms. So, so that's kind of been one of the biggest challenges for us is, is actually uh, class size have become so big, so practical class time has been reduced and various different things through the different years fall off and taxonomy has been, has been one of those uh, in favor of maybe more molecular uh, practical classes. But to kind of get around that, like we've just set up a, what we call a plankton club here in, 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 in the university where it's totally voluntary for students to participate. And uh, we've had a really good uptake on that. So students can come in and, and they get to spend time um, identifying zooplankton. And um, the feedback has been fantastic. The students just love it that, you know, to come in and have this freedom to look at uh, like zooplankton and uh, try and improve their taxonomic skills. Many of them are not particularly interested in plankton when they come along, but after, after a bit of time, they just love it. Mm -hmm. Love the idea of a plankton club. I think we should have a, a twin club over here in the MBA as well. Um, great stuff. Thank you, Tom. And I've got a hand up from Gerald here. Gerald, would you like to ask your question? You should be able to speak now, Gerald. Yes. You can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello, Gerald. Welcome to the today. I should just point out that I was the last phytoplankton taxonomist to work at the MBA. Great stuff, thank you, Gerald. Um, no, no, nobody, nobody was trained to follow me. Gerald, why was that? I, I think people are just not taught taxonomy at university and therefore they don't think it's a valid thing to work on. But I? I, was, I was trained as a plant taxonomist at university. Well, I have been there with... A point. Can I? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I just think that, that uh, from a university perspective, uh, I think now that um, courses are so student orientated. So the the idea is that you can't offer courses which students might find boring, <clears throat> and I think taxonomy. Uh, has become regarded as being something which is a bit dry, uh, not very interesting, and much. And it's overtaken by molecular biology and, and uh, behavior and things like that. And also, I think many students come to university with very little uh, knowledge of natural history. I always remember saying to a group of students, um, you know what a, a swallow is? And there were just blank faces all around, not a single student uh, knew what a swallow was <laughs> and that just amazed me and that was some years ago so I think that uh, it, it is a, a difficult topic because we are now so driven by the customer orientated education process which thinks that you've got to offer what you think students are going to like not what they really need. Okay. Should I say that a few years ago when the Liverpool class was at the MBA, I gave a talk to them on algal taxonomy. And I gathered that one of the students said, 
we never realised that the algae were so interesting. And that's what we need, these engaging, inspiring individuals to get the next generation to, to want to suck study that topic. Um, I've just got another question that I'd like to ask. Um, there's a question here, slightly different, but also looking at the sort of the future. Do you think that in future you could genetically identify each half inch of CPR silk by presence or absence only? I'm not sure if that's one for Maz, perhaps? Or David even? David, if you wanted to just switch your camera on, if you're there. I could jump in and just say theoretically yes. I was going to say, <laughs> I say ask Willie, ask him about eDNA. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. You could, I mean, actually, very easily you could do it, actually. Uh, but um, it's uh, and, and it's, it's something we've been talking about as well. Great stuff. Well, but it, it wouldn't tell you everything, would, uh, and somebody uh, you could argue might not tell you very much either, but. Uh, uh, it would give you a lot more information about a lot of organisms that uh, you might know, not know very much about as well. Uh, but of course, that opens up a whole, uh, a whole new area uh, as well. So, uh, so there, there's it, 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 it is a huge opportunity uh, for the for the future, but not to replace taxonomists. <laughs> Great. Well, I think this sort of echoes John's earlier comment on the value of people as, as well as the value of science. Um, I think that's all the time that we've got now for questions for this theme. So, John, can I just ask you to wrap up for the theme and thank all the speakers and everybody for your questions? Yeah, I mean... Chris, Alistair, Tony and Marianne, thank you so much, um, not just for your, your your talks, but your your insight. I think that, that that's the thing. I mean, and almost anyone can give a talk of the practice, but the insight that comes from talks is absolutely invaluable. And that's a very human thing, even in science. And I thank you that each of the talks, um, very human as well as scientific. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, John. We now have a 10 minute break. Um, so if you'd like to go and refill your coffee cups and then we will restart again at 10 o'clock. So I'm just checking with everybody behind the scene that that's OK. I think it is 10 o'clock. Is that right? Um, so we look forward to joining you again shortly and uh, see you at 12 o'clock. Sorry. Yeah, 12 o'clock. Thank you. Did I say 10? 12. <laughs> All right. Yes, a brief uh, quarter hour break. break. Yes.
Good morning and welcome back. Apologies, I just had a little bit of a technical issue there with the microphone. Um, just in case you've stopped thinking about cake, Jennifer's just going to share um, our very special cake again with you. Um, so again, just to say for any of you that missed it, this is the SS Albatross on top of the cake. Hopefully you can see that now. Um, I've got a slightly different view, so I can't see it myself, but it's um, it's a beautiful cake. There it is. That's the, the front of it there, which has got all of our lovely plants. I'm sure a lot of you can identify some of those species and SS Albatross on top um, with uh, some lovely deep sea and some raspberry and cherry sponge as well. Um, thank you, Jennifer. So our next session this morning, is the theme is on um, uh, Pass. Willie, you're going to be chairing this session. If you'd like to introduce the session, too busy thinking about Kate that I've forgotten the topic of the theme. Thank you. It's too close to lunchtime for us here in the UK. Well, thanks very much, Maya, and welcome back, everyone. Um, certainly, when I'm out and about, I, one of the things I love talking about is, you know, the, the CPR survey is the, the, the longest running and most spatially extensive biological survey in, uh, in the world. And, and, and certainly, although we, we do have gaps in this survey uh, in the global ocean, uh, we, we have coverage from the Arctic Ocean to the uh, Antarctica, or the Southern Ocean. Um, and uh, we have almost uh, full latitudinal uh, coverage uh, across the globe. And we have uh, uh, an amazing set of uh, speakers uh, uh, to introduce here, uh, and I've, I've uh, met all of them. Uh, Charles Green, actually, I, I've uh, probably only met electronically. John uh, has been uh, and, and given and worked at the, the Citadel Hill Laboratory in Plymouth, uh, uh, and then Sonia and Anthony, of course, uh, are old uh, CPR survey hands. And we have a full uh, time zone uh, range uh, represented within our talks here from uh, Sonia, who uh, who just uh, not long come out of yesterday, to uh, Anthony, who's uh, probably not long about to go into tomorrow. And Anthony, who I'm sure uh, is uh, sitting there with a, a glass of wine in his hand, is uh, going to kick off the, the show and tell us uh, a bit about the, the, I guess, part of the southern end of our, our global range. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Willie. Okay. So I haven't got any wine. Figured it was still too early. It's 9 p.m. here. So um, after my talk, maybe. Okay. So um, my background here is a copepod. It's um, sapphirina, it's iridescent, so it's, this is real colour. So this is how beautiful plankton are, and all these images were taken by Julian Urabi of the OzCPR survey. So I'm going to talk a bit about our survey, and first of all, like to introduce our team a bit. So there's a fairly big group of us, um, but we're all at CSIRO, and one of the benefits of working at CSIRO is that we work on the OzCPR project between five and 40% of our time. So everyone has other things to do, which keeps everyone motivated. But what unites all of us is the uh, love for plankton and, and work on the LCPR survey. So thank you to Safos MBA for the images on the left. On the right is our survey. So it's been running for 14 years now around Australia and, and into the Southern Ocean. So our main routes where we sample are along the east coast of Australia and all those dots, they sort of merge into one. Not as impressive as the North Atlantic, but each dot is a sample. And um, in the Southern Ocean, we collaborate with the Australian Art Division and University of Tasmania, uh, particularly John Kitchener and Kerry Swaddling um, there to count some of the samples. Um, um, I'm mainly going to focus on research applications. So working at CSIRO, there's a number of, there's a big focus on applied research. So the uh, research that we do is more in that area. So we're trying to look at how to deliver for Australia and beyond. So here's one example, ecosystem assessment. So um, 
you know, um, one thing I should have said at the start was, um, you know, it, the reason I started the OzCPR survey in Australia was because of my background having worked in Plymouth and I really enjoyed my time there. And so when I came back to Australia, there was an opportunity through integrated marine observing system funding to start up a survey. And thank you, Chris Reed, for helping me um, start that. And so we've borrowed a number of things from the North Atlantic survey. And one of them was when I was there, Martin Edwards was leaving a leading an ecological status report. So we sort of loosely based um, the, um, ecosystem assessments on that where we try and develop some indicators. So here's one example where our team has, has led this. It's a big, it was a big undertaking. There were 27 contributions from 75 scientists and 16 institutions around Australia. And it was focused on looking at pelagic ecosystems around Australia and it was supposed to be state and trends of what's happening. And um, we focused, we, 10 of those sort of chapters were on plankton and we led or contributed to most of those and things on HABs, things on um, uh, molecular ecology as well. And it was mainly online and you can see on the right hand side, we, you know, the management areas in Australia are bioregions. And each one of those is a target there that you can drill down on and find out time series and what's happening to whether it's pH or whether different plankton groups. So that was a lot of fun to do and it's had really good uptake. Um, another um, ecosystem assessment, part of that ecosystem assessment here was looking at um, the strength of the Australia current. So you probably know the EAC from Finding Nemo. That's where I learned a lot about it as well. So um, it's a warm water current, Western boundary current goes from tropical Australia to temperate cold waters. And you can imagine that the plankton, you know, changes as it goes along, you know, from warm water to cold water communities. Um, it's very expensive and uh, to comprehensively monitor the strength of the EAC. It's a, it's a big current. And so we were interested in seeing whether we could use zooplankton to monitor the strength of the current. So we've, as I showed before, there's lots of samples that we've collected along the East Coast. We don't sample monthly like in the North Atlantic, we sample seasonally. Um, what we've used here is we've looked at copepods, so the top 100 most common uh, copepod species. And we've developed an index to try and look at the strength of the East Australia current. So the way that we've done that is, I'm not going to go into details here, but this is a redundancy analysis. So it's like a, a multivariate analysis and it's correlated with temperature. And so these scores can be positive or negative. And when they're positive, it means that it's a warm water copepod community. And when it's blue, it's cold water copepod community. And on the y-axis there is latitude and x-axis is year. And what you can see is generally they're redder, the dots, the samples are redder in the north, closer to the equator in the southern hemisphere and colder communities in the south. Um, but you can see some of the lines, which are each of the transects that we've done through time. You can see sometimes the red, the warm water communities extend further south and that we think is when the East Australia current is strong. And then some of the vertical lines, you can see there's red in the north and blue in the south. So that's when the East Australia current is weaker. So there's strong differentiation between warm water and cold water communities along the East Coast. So we think we can use that index as, a, as, as an indicator of the strength of the East Australia current. So here we've plotted, um, this index over time. And, and the dotted line here is a climatology. So it's like a, it's the mean seasonal cycle of this index averaged over the whole transect. And so you can see that it repeats because it's, it's a climatology, it's the mean seasonal cycle, but it's got the, the pattern is not random. It peaks in our summer and it decreases, it's weaker in winter. So that's saying that the East Australia current, suggesting the East Australia current's stronger in summer based on the zooplankton communities and weaker in winter. And we know from observations at different times that that's true. The EAC generally is stronger in summer than winter. The other thing you can see is each one of those samples we've plotted as an anomaly from the climatology. 
And so you can see in the first three or four years, there's mainly negative anomalies. That, that's because of mainly relative to normal, colder than normal um, zooplankton communities. That suggests the EAC was weaker. Then from 2014 to 2017, the EAC was stronger than normal and 2018 onwards, it's, it's sort of average. And, and so even though we don't have a time series like that of the strength of the EAC, we do know from previous work that the three or four year um, beats in the strength of the EAC, and that's tied to the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So we think that the copepod community is sort of picking up something realistic in terms of the strength of the AC, which is quite exciting as one of the things that, that we're using to monitor the ecosystem. Another example um, of an ecosystem assessment, so this is from State of Environment Reporting in Australia. This is very important in Australia that it's, um, it's every five years. The last one, we did uh, some plankton work, but there's actually more plankton information in the next one. So it's mainly terrestrial, but there's that cover marine systems as well. And here we've got an example of zooplankton trends over time. On the left-hand side for the figures are time series that we, we run at different national IMOS, national reference stations around Australia, seven different locations from tropical to temperate areas. And on the right is our continuous plankton recorder survey data in bioregions around those, those areas. So you can see there's some congruence, which is heartening. Um, and you can see that the, there's an increase in some areas, which is, is similar in, in both uh, inshore and offshore areas. So we don't know why, but there does seem to be either no, no change or an increase in zooplankton around Australia in the last decade anyway. Um, working at CSIRO, there's a big push to work with models. And so CSIRO develops a lot of biogeochemical and ecosystem models. And one of the focal areas is the Great Barrier Reef. And so biogeochemical models, which study nutrient cycling and phytoplankton and zooplankton are important in that. Um, you know, there's several being developed, uh, having been developed at CSIRO. I'm gonna show you some information from e-reefs. So nutrients are important because the more nutrients that go to the Great Barrier Reef, the more macroalgae smother corals and the corals die. So one of the key questions is how you do you best compare model output? So e-reefs, you can get data every five minutes. We, we only tow seasonally. So the, the temporal resolution doesn't match up very well. And then spatially, the model grid is much finer too than our CPR survey um, samples. So how do you compare them? And also there's, there's a lot of local um, variation when you take a CPR sample. So we've been taking the approach of looking at broad patterns. So here on the left is model output for the mean zooplankton field, biomass field from e-reefs model over summer, average. And on the right is we've made a statistical model called a generalized linear model from all the CPR data and included net data as well that we have. And that when produced a map of um, CPR biomass. So we've used predictors in there like bathymetry, chlorophyll, temperature, time of year, et cetera. And we can make a map and then we can compare the two maps. And, and we think that this is the sort of temporal and spatial scale we can use CPR data to, um, to assess models, right? So the CPR is good on longer um, time and space scales. Um, so using a statistical model, we can get something that's comparable. And, you know, there's reasonable agreement here. And, and here's another example where we've plotted zooplankton biomass from e-reefs model and from the CPR on the y-axis and on the x-axis is chlorophyll from the e-reefs model and from um, CPR, uh, from satellite observations matched up with the CPR. And, you know, it's not perfect, but those are both emergent patterns from from one from observations and one from a model. You can see qualitative, qualitatively they're similar. Gives you some confidence, gives the modelers some confidence they're on the right track. Uh, I also wanted to talk to some work that Claire Davies and Jason Everett have been doing. And this is to try and promote, make more available some of the data. And I know the MBA has been doing a lot of this over the years as well. 
So we call our, it's an R shiny app. A lot of people use R these days. And so we're trying to make products that are available to people um, through R and through this app. Um, show you a couple of examples here. Um, you can see time series. This is for uh, uh, CodePod diversity, um, different, you know, from the CPR in different bioregions. And on the right hand side is the seasonal cycle. You can do these with functional groups or indicators. And here's another example for um, producing maps for uh, different species. So, a species that, um, that you guys will be familiar with. You can see how many Akashas we get in our sample. So we get lots of different species of Akasha. Uh, we can put together the CPR samples plus all the net sampling that historically um, have, uh, has occurred in Australia and that we've archived uh, together with um, CPR data and, and build statistical models, which you can see on the right-hand side, we can draw distribution maps. And we've been using those for quality control, which is useful in terms of our um, our sample analysis, so that, that's very valuable. Um, the final things I wanted to talk about was the Global Alliance of CPR surveys and some of the, the research opportunities. So here's one that's come out recently. Thanks for showcasing this, Chris. Um, so uh, you can see on the right-hand side of the map, the samples from different CPR surveys and Julian's fantastic image of a um, End on a copepod end on, which is pretty impressive. Looks like a Yukita. Um, and so what we did, we were looking at um, Bergman's rule. So Bergman's rule is um, that um, species are larger when they're in colder areas. So for instance, polar bears are larger than sun bears. Sun bears are tropical and smaller. So we wanted to test Bergman's rule in marine copepods. So we assembled all the CPR data and built a generalized linear mixed model. That's a detail. On the right-hand side is part of that model where we're looking at the mean length of copepods in a sample versus sea surface temperature. And you can see the there is a strong decline and, you know, from about two millimeters to about, you know, I think it was 1.6 millimeters from zero degrees to 32 degrees. So it might not seem much, but, it's support for Bergman's rule, you know, larger things in colder water, but also it's got important implications for climate change. So we did some, um, you know, back of the envelope calculations. So under the high um, um, SSP scenario, emission scenario for the future by 2100, this equates to about seven or eight percent decline in copepod biomass globally. And that could have important implications for carbon cycling and fish. You've got to remember small changes in length. You've got to cube that to get an estimate of biomass. So it can have a big impact. No Earth system models consider um, Bergman's rule in, in what's happening with um, zooplankton biomass or fish biomass in the future. And finally, I just wanted to show one of the things that I think we can tackle in GAP GACs, which is um, some more testing of some global patterns that are emerging from models. So. This is a model called ZOOMS, the zooplankton models of size spectra. So we've developed this model. It's got nine, it's basically got more zooplankton groups in it than any other global model. So there's nine groups. And here we've summarized the groups in the omnivores, carnivores, and filter feeders. And you can see some nice pictures from Julian on um, what's in those different groups. And we run this model globally at high resolution we run it to equilibrium and then we can find, see, look at the global pattern. And you can see with um, every, every grid cell actually starts with exactly the same zooplankton composition initially. And then what emerges is you see that the omnivores start to dominate in polar and shelf regions and the carnivores and filter feeders like salps and larvations tend to dominate in the gyres and in tropical areas. So this is something that the, the, you know, the CPR data is very amenable to test. All right, so thank you um, to everyone and thank you to all the zooplankton for making such um, fun research subjects. And I just wanted to wish the survey all the best for the 90th. So I've got a couple of things 
quickly to show. So the first thing is from Ruth. No ideas. That's a lot of plankton. Congratulations. You're an inspiration. All right. Thanks, Ruth. And from the guys. Congratulations. 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 Hooray. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. So, will there's another video coming out there? No? Right? Good. Excellent. No, Thanks that's it, much. Willie. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Anthony. That was brilliant. Um, just, I mean, some amazing images there. I know uh, Julian does a fantastic job, um, and I know he spends a huge amount of time uh, trying to get the perfect image. Um, so that, that's great. And there's a, a, gr a good um, range of applications of how you can use uh, plankton data. Uh, I'm particularly impressed with the, you know, being able to use plankton to measure the strength of the current. That's uh, incredibly impressive, I think. Um, so we're going to uh, we'll leave the questions uh, right to the end of the session, and I believe uh, the next talk uh, from uh, Charles Green is uh, going to be a, a, a video. Uh, so we'll I'll let the team set that up. My name is Charles Green, and I'm a senior fellow with the Ocean Visions Consortium. It's been 15 years since I participated in the 75th anniversary of the CPR survey, the symposium, which was held in Edinburgh, Scotland. Now, a virtual symposium isn't quite the same thing as the real deal, but I do have a lot of interesting things to report that we've learned during the last 15 years. One of the interesting things that I want to report from the Northwest Atlantic is the discovery of two different flavors of decadal scale ecosystem regime shifts. In addition, I want to share with you some remarkable new insights into the conservation oceanography of the North Atlantic right whale. Now I'm going to re approach this story as a murder mystery. And like any good murder mystery, our story starts off with the discovery of a corpse. However, this is actually a mass murder mystery, one that starts off with the discovery of 17 corpses, mostly in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, during the summer of 2017. Now we know that for every corpse in which the cause of death could be determined, the whale was either struck by a ship or entangled in fishing gear. And it should be noted that right whales were rarely reported in the Gulf of St. Lawrence prior to 2017. As we start to look for clues in order to solve this mystery, one very large one sticks out. The Northwest Atlantic, and especially the Gulf of Maine, has been experiencing a series of ocean heat waves, and the Gulf of Maine has been warming faster than 99% of the world ocean during the past decade. So is this a climate change story? To answer this question, we have to look at time series data. In addition to the long time series of climate and physical oceanographic data, we need to look at biological time series. Now, fortunately, we have some very valuable biological time series data to look at. The first time series is based on right whale sightings data collected by and archived by the North Atlantic Right Whale Consortium since the early 1980s. These sightings data are remarkable. Every individual animal in the population is known, and we have sightings data from the winter calving grounds in the Southeast Atlantic Bight all the way up to the summer foraging grounds in the Gulf of Maine and Scotian Shelf. The second time series is based on the zooplankton abundance data derived from the CPR survey. The time series runs from the late 1950s until 2011, when NOAA faced budget cuts and stopped funding the processing of CPR samples. This was another crime, but we won't go into that here. Now, despite the concerns of right whale biologists, concerns largely based on a flawed modeling study by Fujiwara and Caswell that appeared in Nature in 1999, the North Atlantic right whale population was not headed towards extinction in less than 200 years. In fact, during the first decade of the 2000s, the right whale population began growing rapidly relative to the slow population growth of the previous decade. In fact, between 2000 and 2009, 
the population grew from about 350 whales to over 500. In looking at three decades of annually average CPR data on the late stage of Calamus finmarchicus in the Gulf of Maine, the relationship between copepod abundance and North Atlantic right whale calving rate is striking. And the decadal scale population growth rates are equally striking, high in the 1980s and 2000s and low in the 1990s. In a series of papers, we were able to show that the Northwest Atlantic underwent ecosystem regime shifts during each of these decades, remotely forced by modal shifts in Arctic climate. The Arctic Oscillation has a negative anticyclonic regime characterized by a reduction in the counterclockwise winds above the Arctic Ocean, and a positive cyclonic regime characterized by a strengthening of these counterclockwise winds above the Arctic Ocean. When the weaker anticyclonic winds blow, the clockwise flowing Beaufort gyre spins up and stores fresh water. When the stronger anticyclonic winds blow, the clockwise flowing Beaufort gyre spins down and fresh water is exported into the North Atlantic on both sides of Greenland through the Canadian Arctic archipelago, as well as through the Fram Strait on the Eastern side. If we look closely at the physical time series and we look specifically at the transitions between 1980 and 1990 and the 1990s and the 2000s, we can see that the transition from negative to positive AO conditions at the beginning of the 1990s. We can see the spinning down of the Beaufort gyre, and this is indicated by the Arctic Oscillation Index, which is a measure of the dynamic height of the Beaufort gyre. The freshening shelf waters in the Northwest Atlantic, as indicated by the Regional Shelf Water Salinity Index. And we can see that the reverse happens uh, during the transition between the 1990s and the 2000s. We can also track one of these salinity anomalies as it's exported out of the Arctic Ocean. Here you can see the one that came out into the Labrador Sea in 1989, and we can track it as it makes its way down uh, the shelf, eventually reaching the Gulf of Maine in around 1991. We can also look at the biological responses, the ecosystem regime shifts to this remote physical forcing from the Arctic. If we look at a few of the most relevant biological time series, then we can see that the freshening during the 1990s led to an increase in autumn phytoplankton concentration. It led to an increase in the abundance of small copepods. It led to an increase in the abundance of the younger or juvenile abundance stages of Calanus, and it led to a decrease in the abundance of the late stages of Calanus. We hypothesized that this unusual result was Calanus is due to size selective predation by planktivorous fish, which also increased during this ecosystem regime shift. Now we developed a new and improved right whale reproduction model that resolved the continuous plankton recorder calanus data seasonally in three month intervals and geographically in these four different regions. And this model basically looks at right whales, females recovering from a pregnancy, becoming pregnant, and then transitioning into nursing. And we looked at this model where we first assumed that the transitions um, occurred independent of prey availability. Then we ran the model with those transitions being driven strictly by the, the annual abundance of Calanus over the whole Gulf of Maine. And you can see that the fit is pretty good. And then we ran the model where we had this geographically and seasonally resolved prey dependent model. And you can see that the fit was very good. Now we can also uh, pull out some other things out of this model, for example, the model tells us during the summertime, the abundance of calanus in the eastern Gulf of Maine is very important. Um, this eastern Gulf of Maine also uh, is a good proxy for the abundance of calanus in the Bay of Fundy. 
which is a very important foraging ground. And by looking at the seasonally re resolved transitional probabilities, it tells us that most of the time pregnant females carry their pregnancies to term and successfully calf. However, when poor feeding years occur in the Eastern Gulf of Maine, the probability of carrying a calf to term drops to zero. Note that we've been able to extend the Calamus finmarchicus abundance index time series beyond 2009. And we were able to do this because we received funding from the Lenfest Ocean Program that enabled us to count those samples that were sitting in the laboratory shelves at the Marine Biological Laboratory um, since NOAA was no longer funding the sorting of them. And that brings us to the surprises of the last decade from 2010 to 2019, when an ocean regime shift dramatically impacted the fate of the North Atlantic right whale population. We know that the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, has been slowing down during recent decades. In 2010, the Gulf Stream, which lies at the tail end of the AMOC, uh, began shifting its trajectory. After it moves away from the continental shelf as a freely meandering jet, the initiation of meanders began shifting further to the west towards the shelf. In addition, the Gulf Stream north wall moved to the north. What this did is it resulted in the Gulf Stream contributing more of its warm and salty water to the slope waters in the region, which entered the deep basins of the Gulf of Maine through Northeast Channel. This warm slope water filled the deep basins of the Gulf of Maine at depth and preconditioned the Gulf for the heat waves observed in the surface waters over the past decade. This led to a dramatic regime shift in 2010. The Gulf Stream Index revealed a significant decadal shift in the position of the Gulf Stream's north wall to the north. The Regional Slope Water Temperature Index revealed a significant decadal warming of the region's slope water. The Calinus finmarchicus abundance index in the eastern Gulf of Maine showed that with the warming temperatures, Calinus abundance dropped dramatically. And then if we look at the North Atlantic right well calving index, we can see that calving also dropped dramatically during the decade. But it gets worse for the North Atlantic right well population. We can also look at this decadal shift in Northwest Atlantic foraging grounds. This first column corresponds to 2000 and 2009, the second column to 2010 to 2019. And what we can see is the prey availability declined in the Eastern Gulf of Maine and Bay of Fundy during summer. And that led to the population abandoning uh, its typical foraging grounds during the summertime in the Bay of Fundy and actually Rose Basin on the Scotian Shelf. And as those drop dramatically during the following decade, we can see that the increase uh, in whale sightings in the Gulf of St. Lawrence occurred. The consequences have been grave. The Canadians were not expecting the arrival of right whales and had no protections in place. The Gulf of St. Lawrence has the busiest shipping industry in Eastern Canada and is an important site for the snow crab fishery. This resulted in a catastrophic mortality rate it has led to the death of at least 34 whales during the past three years due to ship strikes and fishing gear entanglement. The North Atlantic right whale population has go gone from gradually increasing during the decades of the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s to moderate and then high probabilities of extinction during the past decade. Last summer, the IUCN moved the North Atlantic right whale from endangered to critically endangered on its red list. These are indeed not good times for right whales. Questions? OK, 
Okay, uh, so we'll wait and take uh, the questions at the end. So just to remind everybody to uh, make sure that uh, you put the questions in the, the uh, question and answer uh, function, please. So that was an uh, excellent talk and an excellent example of how, again, you can sort of use plankton to sort of build a much sort of wider and thorough uh, picture of uh, what, what is actually happening uh, in the ecosystem. Um, okay, so we're going to move or stay in roughly the same region. Uh, and uh, John Fisher is uh, going to uh, give it. I don't know if John's, is John here live for this or is, is this a recorded talk? I wasn't sure. This is a recorded one, so we'll just play recorded that. Recorded one. Now. So we'll just go straight on to that. Thanks, Maya. Good afternoon. My name is John Fisher. I'm the research chair in Marine Fisheries Ecosystem Dynamics within the Center for Fisheries Ecosystems Research at Memorial University of Newfoundland. I'm based in St. John's, Newfoundland on Canada's far east coast. I'd like to thank the organizers of this symposium for the opportunity to present some of the work that I've been, uh, been uh, taking on for the last few years and some of the work that I've been uh, undertaking uh, just last week. This is a, a picture from uh, September 3rd of this year. Southern Ellesmere Island, um, having great success with continuous plankton recorder um, from latitudes just south of this location. And in this session, in the context of global coverage, um, this is a, a map, of course, from Sonia Batten and others in 2019, looking at information up to 2016 or so. Uh, certainly great global coverage. And in the yellow box there is the sort of region I'm going to talk about. Uh, but certainly less from high latitude polar regions, obviously limited by sea ice conditions. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you how less Arctic ice might mean more opportunities for CPR sampling, uh, something that we've taken advantage of and integrated those data with others from this region. And this is an animation uh, from NASA in the US showing the extent of sea ice minimum each year from 1979 to 2020. Um, so not showing an annual cycle, but just simply those uh, minima each year. So back 1979, six and a half million square kilometers or so. This is showing uh, uh, the amount of change uh, which seemed to pick up rapidly since 2000 or so. This is uh, impacting the area where I do research, uh, including the area shown between Greenland, uh, the world's largest island, and Baffin Island, the world's fifth largest island, and the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. So by 2020, uh, instead of six and a half million square kilometers of ice, three and a half million square kilometers uh, impacting this region, and really changing um, the abundance and distribution of ice and the abundance and distribution potentially of many of the creatures that rely upon them. And this is a changing pattern that was certainly seized upon by industry, including the cruise industry. And the first opportunity that I had to develop a CPR program within this region involved uh, the Crystal Serenity. This is a cruise ship that includes uh, more than a thousand guests, the largest ship to transit the Northwest Passage in 2016-2017, uh, and this is a 32-day voyage uh, from Seward, Alaska, shown there in the western uh, area, up through Canadians uh, or Canada's Northwest Passage, across to Greenland, and then south, ending in New York City. This is an unprecedented scale of, uh, of uh, transport and uh, leisure and required uh, quite a bit of logistics support in addition to the Crystal Serenity. So there was a global search for the right vessel to uh, achieve these goals. And that search um, ended up with the Royal Research Ship Ernest Shackleton, uh, obviously the right ship for the job to escort a uh, cruise ship through the Northwest Passage. This is an 80 meter long ship operated by the British Antarctic Survey with immense response capacity, logistical support, helicopter capacity, uh, and everything that you would need to safely uh, make this uh, mission as successful as possible. So our connection uh, comes through the, the offer of a couple of berths for scientists and a couple of berths aboard Shackleton to a couple of uh, uh, cadets from our group. And the challenge for me was then to design a program that worked within Shackleton's uh, very complex mission and on a vessel that really didn't want to stop as it's transiting from east to west to meet up with the Shackleton in the Western Arctic. 
So the objectives that I had were to uh, uh, deploy mini CTD aboard uh, the CPR, in addition to vertical nets at those places where the, uh, the uh, ship did stop. And this is based on work that I've uh, done with data from CPR uh, going back quite a few years. So here's a view of the back deck of the Ernest Shackleton, 15 different Zodiacs, hard-sided tour boat, two helicopters on the helipad, um, showing a bit of the scale of operations. And this vessel, of course, uh, housed all the tour guides as well to make this uh, successful uh, mission. So again, 2016, shown here in red, um, some success with CPR and much greater success within 2017, shown in these yellow CPR legs. Uh, pulled out for ice, going from east to west, again from St. John's, Newfoundland, right across to the Western Canadian Arctic. The two ships then met up in a place called Ulakoptuk, and here's a picture of that, uh, that meeting, and then transited back together uh, at, at times where the opportunity for CPR was a bit less, um, going from uh, west to east. But overall in 2017, more than 2,800 nautical miles of CPR samples. Um, a great success with this, uh, with this program, given the largely ice-free conditions in these waters. So to give a quick snapshot then, 67 species of phytoplankton, 34 small zooplankton, 25 large zooplankton species. And what uh, MBA CPR group then led starting in 2016 was the identification of plastics uh, picked off the silks with, uh, with large zooplankton. And it turns out that within this region, Plastics were about 7% of all large zooplankton and actually ranked fourth out of 25 different taxa um, across this group. Really uh, a striking um, way to pick up um, this information and these, uh, the extent of plastic waste in our waters. So large zooplankton, obviously some, uh, some strong biogeography, species like Calamus from Marchicus, um, being uh, quite abundant and occupying 43% of these uh, different sections, and only 6% of those through the Northwest Passage. Similarly, hyperids um, changing uh, uh, or decreased abundance within the Northwest Passage. Mertridia uh, being absent from the Northwest Passage and quite abundant outside of, uh, of that region going south. And in contrast to those three dominant species, uh, the fourth rank plastics, uh, no real biogeography to speak of. Um, except for uh, perhaps wind-driven or current-driven patterns of uh, local abundance um, being outside the Northwest Passage, inside the Northwest Passage. And the overlap or lack of overlap or hotspots of plastic and these uh, dominant large zooplankton might have implications for uh, encounter rates with uh, fish, marine mammals that might concentrate on uh, hotspots of large zooplankton while they're feeding. Another interesting result um, to show you here, 12 different sections of uh, CPR shown labeled in the, uh, the map and 12 different sections shown here um, where the average number of phytoplankton taxa per silk um, increased. And as that increased, the average abundance of phytoplankton per silk increased as well. So maybe per perhaps not surprising. What was surprising was within the Queen Maud Gulf region, uh, 32 out of 56 total larval fish sampled across this whole domain we're within that one section. This is an area um, that I monitored quite closely as we were transiting along the edge of the ice. And this overlap between uh, high phytoplankton abundance, high larval fish abundance um, in the CPR is quite remarkable. Uh, it's certainly remarkable that 32 fish were forced into that half inch aperture. Um, and this has led to other questions within other research programs and other devices, how to bring these uh, two different or more than two different um, sets of equipment together. And part of that has been uh, scaling up this operation. So from the ship, the two years aboard the Shackleton to now a multi-year program aboard uh, the Canadian Coast Guard ship uh, Amundsen, which is Canada's largest research icebreaker. We have a program now from uh, 2019 uh, to 2023 uh, at least. And that Arctic fish program uh, is also supported by the provision of berths aboard the uh, Amundsen, which is uh, which is the way that we can get out to sea and get on this uh, icebreaker annually now. So some of the work I do involves baited underwater cameras and also CPR that has been integrated into the science program since uh, 2019. 
And the fisheries acoustics uh, and, and zooplankton nets and many other operations are being matched up with the CPR to examine trophic links uh, with a focus, for example, on larval uh, Arctic cod, uh, a program led by PhD student Jennifer Herbig. And when we're putting these new programs together, it's often uh, worth uh, looking at the past, reading uh, Sir Alistair Hardy's uh, insights on early 20th century research, um, the work with, uh, or with herring catches in Kalamazoo poor water and Kalamazoo rich water, showing uh, some of the differences, and asking quite the same question ultimately: Can our research or can our knowledge of this drifting community, the plankton, uh, which has been won by so much research, help us in our fisheries problems? And so shown there on the right as well, um, overlapping uh, quite closely with the way that we're approaching this. Uh, some of Cushing's early work on calamus distribution and uh, herring distribution from echo sounders. Uh, so we have higher tech uh, gear these days, but again, answer or addressing some of the same questions that have been asked for many, many decades. So this is uh, the Amundsen. Uh, the first deployments of CPR were in 2019, again, to compare with acoustics and net data aboard that vessel. There's also Claire Ossel's work in the Western Arctic. Uh, with plans to link the work from Amundsen and the Wilfrid Laurier, where she's had uh, great success uh, through that region. And in 2019, on leg three, this is a leg that went from Resolute in the, the Nunavut region right down to Quebec City. Um, the CPR was able to sample more than 2,000 nautical miles in all of that yellow section, except those areas shown here in blue. So 45% of the total extent uh, being sampled across this domain, uh, a great success. Uh, everyone appreciated the, uh, the utility and robust and ease of use of CPR as it's deployed and retrieved. And these analyses uh, have obviously been COVID impacted and are ongoing uh, to link this information with uh, the other wealth of information collected aboard the Amundsen. Obviously no sampling in 2020, um, but 2021, this mission is uh, ongoing. I just stepped off uh, the vessel on September 9th at Resolute. I've been on there since August 12th with CPR aboard for leg three. Um, other students and researchers are on until uh, some of them for the next leg or joining for the, uh, the final leg, which ends in November 3rd. So this is an extensive program that uh, at face value here, you might think could sample CPR um, endlessly. But there is still sea ice in the Canadian Arctic and the timing of uh, the, the plans for deployment of CPR really depend on this seasonal cycle of ice. So the green line shows the sort of uh, the climatology of sea ice percentage across this region in the Eastern Canadian Arctic. And the blue lines are showing information from this year. Uh, this is from the Canadian Ice Service, uh, a product that uh, is free online. So if we had to cho chose the leg two, sea ice conditions would have been like that. Leg three was the one chosen at the uh, minimum of sea ice conditions, uh, which, uh, which will sort of turn around um, sort of today would be the minimum for sea ice in this region. You can see that by legs four and five, the sea ice conditions could be up to uh, 50, 60% within this uh, wider region. So leg three was obviously targeted for this, uh, this work. And we had great success in 2021. Uh, we had seven different CPR sections that were successfully completed, uh, all the way to uh, some of the highest latitudes that we've ever done. Uh, more than 1,200 nautical miles sampled, which again represents 40% of the total extent of uh, leg three. And CPR, of course, wasn't the only operation. There were more than 200 different science operations across these uh, 50 or so different stations. 24-hour uh, operations on the vessel. And here's a, a picture of the uh, the last day aboard with CPR number 22. Uh, ran so very well for us over this whole season. And this is a device, uh, it turns out, was built in 1949. So still going strong. What I'd like to conclude with was the is the fact that uh, decreasing summer minimum sea ice conditions uh, facilitate the deployment of CPR through the Northwest Passage and the Canadian Arctic. We've used the proof of concept aboard the uh, Ernest Shackleton to ex extend this and grow this program within the Arctic Net and Amundsen research programs. Uh, this is leading to new and some of the renewed uh, questions that uh, Hardy might have originally asked. 
Uh, the current research and training programs that uh, I'm involved in seek to link some of this information, acoustics, CPR, uh, plastic pollution hotspots, providing baseline information for one of the fastest changing marine environments on Earth. And finally, this research is only possible through the pioneering vision of uh, Sir Alistair Hardy and the maintenance of expertise samples within MBA CPR. With that, I'd like to acknowledge Again, the CPR expertise and training, logistics analyses uh, that have really aided uh, my team from the MBA in the UK. Some of the opportunities that we've had aboard ships, uh, ships officers and crew, uh, some of the funding agencies, and uh, I'd really welcome your questions and discussion within the, uh, the open session and uh, discuss this in the context of other global programs as they've been uh, even more developed. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow, that was excellent. And it's a real um, pioneering work going on in what is uh, extremely challenging conditions there. I, I did like the fact that uh, I think you used the term robust um, a few times. And that's one of, certainly one of the huge advantages with uh, the, the CPR is that they can get through some of the toughest uh, conditions on the, uh, in the ocean, really. So, uh, so well done. Uh, on that. So we'll, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a, uh, some questions at the end. So the final session is going to be uh, from uh, Sonia Barton, and, and she's going to tell us that in this, uh, roughly the same region, uh, but uh, moving over into the uh, Pacific. And, and, and Sonia is going to tell us a bit about how she set up the survey and some of the results that have come from that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here today to celebrate the CPR survey reaching 90 years. It's a tremendous achievement. I'm going to talk to you today about the North Pacific CPR survey, um, which is now in its 21st year. And I'd like to thank uh, my co-author Claire Ossel, who took over from me about 18 months ago in running this survey. I know it's in great hands. So what I'll do today is go through the timeline of the North Pacific CPR survey from the vision, which was about 30 years ago now, through the early stages and establishing a routine survey. Some of the challenges along the way, some of the highlights, um, some of the things that we did well have made this successful um, as I reach the conclusion of where we are today, 21 years later. So the first written record of a plan for a North Pacific CPR survey came in uh, this annual report from the very first North Pacific Marine Science Organization meeting in 1992. And Tim Parsons had proposed uh, a vision for a survey to the Biological Oceanography Committee. And when I read through this paragraph uh, in that report, I was quite pleased that we've achieved most of the things that, that Tim was suggesting uh, such a survey might be able to do. The only uh, statement I take issue with is his very first sentence that the value of CPR data can only be assessed after a significant time series has been established. And I'll talk more about that later. But as many of you may know, my current position is Executive Secretary of the North Pacific Marine Science Organization. And as we're planning our um, 30th annual meeting right now, um, I think it's very fitting that, uh, that this report was here in the very first annual meeting. And the current chair of the Biological Oceanography Committee is Akash Sastri, who is our DFO our collaborator. Um, so there's been a lot of friends for the Pacific CPR survey right from the very beginning. So there were conversations between uh, Chris Reed, who was then director of SAFOS, and colleagues in the North Pacific. And in summer 1997, SAFOS undertook a one-off pilot transect behind an oil tanker from California up to Alaska. Um, and those samples were collected and analyzed back in the UK. And then Pisces extended an invitation to us through their monitor technical committee to attend their 1998 annual meeting and talk about this top pilot tow. So that was the first time that I'd set foot in North America. Um, I gave the results. And from that, working with scientists in the region, we put in place, we put forward a proposal to put a survey in place. And the first routine transect started a couple of years later in 2000. And we had two transects right from the word go, one trans-Pacific transect from the west coast of North America through the southern Bering Sea and over to Asia, and a second transect that was uh, up the west coast of North America, initially from California, but after a couple of years, that too came from uh, the Salish Sea up to Alaska. And those two transects have been in operation ever since. 
So that now, here we are 21 years later um, with uh, this map showing the position of all of the, of the CPR transects. And we have a total of about 32,000 samples that have been collected and archived in that time. About a third to a quarter, roughly eight and a half thousand have been analyzed with a microscope to give uh, taxonomic abundance data. And in the last couple of years, we've also seen an expansion up into the Arctic. And again, I'll talk more about that later. So what worked well in setting up the CPR survey was having a flexible approach initially. So when the seed funding had been used up, we established a consortium so that agencies that were um, interested in supporting the North Pacific CPR survey each only had to provide uh, a modest cost, but they still got the benefits of the entire survey. And that um, cost sharing provided us with a lot of leverage in, in, in extracting other funds from other agencies. We were flexible in our sampling design. Um, rather than the standard um, CPR North Atlantic survey, we had variable spatial and temporal resolution depending on the needs of the funders. Um, so for example, we, do, we don't often survey in winter um, because we have a limited amount of funding and, and it's best to focus it on the spring and summer productive months. And typically, instead of doing alternate samples under the microscope, we do every fourth oceanic sample, but some of the shelf samples we do with a higher resolution because that's where there's most interest. We had local and remote teams, so people in the UK and people in North America. And that's not without challenges. Um, communication is more important, and, and this is going back to a time before we we're all communicating on Zoom or, or other virtual platforms. So time differences make it challenging to have telephone calls with people, um, and you have to be more on top of the communication. But it also um, has benefits because with local teams in place, there's um, a real local buy-in, and, and it has a lot of local relevance, so you get more, um, uh, more input from, from colleagues. We made the data and samples freely available from the outside. Collaboration wasn't required. It usually happened anyway, um, but we were certainly very open about people having access to data and samples. And then we focused right from the start on providing outputs quickly. We published quickly. Um, I'll talk about the type of publications in a moment. We published collaboratively. Even the very first papers also included authors from, um, from the region, from, from North America, from Asia, um, perhaps through our funding agencies. And also, as soon as we could, we contributed to the regular assessments uh, for policy or management that were, were being carried out in the region. So since 2003, we've had a funding consortium in place. Uh, with Pisces receiving the funds, um, because it's an intergovernmental organization, it can receive the funds from North America um, and um, pass some of them through to the, the UK. Um, and then SAFOS and then the MBA provided most of the expertise, training local people, archiving all of the samples and doing all of the quality control. We set up a um, collaborative agreement with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, and they also provide lab facilities and local technicians. Um, and we have a, a, a CPR lab set up in a local um, DFO lab. And then when we um, received interest from our Japanese colleagues, they supported the Western Pacific sample analysis, so west of uh, uh, the Bering Sea. And that was initially through Japan Society for Promotion of Science and uh, Sanai Chiba. And then more latterly, it's been through colleagues at Hokkaido University. And then in the last few years, we've had some Arctic bursaries to the MBA, which have supported expanding into the Arctic. So I talked about outputs. As of now, we have 32 peer-reviewed papers that use both the data and the samples. And these are just uh, the research papers um, that are using data from the North Pacific. These are not the um, wider, sort of more global um, policy type publications that have also we've also contributed to. And on the bottom here, I've got a few of the instances of when these papers were published. So in the early stages, we weren't talking about time series at all. We were talking about um, distributions, new novel species records. Um, I've got an example here of influence of coastal eddies on oceanic plankton distributions. We also have done some molecular studies on a couple of, uh, of organisms near Calanus in 2007, Pseudonychia, which is a harmful algal bloom species in 2018. 
we have a couple of papers looking at the effects of climate variability to so northward extension of warm water copepods, both in the Eastern Pacific, which was published in 2011, and in the Western Pacific, published in 2015. And then another couple of examples of um, using the samples to um, define ice escapes based on stable isotope analyses. And then more recently, we have a uh, we had a project funded by NASA with some colleagues in California, and that's produced three papers, uh, or will have when the final one is, is accepted, um, looking at uh, satellite information uh, combined with uh, CPR data. And I'm going to go through a couple of those examples. So in addition to the research publications, we've also contributed to regular assessments carried out by a variety of organizations and agencies. So agencies such as uh, DFO in Canada, which looks at uh, annual state of the Pacific Ocean and publishes a report. Uh, NOAA in the USA publishes uh, ecosystem status reports for several regions around Alaska. Um, the Global Ocean Observing System Biology and Ecosystems Panel considers phytoplankton and zooplankton essential ocean variables. And through, um, through GACT, through the Global Alliance, uh, we've contributed uh, data and information to that. And then both the MBA and Pisces also publish regular every uh, few years uh, assessments of the North Pacific Ocean or, or more globally that have CPR data contributed to them. So in these ways, we um, provide the information, um, the value of time series and make sure that um, the agencies that have been funding uh, the North Pacific Survey recognize um, and get value from, from that support. So now I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, research highlights. And this first example is from 2011, uh, when the time series was only a decade long. And um, in the Northeast Pacific, we have what's uh, termed the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is um, a mode of climate variability. When the, uh, when the PDO is positive, then conditions in the Northeast East Pacific tend to be warmer, and when it's negative, they tend to be colder. And we'd experienced a couple of cycles of this oscillation um, in the first decade of sampling. So the graph here up on the right shows the cumulative abundance of some warm water copepods moving from 48 degrees north up to 58 degrees north. And this is cumulative abundance, so as more were found, then uh, the, the graph increases. And what was very clear was that in the warmer years, these warm water copepods were both more abundant, but also were being added to, um, were still being found right up to the Alaskan shelf, so right up to the north. And particularly warm years here were in 2005 when the PDO was, at, uh, was quite positive. And then if I update these data to um, include some information from a more recent extreme event that we had in the Northeast Pacific. This was a marine heat wave um, that lasted for uh, at least two years in 2015 and 2016. And if I plot some of the data from the previous slide here with 2005 was the, um, the, the previous highest abundance of these warm water species and then plot uh, 2015 and 2016, you can see that in 2015, there were many times more um, of these copepods and they were still being found right up to the northern part of the region. Um, so this is an example of how copepod distributions really respond to climate forcing. This slide is an example of um, where our samples were used for research. I believe Boris Espinas is talking later today, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, and I don't have much time left either. Um, but this was uh, some work we did with Boris where we picked off zooplankton from across the Northeast Pacific, and they were sent away for stable isotope determination. And then models, uh, Boris used models to produce um, these maps of uh, the um, nitrogen-15 isotope signature, which is an indication of productivity. And I like these, these maps to show both the uh, interannual variability, if you look at, say, the difference between 2012 and 2015. Remember, 2015 and 2016 were when the uh, marine heat wave was happening. But also the sort of mesoscale variability you can see in productivity here, uh, where you have some of these coastally derived eddies out in the open ocean, which have a higher productivity signal. And maps like this would be really useful for matching up um, distribution of uh, uh, higher trophic levels so fish, uh, marine birds and mammals, with where their prey may be. 
And then this final research highlight, um, it's not necessarily my best paper ever, but it's certainly the one that's received the most interest. Uh, I still get asked to give interviews on it. So in the North Pacific, there are multiple species of salmon. The pink salmon are one of the smaller species and they have a two year life cycle. Um, so because the runs um, tend to uh, stay separate, you have situations where one run is much stronger than the, the year after. Um, and in this particular region, uh, the odd year runs are very, very high and the even year runs are much lower. And what we noticed in CPR data from the Southern Bering Sea and the, um, around the Aleutian Islands to the east of the Southern Bering Sea was that in years when pink salmon were very abundant, um, so in the odd years, the numbers of copepods which form part of their diet were, were much lower. And then because the large copepods were being removed, the numbers of diatoms were much higher. And this is the only time that we'd seen this alternating pattern um, of odd year and even year and a likely impact of the predator um, on the food chain from the top down, which is, uh, is an unusual um, thing to find. So this has sparked a lot of interest um, in the region, especially because pink salmon are one of the species that are reared in hatcheries and released in, in huge numbers. So just some highlights of the research that we've done, the full publication list is available and I encourage you to have a look at the variety of different uh, topics that we've covered in the CPR survey in the North Pacific. But I'd also like to thank um, all of the people that have had a hand in this. It's not just uh, myself and Claire, but we have people at, uh, in British Columbia, Doug Moore, Akash Sastry, John Nelson and Melissa Hennessy. We have Gary and Mark up in Kinetic Labs in Anchorage who do local servicing. Everyone at the MBA in the CPR survey because they put up with me being very demanding for very many years. Of course, all the analysts who've contributed to this valuable data and the ships and shipping companies we'd be lost without. So in the, uh, in the um, life stages of a person, we're about here. We've reached uh, 21 years old, you know, young adulthood. There's lots more to come. I know the survey's in great hands with Claire and I'm looking forward to seeing what, what happens next. Thanks for your time today. Excellent, thanks, Sonia. I hope we don't get to the stage where we've got a stick in our hand anyway. Um, but uh, an, another, an amazing example of, uh, you know, some of the links to, you know, ocean productivity in higher trophic levels and, and also the, you know, the, how, uh, an excellent demonstration of how to go about actually setting up a, a survey. Um, so I guess we, the, I, I, at this point, I think I hand over to Maya, who uh, then chairs the session, uh, the, the, the uh, questions and answer. And if we could bring everybody on board, and I want to—I'll take this when everybody's getting themselves set up. Just to thank all the speakers for uh, getting here at uh, incredibly unsociable hours. I don't even know what time Sonia and um, um, Charles uh, started this morning, but it, it must be um, very, very early. What time did you start, Sonia? Uh, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Oh my word. I think I think uh, I think Charles is on the same time zone as me at the moment too. So. All right. Okay. And then Anthony, which is probably a little bit better, but toward, towards the end of the day. So uh, yeah. Okay. So do we have um, if uh, Jonathan uh, is, is Charles here? I think he said he was going to try and get here. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, excellent. Oh, oh, great to see you. I think it's 4 a.m. for Charles though, isn't it, Charles? I think that was the... Uh, actually, it's it's a little bit after five now. <laughs> oh, well, it's getting to morning. You're okay now. <laughs> um, if I could just add a couple of comments in the chat function as well, because I'm aware that some of our listeners who are listening live through YouTube and our Facebook account, um, we've had some interesting comments. So one from yourself, Chuck, which is just saying that our story isn't all bad news, um, that the scientists and managers in Canada have provided advice that has significantly reduced white whale deaths in the past year, which is great news, and that the work has inspired the US Congress to fund NOAA so that it can restart the GOM CPR survey line. So it's the Gulf of Maine CPR survey line. So that's fantastic news. And another bit of news connected to that, we're also getting the first publication from that translated 
into the science um, scientific journal for kids article, which makes um, everyday science really accessible to young people. And it's a really great topic. Obviously, we've got the sort of showcase rails within there and talk of climate change and plankton as well. So it'll be a, a lovely way of introducing um, a topic to our younger audience. And that's going to feature in our Marine Biologist magazine, which is our quarterly membership magazine. Um, little plug now, if you wanted to become a member of the MBA, then we would be very happy for you to join our global community we run at about 35 countries at the moment so it'd be great to have any additional countries perhaps that are represented today and by joining us amongst many other benefits you'll be able to read that article that's coming out in january i think it was um so yeah please do join it's mba.ac.uk forward slash membership so we have got a couple of questions the first one from jan um, it's just asking if cruise ships increase is there a potential for additional transfer of species from west to east through ballast transfer and is there a likely increase in pollution and ocean eutrophication as well so maybe uh maybe i could address that and um yeah i'm not a real ballast water expert but uh, just looking really quickly uh, Transport Canada, which is a federal department, has uh, enacted some uh, regulations and recommendations along those lines. So if, uh, if people are interested, there's something called Guidelines for Operation of Passenger Vessels Within Canadian Arctic Waters. And there's a specific uh, section on ballast water exchange. And it turns out uh, in that section, it talks about uh, the Canadian government wanting to limit that sort of thing. And uh, the government has established a voluntary ballast water exchange guidelines where ballast water should be as far away from land as possible and a depth greater than two kilometers. Uh, and they've also given specific areas where uh, if that's not possible, there's there could be some ballast water exchange within certain uh, locations. So uh, yeah, great question. Uh, certainly an issue. Um, and the regulations that I see them from the federal government here in Transport Canada uh, look and uh, rely upon established voluntary ballast water exchange guidelines being adhered to. Um, so there is certainly the, the potential for that type of exchange and that's, uh, that's an issue uh, of, uh, of things coming through. So of course, uh, 100,000 years um, uh, for species to show up uh, could really change the timelines for species coming across based on this type of, uh, this type of mechanism. Great, thank you, Jonathan. And there's um, another question here that's linked to your talk, Jonathan. Um, I'm wondering, Marina was wondering whether you're working with Inuit leaders on your cruise. Um, not on that uh, cruise specifically, on some other projects uh, within um, fisheries in northern uh, or in Nunavut region and the development of fisheries and how can that can fisheries develop sustainably. We are working with, uh, with Inuit groups, uh, but not specifically on the Amundsen um, cruise. Uh, cruise operations. Okay, great stuff, thank you. And a question here, which I think is for Chuck, if you're still awake, I know it's um, 5 a.m. Yeah, in the I'm morning here. for you, well done. Um, so there's a question here saying, if there, there are measures that have been put in place to protect the white whales in their new region, and obviously being a really highly mobile species and with climate change and MPAs, how, how do we best manage these very mobile species? Well, it, it's been actually a really interesting uh, progression, let's say, to, to observe. So uh, the Canadians had uh, some acoustic monitoring in place uh, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence from about in about 2015 and they and they were uh, starting to uh, uh, hear right whales so they knew that they were present. Um, they didn't put any protections in place. They didn't really start any uh, significant monitoring. Um, until 2017, and that was the year when 17 whales were killed, 12 of them in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, and you know, I, I must say that the Canadians responded very quickly to that, um, and they instituted a pretty significant monitoring program very rapidly, um, both aerial surveys, um, they started to do a lot more uh, work looking at where plankton were trying to uh, estimate, uh, you know, or evaluate where, where things, uh, where the whales were gonna show up um, so that they could adjust the uh, speeds in the, sh in the shipping lanes, um, dropping the speeds down to 10 knots. And also um, they changed the timing um, of the uh, stow crab fishery. Uh, 
and they limited which areas of the Gulf of St. Lawrence they could work in. And so it, everything looked really good because the following year, only one whale uh, was, was killed. And that actually wasn't in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So it looked like the response was uh, exceptionally good. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I think that the managers uh, thought that they had learned a lot more than they actually had. And also there was a lot of uh, uh, pressure from the, uh, <clears throat> from the shipping and fishing industries. So they relaxed some of the measures that they had put in place. And so the following year, 10 more whales were killed. Um, so it was kind of up and down. Uh, and then this past year, you know, again, things are, uh, they've really ramped things up. And to my knowledge, as of, uh, you know, very recently, no whales have been killed in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll continue with, with a, a track record like this past year, but it has been up and down so far. Um, so, you know, really you, you have to monitor and you have to have uh, rapid uh, management. And again, with climate change, you know, we have to have much more dynamic uh, management in place. And we, we've been uh, working, our, we have a team with both US and Canadian scientists, and we've been working very hard to try to communicate our results, uh, you know, to the, to the managers. That's great, thank you, Chuck. There's some nice, hopeful, optimistic messages then there for the Northern White Whales. Um, we don't seem to have any more questions. Sonia, you had your hand up at one stage. Did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I was actually going to add to the, um, what Jonathan was saying earlier about um, uh, movement of species. And it's not just perhaps ballast water exchanges, um, but also as the Arctic gets increasingly ice free, we're going to see uh, uh, more and more movement of species um, through the Arctic. And one thing that these new CPR surveys in the Arctic have, will be able to show is how that um, movement of species happens because we have uh, the Western Arctic, the Eastern Arctic covered now, um, and then also down into the Bering Sea and North Pacific and down into the, the North Atlantic. So it gives us the opportunity to track those species movements over time. We, we've gotten into the Arctic at a good time, I think, for that. I'm not sure if I'm muted in time for you to hear the PO ferry with its horn just passing up by window. Um, that's what it was if you heard it. Um, thank you, Sonia. Um, and do you have any more questions? And, and while you're there, Sonia, it might be worth my while just apologising for the constant demo of the cake. I know that you're desperate for some. But next time you're here, we will try and make sure there's some available for you. Um, back to you, Willie, who uh, virus invalid in a virus evangelist you're being called by John Spicer. Uh, I think that's in my description, actually. Um, so I, I really had a, a question, but one of the things that I, I guess the, that's common across uh, the, the, the talks here, or particularly at least three out of the four of the talks, is the setting up, you know, the challenges of setting up a new survey uh, for different lengths of time. And I, I think Sonia for probably the bit the longest than Anthony and then John setting up the, the new uh, survey in the Northwest Passage there. Um, I, I, mean, what, I mean, what are the biggest challenges, would you say, from uh, for, that you've each faced? And I'm sure there's been different challenges, funding being one of them, I'm sure. I like the, the fact that uh, Sonia, I mean, she really uh, highlighted the, the consortium approach, which has been really successful for the uh, the success of the Pacific survey. But I, I don't know if you three, if you want to comment on that. I'll go to John for the, the shortest one. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly this has been. Uh... This is an opportunity. So I'm at a, a university. I don't, uh, and our university um, is funded by grants and projects. And so we're about uh, advancing new ideas and, and hopefully handing off some of the longer term monitoring to groups that are, uh, that are more associated with that, like the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, so that being said, uh, I, I mean, the, uh, the Arctic uh, work that we've done has been supported by, uh, by grants and by ship time um, with the goal that we can um, show what this is capable of, and other groups might then take this on in a longer, uh, longer term um, monitoring program. 
So I've also been in contact with other groups, um, including the fishing industry. How can those vessels that are going north and south uh, from Newfoundland into the into Nunavut region each year, might they be uh, ships of opportunity of the future? Um, so uh, keeping going with the Amundsen program is obviously a scientific goal and maintaining that is, is part of what I would like to do. But at the same time, groups like Fisheries and Oceans Canada uh, have a mandate and have uh, approaches now. Uh, so on the Amundsen cruise, there were those 25 stations off of Baffin Island. And what that was a part of is a group called, or a project called Knowledge and Ecosystem-Based Approach to Baffin Bay, where all the vertical net information, all the uh, bottom trawl information is being combined and uh, hopefully modeled into a way of analyzing and uh, making better predictions for Baffin Bay ecosystems and fisheries for the future. So I think that um, perhaps getting a group like that on board uh, for uh, for the with the use of CPR information and uh, the uh, the potential to collect more CPR information with other vessels of opportunity is one way that this Arctic program might uh, keep going. Yeah, and I think and during your talk you just mentioned just the robust nature of the the CPR as well, which I I, I think certainly helps in some of the challenging environments that that you're you're dealing with. I mean, Anthony, you must have had a, a kind of a very different set of challenges because, you know, traditionally the CPR was set up for use in much more temperate uh, sort of cooler regimes. And you're sort of working in a largely a tropical environment with much smaller uh, species uh, there. I mean, what did, did you, you sort of face any initial challenges there? Yeah, thanks, Willie. I thought you were throwing to me first when you said the shortest one goes first. <laughs> but you meant duration of the survey, so that's, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Um, yeah, so reasonably different. We were fortuitous here because the Integrated Marine Observing System was spinning up. And so I think the funding came because the marine community got together. So that's a goose program. So does physics, chemistry, biology and the, the physical oceanography gets more of the money than the chemistry or the biology, like most of those sort of programs. So um, I think we've all worked together really well to make sure that this program, which is about 20 million Australian dollars per year, is funded. And so we get a small part of that. And I think the other thing that's happened is that um, we've been able, because we're based at CSIRO, the survey's there, and it's our national science provider, we've been able to integrate with projects in terms of um, doing ecosystem assessments or model assessments, and that's been very important in Australia. Um, in, you know, to answer your question too, that, you know, we do have, you know, our waters are more tropical than most of the CPR surveys. So what does that mean? It sort of means there's lots of small stuff and there's lots of species. So I remember, you know, comparing with when I was counting it um, and not very well, when I was at the North Atlantic survey, you know, there was, you know, we just used to say some of these small species like Clausocalanus, Clausocalanus spur. And that's probably not too bad because they weren't that important, maybe a few percent um, of the sample and there's only a couple of species but you know you go come to Australian waters and there's 15 species of Clausa calanus and there's probably I don't know 15 or 20 percent of the abundance of the capipods of Clausa calanus so you really do have to if you're interested in species like's been mentioned before then you and the taxonomy you really do need to identify them as species so I think that's been a strength so most surveys, well, most plankton surveys, I suppose, just because of ease, not the CPR ones, but identify thing plankton to a fairly coarse scale. And I think we've been able to develop indices of, um, yeah, of, of climate change, for instance, because we identify species. And the other thing is even for, you know, metrics like we're using in models, we need to separate copepods into omnivores and carnivores. You can only do that if you speciate things. If you just say it's a calanoid or a cyclopod or a copepod, it doesn't give you that information. So even 
though modelers don't always use species, you quite often need functional traits which which are related to species. Yeah, I mean, there's a, I mean, Sonia, I mean, the, I mean, one of the things that you demonstrated in your talk was just, uh, you know, just the utility of the DTR survey in terms of the linkages throughout, and and, and I mean, all all of you actually showed that really well, but actually taking specific uh, topics to really demonstrate the importance of plankton in a, a, a sort of wider ecosystem approach, and that I think it's been really successful with that, but particularly in the Pacific, I would say. Yeah, I mean, whenever I've been asked that kind of, or meant, that comment's been mentioned before, I've always said, as soon as you put a CPR in the water, you're going to get something interesting to talk about. You know, you don't really need to worry about finding something that's publishable because, uh, you know, a lot of these places, we just don't collect plankton information on those scales or frequently enough. So um, there's no there's no doubt that you'll find uh, things worth publishing as soon as you start using a CPR somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And so I guess, I mean, Maya, do we have any other questions in there? I'm um, the we do have a couple, yeah, and we should wrap for lunch soon. I'm sure people's stomachs yeah. are grumbling. Um, so Chuck, you had your hand up. Is there something you wanted to add there? Yeah, I think uh, I, I I wanted to just provide a little bit different perspective on this. And, and the other talks emphasize sort of starting up new CPR surveys. And I, I have a different perspective because I came in with a with a survey and started analyzing a survey that had already been going on for 40 years. Uh, and I remember when I first arrived at Cornell in the late 1980s, uh, there was a meeting there to discuss whether the US's National Science Foundation should continue supporting the CPR. And I was very much into ocean observing technology back in those days, doing acoustics. And I was like, why would we use this, uh, you know, 50 year old technology when we have all of these great new, we have video plankton recorders starting to appear. And, you know, I've just had this 180 degree turn in my thinking about this uh, during my career and recognizing just how valuable the CPR is because of the, the uh, especially when we have long time series, because uh, yes, uh, like Sonia said, when you, start getting data from a new place in the world, you know, you have something to report. But in places where, uh, where we've been collecting samples for a long time, uh, often there aren't these tremendously long time series. So from our perspective, the struggle is how do you keep them funded? How do you uh, have uh, agencies that are willing to support them in the long term? So, you know, NOAA got cutbacks and decided to drop the Gulf of Maine survey um, in, you know, in the in the early 2000 decade of the 2010s. And that was when all of the marine heat waves hit where everything happened. And we basically, you know, uh, were blind at the time. And, and it was only after the right whales started getting killed in the Gulf of St. Lawrence that all of a sudden, um, you know, I had some ammunition to go back and get funding to count these samples that were sitting on the shelves and to try to get the, um, the CPR line uh, funded again so that it could start up uh, because they actually not only stopped processing the samples um, back in, in 2011, but they, uh, in 2017, they actually discontinued uh, you know, collecting the samples. But now we've got that reinstated, but. It was a huge amount of work. I went to the NSF to try to get those samples counted. They said no. I went to NOAA. They said no. And I had to go find a private organization to fund us to get those samples counted. And, you know, this is not the way the world should be working. People have to value um, these tremendous long-term data sets because, you know, especially in a time of, of climate change, these are some of the most valuable oceanographic data out there. And that, that's that, that's probably a, a great way to just end the session. Really, there's uh, uh, some fabulous points there, and it's uh, certainly the, the directors of surveys just spend their time almost banging their head against the brick wall. Although it's in, in some some respects it's starting to get easier because 
certainly national governments are recognising the importance of these uh, long-term time series and the, the value that they produce, but uh, it, it, it's still it's still always a challenge to, to keep the funding going. Um, so I think we're going to add, Maya, did you, you said there was a couple of other questions? Um, no, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, we just have got another couple of um, things to mention, if I could. Okay. Um, so we have a break coming up for 30 minutes. I won't say what time it is, 5 a.m., 6 a.m. for some of you. Um, so a 30 minute lunch break. Um, and during the break, we're going to play a video, which is a video by Soundview Media based here in Devon in the UK. And they've been working us on a really exciting project, which is bringing plankton to, a, to uh, an immersive experience through 3D headsets. So you'll be able to have a look at that through the lunch break. That'll be on a sort of a rolling slide through that 30 minute break. And I also just wanted to share this with you. I hope I can with my background screen on. This is a rather lovely um, uh, stone that was left with us at CPR um, survey unit here in Plymouth with people who just wanted to celebrate our CPR 90. So a lovely bit of artwork, with lots of great plankton on from Seascape Ecology. So lots of wonderful bit birthday messages coming in, some of which you can see the videos of on our uh, Twitter account, the MBA UK. Um, so we hope you have a lovely lunch. Enjoy the video with Soundview Media. We've got a great afternoon of more speakers. It's been a fantastic morning already. This afternoon, the themes are impact and application and the future of CPR. Um, Willie, have you got any final comments before we wrap up for lunch? Just to say thank you very much to uh, the, the, the fabulous um, sort of morning, evening, uh, at really early morning of uh, speakers. That's, uh, I think we're, a, a good sign is that uh, we, I think we've uh, hardly lost any uh, participants so far. So we're, we're keeping everybody engaged. So that's excellent. But thank you, and uh, particularly for the unsociable hours that uh, many of you are here at. And uh, look forward to the, the session later on. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. So that's 30 minutes. We'll join you back at 2 p.m. UK time. Hello and thank you for inviting me to talk at this fantastic celebration of your collective achievement. What an amazing story. And it's the storytelling of the Continuous Plankton Recorder Survey that I'm here to talk to you about today and to formally launch our brand new VR experience. But first, a little bit about myself. I'm Gareth Allen, the Managing Director of Soundview Media, a content production company based in Plymouth. We connect audiences with compelling stories on screen and over the past seven years, we have been doing that in immersive spaces and more specifically in VR headsets, just like this one. Most of our immersive content is created using 360 cameras. For example, we recently created a VR film for wheelchair users to experience what it's like to be at the helm of a fully accessible power boat as a way of encouraging them to get on board for real. Once we'd filmed and produced the VR, we were then able to share that virtual experience with our audiences. Some told us that they really got the sense of what it was like to be driving the boat. To tell the CPR story, we wanted to combine live action video with a virtual undersea environment so the viewer could get close up to the plankton and within the headset actually pick up a virtual copepod and examine it whilst discovering what happens to the plankton populations as water temperatures change. For us, this was a new and exciting and interactive way of communicating not only the importance of the survey, but the effects climate change is having on our ecosystems. With the help of the Marine Biological Association, the Marine Business Technology Centre and I Mayflower, we were able to achieve this. Thanks so much to Rowena Stern, Emily Deary, the MBA Sepia crew and the team at MBA for your assistance in the production. So what's next? Well, last week we were able to show an audience a sneak preview of the content at Plymouth's brand new multi-million pound immersive dome at the Market Hall. The immersive dome is Europe's largest 360 cinema. 
Next, we hope that school groups too will be able to come to this dome and other spaces like it. For example, Plymouth University's Immersive Vision Theatre to learn and explore and discover. What a fantastic opportunity this will be to tell the story of the CPR survey to a young and diverse audience, to inspire future scientists to follow in the footsteps of the amazing work the MBA has been doing for the past 90 years. Thank you and congratulations.
Hello and thank you for inviting me to talk at this fantastic celebration of your collective achievement. What an amazing story. And it's the storytelling of the Continuous Plankton Recorder Survey that I'm here to talk to you about today and to formally launch our brand new VR experience. But first, a little bit about myself. I'm Gareth Allen, the Managing Director of Soundview Media, a content production company based in Plymouth. We connect audiences with compelling stories on screen and over the past seven years we have been doing that in immersive spaces and more specifically in VR headsets just like this one. Most of our immersive content is created using 360 cameras. For example, we recently created a VR film for wheelchair users to experience what it's like to be at the helm of a fully accessible um, power boat like as a way of encouraging them to get on board for real. Once we'd filmed and produced the VR, we were then able to share that virtual experience with our audiences. Some told us that they really got the sense of what it was like to be driving the boat. To tell the CPR story, we wanted to combine live action video with a virtual undersea environment so the viewer could get close up to the plankton and within the headset actually pick up a virtual copepod and examine it whilst discovering what happens to the plankton populations as water temperatures change. For us, this was a new and exciting and interactive way of communicating not only the importance of the survey, but the effects climate change is having on our ecosystems. With the help of the Marine Biological Association, the Marine Business Technology Centre and I Mayflower, we were able to achieve this. Thanks so much to Rowena Stern, Emily Deary, the MBA Sepia crew and the team at MBA for your assistance in the production. So what's next? Well, last week we were able to show an audience a sneak preview of the content at Plymouth's brand new multi-million pound immersive dome at the Market Hall. The immersive dome is Europe's largest 360 cinema. Next, we hope that school groups too will be able to come to this dome and other spaces like it. For example, Plymouth University's Immersive Vision Theatre to learn and explore and discover. What a fantastic opportunity this will be to tell the story of the CPR survey to a young and diverse audience, to inspire future scientists to follow in the footsteps of the amazing work the MBA has been doing for the past 90 years. Thank you and congratulations.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope you've had a lovely lunch, breakfast, brunch, dinner, sleep, depending on where you are in the time zones around the world. Um, great to have you back this afternoon. Really successful morning this morning. Hope you've really enjoyed it. Um, so we will be starting very shortly. Um, so hopefully you are all ready to go again for the next theme, which is on the topic of impact applications. And this afternoon, we are very um, delighted to be able to welcome Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor Richard Thompson, um, who's going to be our chair. So Richard, are you there? And can you please switch on your camera and microphone? Hello, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm certainly here. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you, Richard. Brilliant. Yeah, so I shall hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much and welcome. I say, I hope everybody's had uh, an enjoyable lunch. I want to move on. We've got four talks uh, in this session this afternoon about impact and application uh, work. And the first talk is going to be given by um, Associate Professor Abigail McQuarters Gallup from the University of Plymouth. So, Abby, if I might hand over to you to the next uh, 15 minutes, and I'll, uh, well, I'll certainly give you a warning if it looks like you're running over time. Um, I sent in a video. Aren't, you, aren't they going to play the video? Yeah, we can play that okay. video for you, Abby. Yeah, no problem <laughs> okay. at all. That's just about to start now. Great. And um, just you. just to add before you start uh, that video, if I could, Jack, sorry, apologies. It's just to mention also that the video that was played during the lunch by Soundview Media will be available in the chat function here as a link. And it's also going to be on our social media channel, the MBA UK. So sorry to interrupt the start of that presentation. Jack, if you could take that away. Thank you. Hi, I'm Abigail, and I'm an Associate Professor of Marine Conservation at the University of Plymouth. Uh, today, I want to talk about why we need the CPR as a key tool for delivering policy. So if, if we haven't met yet, um, I did my PhD with CPR data, and then I worked at Sophos for six years. And now I work on getting science used in policymaking um, with a focus on plankton science, and, uh, and that often involves CPR data. So as we all know, humans are impacting marine ecosystems. And I love this figure by Ben Halpern because it shows the extent of our impact on the marine environment. So right away, we can see pretty much every marine ecosystem in the world has been impacted by humans. And in 2019, ITBES declared a biodiversity emergency. And the report was pretty shocking and pretty upsetting. So they found 25% of species globally are at risk of extinction. And that extends to the marine environment. 33% of reef corals are at risk of extinction, 31% of sharks and rays, 25% of mammals, some of which are marine, 14% of birds, some of which are marine. And they found that natural ecosystems have declined by about 47% on average relative to baseline data. Shocking stuff. And it was picked up by the media. So the Guardian said that human society is under urgent threat from the loss of Earth's natural life. And of course, it hasn't gotten better in the last couple of years because now we're in the middle of the COVID pandemic nightmare and we're realizing that that's connected to biodiversity and that if we don't stop destroying biodiversity, we could have more pandemics like COVID or worse. So humans need marine biodiversity and because it delivers ecosystem services that we depend on, like the food that we eat, coastal um, coastal protection, the air that we breathe, recreational opportunities, jobs. And it's this link to humans that is what is of interest to policymakers. But there's good news. So international agreements are increasingly recognizing the importance of marine biodiversity. So the UN Sustainable Development Goals, out of their 17 goals, number 14, Life Below Water, is all about the marine environment. In the middle, we've got the Convention on Biological Diversity Aichi targets, so 20 targets about biodiversity, and that includes marine. And then on the right, we've got the UK Marine Strategy and the EU Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, and the goal of both of those pieces of policy is to achieve good environmental status of our marine environment. Um, and descriptor number one in the top left corner is called biological diversity. So biodiversity, um, is recognized by policy as being really important to humans. So the other good news is that there's lots of great science going on around marine biodiversity and good policy decisions are based on good science like this. So what I'm interested in is making sure that this science gets turned from just information 
into knowledge that we can use as evidence to policy for policy making. And the CPR data plays a key role in this process. So here's a, a map of the UK's integrated plankton monitoring program. And it might be hard to read if you're on your phone or your laptop, um, but on the right, we've got all the different time series in the UK and how long they are. And if they monitor phytoplankton, zooplankton, or both phytoplankton and zooplankton. And then on the left, we've got a map of where they're all located. So you can see lots of fixed point stations, mostly close to shore. And then we've got the CPR tracks. And we only showed one year of CPR data here, so we didn't overwhelm the map with CPR data. But CPR data are really central to the UK's integrated plankton monitoring program. You can easily see that CPR data is pretty much our only um, offshore consistent data set. And also the CPR time series is the longest time series of plankton that we've got. And it's one of the few time series to monitor both phyto and zooplankton. So the CPR is really important to our UK plankton monitoring program. And together, we need to figure out how to use all of these different data sets that have different methods and different lengths of time series together to provide the most robust evidence for policy that we can provide. So we've taken an indicator approach to doing that in the UK that have, has now been expanded to OSPAR, so to the wider Northeast Atlantic. Um, where we look at different levels of taxonomic specific specificity to come up with indicators. And, oops, sorry. And CPR data um, is perfect for this approach. So when we're thinking about bulk indicators, we can use the phytoplankton color index. When we're thinking about community composition indicators like diversity indices, we can use taxonomic abundance data. And if we're thinking about functional group indicators or changes in ecosystem functioning, we can use a functional group approach where we aggregate taxonomic data by life form. And it's this middle approach, the life form approach I wanna focus on today. So we've been able to develop and apply this life form approach to biodiversity assessment at the Northeast Atlantic level for policy using the CPR data in combination with the complementary data sets that I've mentioned before from the UK and now from other countries. So, in order to get life forms, we look at different species, um, biological traits, and then group them into kind of like functional groups that we call life forms. So this graph on the left, again, I know you probably can't read it, but I just want you to get like the general vibe, um, shows meroplankton life forms on the left and hollow plankton life forms on the right from different time series. So you can quickly see the CPR time series is really long, but all of these time series show kind of some kind of variability. Um, and they're all spatially distinct, so they're complementary geographically. And then when we map these time series, um, this is where we really get some interesting information. So we can see CPR data here on the grid and then PML and Marine Scotland Science. So these are the time series that monitor meroplankton. And we've seen changes in meroplankton across all these data sets. And we found that these changes are correlated to increased sea surface temperature. And this is really useful information for policy because they need to know why are these changes happening and what are the societal consequences of changes. So in this meroplankton example, does that affect food webs? Could that affect fish? Could that affect fishing? Could that affect fisheries? Could it affect commercial markets for consumers for fish? So policymakers need this information to help us manage changes in the marine environment and help us prepare for changes in the marine environment. So in the OSPAR context, or the EU context, we have the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, or MSFD, um, whose goal is to achieve good environmental status in the marine environment. And we use this life form approach to assess progress towards that goal throughout the Northeast Atlantic. So this process um, was really innovative. We didn't scientists didn't just arrive and give policymakers an indicator and say here use this indicator instead we work to develop further the life form approach so that it was scientifically robust had papers published had the consensus of the european scientific community but also um, will achieve policy goals so in this case and can we use it to report towards progress towards a good environmental status in the marine strategy framework directive 
So we used all different data sets together, the CPR data, but also UK data sets. Now we've got more European data sets that we're working to add in as part of a new project. But I want to highlight here that the CPR is the only EU-wide plankton data set available that we could use that exists for this type of assessment. Um, there's lots of single point station data sets and some that have a couple of station, but the CPR is really EU wide and can help tie those data sets together and really help us understand the changes that we're observing. So this is the kind of OSPAR European policy product, but we have something similar in the UK. So this UK version went to ministers, you don't have to read it, um, but I do kind of want you to notice how many circles are amber, how many are red and how many are green. Um, and those circles, those colors tell us about our progress towards good environmental status. Uh, in the UK, we got an amber for pelagic habitats and said good environmental status is partially achieved for the plankton. Um, but climate change is really driving plankton change in many instances, and, and we don't know if good environmental status has been achieved. So another kind of policy product I want to point out is the post note. So this is from the, the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. And they're just short four page informations on uh, information briefings on hot topics or upcoming topics for MPs to read and for ministers to read. And CPR data has been um, used in several of these. So I contributed to this one on fisheries management, another one on biodiversity, another on marine, man marine monitoring for policy. Um, and they've all used CPR research. And this means MPs and ministers are being exposed to the research that, we've, that we're doing here um, with CPR data. So I think you've kind of gotten the idea that you just, data doesn't just like appear in policy, but we have to go through a process of using that data to do good science, connecting that science to policy relevance, and then communicating it um, in the right language and the right format um, to the right policy audiences. So here in the middle is an example of some of our policy audiences for CPR data recently. So the UK Parliament, DEFRA, the European Commission, ICES, gov.uk, OSPAR Commission, there's probably loads more we could put in there. And then on the right are some examples of what this looks like. Um, so I've just pulled out a few. So we've got ICES, um, working group reports, the IPCC um, climate change assessments use CPR data, which is amazing. RSVP state of nature, charting progress to which was our first ever assessment towards good environmental status about 15 years ago. Um, and again, I could fill this up with MSIP with lots of other examples of where CPR data has been used to inform policy. But it's this kind of process that I think we can be very proud of with CPR data. So connecting the data to the science to the policy application. So I thought I'd give a slide about kind of the factors behind the policy success of the CPR. So first of all, we have to start with the data. The data are amazing. There's no time series like this in marine biodiversity, um, not only the spatial extent, but also the temporal extent. Um, and, and these features of the data help us separate different signals like climate change or natural variability or anthropogenic pressures, which are really important to policy because it helps them focus their effort on management. And it means that CPR data perfectly complements lots of other data sets that are out there, our traditional net samples um, and all different other kinds of plankton sampling. The CPR has also a group of passionate advocates. So um, I'm definitely an example of that. Uh, I was recently seconded into DEFRA for two days a week. Everybody there knows how much I love the CPR, how important it is to policy. And there's examples of, of people that are advocates for the CPR all over the world. And it keeps the CPR profile raised um, and it connects CP the CPR science to policy. Again, CPR science have this, scientists have this great spirit of collaboration um, where CPR research collab researchers collaborate with people all over the world at all kinds of institutes and all kinds of um, universities and organizations. Um, and this drives CPR science forward in a way um, that we can connect it to policy needs that are, that are current or upcoming. Um, and then the CPR maintains an influential position in policy. So the CPR uh, has a, a key kind of leadership role in NMBAC, which is about um, quality assuring monitoring data in the UK. And then also the CPR um, 
team members are part of the UK and OSPAR pelagic habitats groups, um, which are kind of the link between plankton science and policy in the UK and OSPAR. Um, and, and I lead both of these groups as a friend of the CPR. So here's some photos when we are allowed to meet in person instead of on Zoom. So the future outlook, I thought I'd do a gratuitous slide about like where I would like to see the CPR going in policy. And I could do 10 slides, but I tried to just summarize in two points. Um, I think we should make some global CPR indicators for policy. And I think the life form uh, approach could en enable us to do that. I really like this paper that just came out by Campbell et al, where he looked at across all the GACS data sets at copepods. I think we could do something similar with the life form approach and maybe work towards a global assessment um, where we link really explicitly the CPR data and science to global EU UK policy drivers. Um, and this would be targeted at policymakers. And I've talked to CPR um, team members and, and we talk about this all the time. And I think we'll probably start to work on it soon. Um, and it could be like an invigorated ecological status report that we used to have every year uh, with the CPR data. And it could be very policy targeted. We could give it out at DEFRA, at ICES, at the European Commission um, internationally to show how key the CPR data and CPR research are in delivering policy at multiple political scales. Um, so I'm going to stop with my favorite quote ever from a scientific paper. I wish I'd written it. And this is from Coslo and Couture in Nature 2013. And they said, ecological time series are the Cinderella's of ocean science, long neglected drudges eking out their existence at the edge of what is in fashion. They now find themselves in favor at the climate change ball. The CPR is a perfect example of that. It hasn't always been easy to keep the survey going, but we wouldn't have the knowledge about marine biodiversity change and climate change in the marine ecosystem that we have now without the CPR survey. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, and thank you to all the past and present CPR team members, the analysts, the ship's crews, researchers, workshop staff, IT admin, um, probably people that I've forgotten, I'm sorry. And then all the CPR collaborator, collaborators globally that work to get CPR data used and progress the science so that we can use it in decision making. So thank you so much. Well, thanks, Abby. That was absolutely fantastic as ever. And I, I really loved your quote at the end, how true that is for getting funding for continuous time series data. We see it so many times. It was lovely to end with that quote. So next we'll go to um, another uh, old connection of mine, Dr. Tom Doyle. And um, it's really nice being a chair that with everything pre-recorded, I don't even have to worry about your timekeeping. So over to you, Tom. Thank you, Thank you Richard. Uh, good to see you. Um, I just share my my, my um, presentation. Okay, um, so thanks thanks Richard for the for the warm welcome and uh, and and thank you to the the organisers of the CPR ninety um, conference. It's an absolute um, pleasure um, to be invited to talk here today. Um, I'm a huge fan of the CPR and everything that it's done. I was lucky enough to spend a week um, in Plymouth um, maybe 15 years ago now, but um, I still think of it as fond memories. But so today I'm here talking about um, the application of, of the CPR and how it's provided insights on the ocean and sunfish. Oops, slides. Oh, there we go. So why talk about some fish uh, for the CPR 90 conference? Because I, I guess most of you are probably thinking that the CPR um, sampling device probably isn't the best device for sampling the largest fish in the world uh, in terms of its aperture. But maybe some of the, the some of you might point out that perhaps the, the larvae of ocean sunfish may be occasionally uh, picked up by CPR devices that sample down perhaps off the sargassum or somewhere like that. But why, why talk about uh, sunfish? Well, they represent one of the most ecologically and functionally distinct fish taxa in our seas. So they're the largest bony fish. Um, morphologically, they're very unusual. So they're just a large swimming head. Then they're laterally compressed. They're very unusual physiological traits. They're extremely fast growers in terms of uh, fecundity. They've got one of the highest fecundities in terms of fishes. Over 300 million eggs can be released by a female. So really distinct fish and then from an ecological perspective to feed on jellyfish and that's where my interest comes in on them and, and that's where the link is with the CPR but unfortunately for such a large fish 
And for such an important fish, we've We've almost no historical abundance data, so it's very difficult um, to say anything about what's happening. But thankfully, there's been some recent aerial surveys that have suggested um, that they're extremely abundant. One paper by Gremi et al., um, I've shown a figure here, has found um, particularly high abundance in the Bay of Biscay and in the entrance to the English Channel, where you can have something like uh, 475 sunfish per 100 kilometers squared. So really high abundances. And this uh, was also supported by a study that was carried off Ireland that found similar uh, abundances as well off the south coast. And this led one study to suggest that sunfish, which are known predators of jellyfish, have benefited from an increase in jellyfish. And then the authors went one further to suggest that ocean sunfish could actually, actually offer clues or be an indicator to the rise of slime. So what do we mean by that? Well, essentially, um, through overfishing and warming seas, uh, we've seen a depletion of fisheries, and then we've seen an increase in jellyfish. And as a result, sunfish, sunfish are benefiting from this, and we're seeing the, this large increase in sunfish. And I just... To, to come back to that, so that rise of slime, so what does that actually mean? And I, I'm going to go back to this old figure. This is a figure from the Sea Around Us project, for, and it was uh, by Daniel Pauly's group, and where they talked about uh, fishing down marine food webs. Well, the, the rise of slime uh, links pretty much in with this concept that, you know, historically, we've disproportionately overfished the large and long-lived fish species. So through time, we see smaller and smaller fish species um, dominating our fish catches. And at the end of this time series or, or, or of, of this uh, figure, what you can see is that we'll have, a, have our oceans where it's, it's filled with smaller pelagic species and dominated by jellyfish. And what happens then, or what can happen then, is that when you have oceans dominated by jellyfish, they can lead to kind of irreversible trophic cascades where it's very hard for fish populations to increase because there's so many jellyfish about. So is this happen? Well, without any historical data fish on, on sunfish, it's kind of difficult to examine this hypothesis of, of sunfish and benefiting from the rise of slime. So we're kind of left uncertain actually what's happening here in, in terms of sunfish. So to answer this question, we need two things. We need an index of social abundance. And thankfully, we were able to find one. And uh, not an easy thing to find, but thankfully, it was on my doorstep all along. But this is um, uh, Cape Clear, which is just located off the south coast of Ireland, the most southern tip. But since the 1970s, um, bird observers have been carrying out effort-based sea watches for seabird migrations. And so this happens from April on through, uh, through to October. And typically they're looking for seabirds like these shearwaters just flying by and they count them, but they also see um, cetaceans. But thankfully for, for, for what we're doing, they also pick up on sunfish. And this is a picture of a sunfish uh, basking at the surface. And you've got a whole lot of interesting fulmers that come over and they pick off uh, some of the sunfish parasites. But this has been going on uh, since the 70s, but what's important is the record watch duration, the number of observers, sea state, wind direction, et cetera. So now we have been able to develop, we've been able to extract all the sunfish sightings and all this effort uh, information to, into a sunfish abundance index. But the second thing we need, and that's why I guess I've been invited to talk here today, is that we need a jellyfish time series. And anyone who knows anything about jellyfish, there's a, there, there's a lack of jellyfish time series. They're really difficult um, uh, to get because jellyfish have been neglected and uh, generally not considered important in marine food webs. But we know that's different now, and so they are being monitored. But to get a comparable time series of jellyfish to compare or correlate with the ocean sunfish index, um, we needed to look to the CPR because it's the only place that has something of that uh, of that of that length. Um, so. But what does they actually CPR sample in terms of jellyfish? And that is something that is, um, there's some debate about. And um, we wrote a paper in, in 2010 where we did actually look at um, what the CPR samples in terms of jellyfish. And, and this is an image, the image in the middle here is part of the mesh. And you can see there's some kind of material that's caught in the mesh that is actually par uh, part of a, a Pelagian octoluca jellyfish. And if you look to the image on the, to the next of that, what it actually shows is when you zoom in, you can actually see some nematocysts. And so this then will be categorized by the analyst as a uh, solenteric tissue. Okay, and, th and that's one way how, how jellyfish are recorded by the CPR sampling, uh, 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 sampler. But what we're looking for is siphonophores because we know sunfish feed on siphonophores. And what's really wonderful about the CPR data set is that 
if an analyst, an analyst um, detects one of these swimming bells, so the image here on the right, this is what we call a calicophoron siphonophore. Essentially, it's a little swimming bell. It's only maybe eight or 10 millimeters in size. But if, if that's detected on a CPR, it's recorded as a siphonophore, nectophore, or swimming bell. So what's brilliant here is we now have 50-year time series of jellyfish abundance or siphonophore abundance. And we know some fish feed on them. They don't quite feed on these calicophoron siphonophores because they're so small, but they do feed on related um, siphonophores. So this is the best um, index that we can actually get in terms of to link these two together. Um, we also needed some environmental variables, so we collected some sea surface data from NOAA, and then also we looked at the phytoplankton data from the CPR. And then um, in terms of the analysis, I'm not going to get into that too much here in terms of the time, but we use a G G GLM with a hurdle to deal with imperfect detectability. Essentially, um, we've lots of sunfish are really difficult to detect, and we don't get, get many of them, and we've lots of zeros um, to model as well. So what did we find? Well, first of all, we, we developed the first long-term index of ocean sunfish abundance. And if you look at this main figure here, actually what it shows, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but in the, the large gray bars in the background is the effort over time. So in the 1970s, you can see we're doing over 200 um, hours of sea watching um, uh, per annum. But what you can see that through, through time, this has been relatively consistent, except in the, the, the late 80s, there was actually a, a decrease and then more recently, um, after 2011, or 2011, the actual observatory closed for several years. So uh, this has been talked about today in terms of maintaining the CPR. The same thing happens with this coastal observatory as well. So there's been difficulties maintaining this, but thankfully we have um, um, uh, um, over 50 years now of data to look at. But the important thing to look at here is the blue dots. But what you see, I'll just add a trend line on top of that. But what we can see is that Sunfish were generally absent, so we maybe had two sunfish sighted in 1970, you have one in, in 1981, but before 1989 there's very little, there's very few sunfish actually sighted off, uh, off the south coast of Ireland. But then we get a mean of six sunfish in the, uh, sighted up until the year 2000, but after that we see a marked increase where we get on average 20 or 20 plus uh, sunfish uh, per annum. And thereafter, we returned to kind of 1989, 2000 levels. And unfortunately, from 2000 onwards, we're left uncertain because the observatory was actually closed. It has started up again now, but with much reduced effort. So it's kind of um, made things a bit more difficult to say what's happening. So what do we find? Well, in terms of this is the model output. And if you look at this figure, essentially the positive values on top means that there's a higher probability of detecting a sunfish in that year. So essentially what we're showing is that there was a much higher probability of detecting sunfish in the 90s and especially in the 2000s than at any other time period in the observatory. So early on, you're just very not unlikely to see sunfish. And then more recently, we're not quite sure because the time series or the observatory has closed and broken down somewhat. In terms of sea surface temperature, in terms of trying to link what's happening with these sunfish, there was the, sea, the position of the 13 degree isotherm was significantly correlated with the probability of taking the sunfish. This is best visualized here, or visual, visualized here graphically, where you can see here's Ireland, and we've got we've got the CPR down here in Plymouth. But if you look at this, this is the position of the, the 13 degree Celsius isotherm in the 60s and 70s. So it's lo lo located uh, over 200 kilometers south of Ireland. But what you can see is that um, in 90, late 1990 and the 2000s, this dramatically shifts north. And this, this kind of um, coincides with when we do see the increase in sunfish sightings. Well, what about the abundance of siphonophores? Because this is this is this is something that we wanted to link back to the rise of slime. You know, is there evidence that jellyfish are driving an increase in sunfish? So what we see was that from the CPR, so this is the presence or, or this is the detection of these calicophoron siphonophores from the CPR. What we can see that is in the late 90s, um, or there's, there's pretty much an absence of them, but it, we see uh, an increase in the, the 90s, and especially after 2000, we see a dramatic increase. The abundance was positive but did not uh, show a, a, any significant correlation with the probability of detecting um, a sunfish sighting. 
So what does this mean, trying to bring it all together? Well, what we think is this is evidence of a range expansion for sunfish. And what, how, why do we say that? Well, sunfish are a highly migratory species, so they generally track the sea surface temperature. Kind of, and so they like to stay within a band of maybe 13 to 20 degrees Celsius. So they kind of move with as the water temperature increases. So, they're, so that's one. And the fact that we found that there was a significant correlation with the 13, position of the 30 degree is, isotherm supports, supports that. But, and what many of you guys will probably know from working in, 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 uh, in, in, C, in CPR is that there was well-known uh, climate-induced ecosystem change across the, occurred across the Northeast Atlantic in the 1990s. And so we see, uh, you know, in terms of the plankton, and I'm not going to, you know, in terms of the Gorgon studies, we can see lots of uh, plankton species moving north. But here we're, we're suggesting that sunfish are also responding to these changes that happened in the 90s. But also we see lots of uh, responses in fish, but also seabirds. Mm -hmm. But importantly, in terms of much farther north, if we go up to Iceland, Iceland and Norwegian, we see that there was a, a, an increase in the occurrence of sunfish that occurred later further north. So we see an increase in some fish earlier in, in Irish and perhaps in UK waters too, but then it's, it's we see maybe 10 years later, we see an increase further north again, suggesting that they're further increasing their range. Um, but what about the role of siphonophores? What, what do they play in this? Well, we know some fish are important predators of siphonophores, so you might expect an increase will be significantly correlated. But what, what we find is that if you look at this graph here on, on the right, some of the highest values for siphonophores also occur when we've almost no sunfish sightings. So this may reflect the broken, broken uh, data in, in the latter years of our time series. Um, but I think an important thing to really point out here is that um, what you can see is that the increase in sunfish uh, sightings indicated by this arrow here um, happened about 10 to 15 years before we see the increase in siphonophores. Okay, so there's something uh, differing ha or different happening here. The sunfish have increased first, and then it's only maybe 10 to 15 years later before we see the same increase in, 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 um, in siphonophores. So in summary, we, we, uh, we just presented the first long-term index of ocean sunfish abundance. We see there's a higher probability of taking sunfish in the 90s and 2000s. The increase in sunfish is likely triggered by an increase in temperature and the broader ecosystem-wide changes. But the significant increase in some fanophores is not correlated with some fish, so not supported of the idea that um, some fish are increasing with the rise of slime. And uh, just thanks for listening, and a just special thanks to all the bird observers, and especially to the taxonomists, uh, our analysts here at, at the CPR, for, for giving us this um, eye into what's happening with some fish. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Tom. That that was that was fantastic as well. It's lovely to see that the. The pictures of the sunfish and particularly the, the early stages, I think I saw something in the chat about how cute they were. Um, so without more ado, I'd like to, because we've got questions and answers at the end, of course, I'd like to move on to Sarah Berth's talk, please. Hello, my name is Sarah Berth, and today I'm going to talk to you about climate change in the North Sea ecosystem and how the continuous plankton recorder survey data have been vital in improving our understanding of this topic. I work for the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. We are a research institute that specialises in environmental science, and we undertake a lot of long-term monitoring, including that of seabird populations in the North Sea. Climate change is well known to be altering the behaviour, abundance, distribution and fitness of species. And one of the most well-documented and conspicuous ways that climate change is altering wild species is in the timing of seasonal events, and this is known as phenology. So this might be, for example, the timing of laying of frog spawn, or the laying of eggs by birds, or spring flowering events. And many spring events have been getting earlier over time in response to climate warming. And this is important because if different parts of a food web are altering the timing of their phenology at a different pace, then this can lead to what is known as trophic mismatch, which is a mismatch between the timing of food availability and the timing of predator demand for that food, and this is illustrated here. So here, for example, if you have some prey, such as caterpillars, which have a clear peak during the year, 
then predators want to match the timing of their peak resource demand, in this case, peak breeding for predators such as great tits, with the availability of their prey. And here, in this example, the great tits are pretty well matched to the timing of their prey. But if great tits don't respond as much to climate warming as their prey do, this can lead to a mismatch, and then they're not overlapping very well with the availability of their prey. A work by Stephen Thackeray at UKCEH, which looked at a whole load of different phenological trends, 25,000 of them across marine, freshwater and terrestrial species, suggested that trophic mismatch might be a problem. And this is because this work showed that phenological shifts were occurring at different rates on average for different parts of the trophic levels. So, for example, secondary consumers seem to be responding at a slower pace of change compared to primary producers and primary consumers. And when this was projected using UK climate projections under different emission scenarios, it suggested that primary consumers might be having the greatest response to climate because they had a higher sensitivity. However, we know a lot less about marine ecosystems and phenological change compared to terrestrial ones. And this is despite the fact that marine ecosystems are predicted to have a more rapid pace of climate warming compared to terrestrial ecosystems. So we were interested in looking at the North Sea food chain to see where the phenological change might be occurring and whether there was any evidence of trophic mismatch. So the North Sea is a good candidate for looking at these topics because it's a highly seasonal system with clear plankton pulses occurring throughout the year. It's also known to have undertaken um, rapid sea temperature rises, and there's overwhelming evidence that global warming is hitting various parts of the seabed populations and also the ecosystem. And within this ecosystem, sand eels are key species during the breeding season for many of the seabirds. But the problem is that we often lack good fish data on timing and phenology. And seabirds, which are the top predators in this system, are really useful indicators because they tend to be quite sensitive to changes occurring lower down in the trophic levels. And they're also relatively easy to monitor during the breeding season. So we used over 26 years of phenology data from a different variety of sources. So we're indebted to the continuous plankton recorder survey data, which gave us monthly mean abundance data over an area um, surrounding our focal seabird colony for phytoplankton species and also copepod species through the continuous plankton recorder survey trawls across this area. Not only that, but the continuous plankton recorder larval sand eel data was used to model hatch estimates and growth data by combining these data sets with data sets from fish brought in by seabirds. And whilst not as impressive as 90 years of plankton data, Next year will mark the 50th year that UKCEH has been collecting long-term seabird monitoring data on the Isle of May, which is shown here by the Red Star. And we've been collecting median egg date and timing of breeding data since the 1970s. And what's interesting about seabirds is that their breeding has been getting later over time compared to terrestrial birds. So here, if you see Blue bars, it indicates that birds are getting earlier. So from a review by Parmesan, it shows terrestrial birds as the first bar getting earlier and also European shags, although this is not significant. Whereas most of the seabird species that we look at are actually getting later over time. And why might this be? When we looked at phenology data to see whether different trophic levels of the food web were matched in timing to those of lower trophic levels, we know found no evidence of matching phenology. So what this means, for example, is that the timing of copepod predators was not matched to that of diatom prey or sand eels to copepods or seabirds to sand eels. And this is important because it shows evidence that there's no phenological matching happening in the system. But when we thought about this a bit more, we thought it was not that surprising that seabird phenology, i.e. the timing of chick rearing, is not well matched to sandal hatch dates. This is because it's actually prey size, energetic value and quality that are known to be important for seabirds. 
And bigger sand eels have a much higher energetic value than smaller sand eels. So using the CPR data and also the, the seabird data of fish brought back to the breeding colony, we estimated mean hatching dates over time and found that sand eels started off by hatching later over time, but then got earlier. And if you look at growth rates in the last part of the time series, it's clear that growth rates have declined over time. And this is important because the size of sand eels during the seabird breeding season would depend both on hatch dates and also growth rates. So what we did was we considered the date that sand eels were predicted to reach a certain size threshold. And this was chosen because this is a reasonable size of prey that we observe in the seabird diet. And although the bigger the fish, the more energetic value it has to seabirds, this threshold size is an appropriate metric to look at because although seabirds prefer larger prey, they don't want to delay breeding and wait too long for fish to grow because this would reduce the survival prospects of young after fledging. So this metric, this sandal, this date sandals reach 55 millimeters, takes into account both the shift in sandal hatch dates and also this observed decline in growth rates. And when you look at this, it's clear that the date sandals reached a decent size has been getting later over the study period, with a particularly late timing in 2004. And now when we look to see if the timing of peak energy demand in seabirds, i.e. mid-chick rearing, is matched to the timing of sandals reaching this decent size, we see that seabirds are indeed altering the timing of their breeding to match changes in sandal size. So the only one that's not doing this is shags, which is showing, showing no evidence of phenological matching with sandals, and kittiwakes are showing the biggest shift in relationship. However, if seabirds were perfectly matching the change in timing in sandal size, we would expect to see a one-to-one -one relationship in timing, and we don't see this. So what this means is that the rate of change of seabird breeding in timing is not able to keep pace with the ma and match the changes in timing of sandal size in this system. And furthermore, because as I said before, larger fish have a much higher energetic content and are so more valuable and of higher quality to seabirds, what this means is that over the study period, there's been a decline in the predicted size of sandals brought back to the colony. And this is borne out by data that we observe in the birds as well. So from this, we would expect the steepest decline in size to be occurring in shags and also in kittiwakes. And when you translate this into declines in energetic value per average sandal brought back by seabirds, you can see that the declines in energetic value are significant, particularly for shags and kittiwakes. And this makes sense because shags actually have a very variable phenology. They're the seabird that are not appearing to be getting later like the other ones. They don't show a trend in their phenology. And it appears that they're not tracking sandal size in the same way as the other species. And this means because they're effectively breeding too early for sandals to have attained a decent size, they see very big predicted energy declines in their prey. And shags are diving species that are capable of diving um, underneath the water, whereas kittiwakes, which are surface feeders, are shown to have the biggest phenology shift. So these, they seem to be the species that most closely is tracking changes in their prey, but they're seeing very large energetic declines in the sizes and hence energy quality of their prey. But when we examine in more detail, we see that these two species are in fact altering their diet to some extent and becoming dependent on other prey. So here in the plot, the black bars show young sand eels, which are known as O group, so that's young of the year. The red bars show older sand eels, one year and older. The blue bars show clupeids, which are things like sprats, and the white bars show other prey. So what you can see is that shag diet since the mid 2000s has become much more diverse and much less heavily reliant on sand eels. Kittiwake diet has also shown less reliance on sandals and has become more dependent on clupeids. And further investigations into shags, for which we have really good quality individual level data, fail to find a relationship between annual breeding success and either sea surface temperature 
or the proportion of sandals in the diet. And what this suggests is that mismatch is not having fitness consequences for how well these birds produce. So in fact, if you look at the plot at the bottom, you'll see that breeding success in shags as the number of um, chicks fledged per pair has actually increased since the mid 1990s over time. So whilst mismatch may not be impacting shags, and they seem to have been able to shift their diet in response to changing sandhill quality, this may not be the case for other species. And this is something we're hoping to look at in more detail in the future. So to conclude, our work highlights the need to think carefully about the phenological metric that you're examining. And for seabirds, the timing of size in their prey is more important than the timing of hatch. And we showed that sandal size has declined over time due to later hatching initially, but also due to poor growth rates in later years. And although seabirds have been changing their phenology to breed later, the pace of change has not been sufficient to keep pace with the changing timing of sandals reaching a decent size. And what this has meant is it's led to significant declines in the energetic value of prey brought back during the crucially important breeding season when energetic demands for seabirds are very high. And shags, some species of seabird have been able to shift their diet in response. So shags in particular seem to have shown a diversification of their diets and show no obvious impact of mismatch on breeding success. However, for species that are constrained to only feed at the surface, such as kittiwakes, or those that are only able to carry single prey items back to the breeding colony, such as guillemots, may not be quite so adaptable, and further work is needed to understand the fitness consequences of this observed mismatch with key prey. And this work marks a huge collaborative effort with a number of different people and different data sets, particularly with David Johns and the continuous plankton recorder data. And we would like to thank everyone that's contributed and to all our project partners who record phenology data in the UK. Thank you. Well, wow, Sarah, th thank you for an amazing talk. I mean, three talks in out of the four in this session, and, and I just can't help but react by thinking, what a testament to the fantastic resource that we see from the CPR. You know, we've, we've jumped from Abbey and the talk about plankton linking to global policy, to, to, to sunfish, to seabirds. You know, the, the value of this, this time series and data set is, is absolutely phenomenal. So no pressure, Claire, over to you, to Claire Russell for, for the last talk in this uh, series of four before we go over to, to question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you very much for tuning in and sticking around to hear about some of the research that we're doing. My name is Claire Ostel and I'm going to be talking to you about the continuous plankton plastic. The possibilities are endless recorder. Apologies for the title. I um, was on maternity leave and I got a bit carried away, but essentially it's true. The possibilities are endless and um, it's very exciting working with such a brilliant data set. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that none of this research or data would be available um, without the hard work of the analysts, the workshop uh, and operations teams, and the volunteer ship and crew that tow the CPRs for us, and the funders, so thank you very much. Um, just to give you a brief outline, I'm just going to highlight a couple of important things about the methodology of the CPR and, and um, that's needed for, for this talk. Um, I know we've had some brilliant talks already, you know, so hopefully we know what the CPR is and how it works. Um, I'm then going to give you a bit of background into some of the research that was done looking at microplastics from CPR samples, um, and also some of the more recent work looking at macroplastics. So the way I term micro and macro plastics in this talk is anything above five millimeters is a macro larger plastic and everything uh, below five millimeters is a microplastic. And then I'm just going to give you a couple of slides um, on kind of what's next and some of the exciting new stuff that's coming out. So this is a GIF uh, that Rob Camp put together and I just wanted to put it in there to show you that although I'm going to be talking mostly about the North Atlantic CPR survey, we have a number of um, sister surveys all over the world, um, including 
the North Pacific, uh, the Southern Ocean and the Australian CPR survey that we've just had a great talk from Ant about. Um, but essentially, the CPR survey is global and um, through the Global Alliance of CPR surveys, we have this, um, this large reach and coverage. Uh, here at the MBA, we store all of our samples from the North Atlantic and from the North Pacific. So essentially, this is a biological library. Um, it's a temperature controlled room and all of the samples are preserved. Uh, we have over 60 years of samples uh, from the North Atlantic now and up to 20 years up from the Pacific. So this is really important. These are essentially a historical snapshot of what was in the water column at that point in time and space. Um, so this is this is hugely valuable. As you've seen through the fantastic talks that we've had already, um, the CPR is primarily focused at monitoring the plankton, which are hugely important for the ecosystem, uh, for exchange of carbon. And the great thing about having the global coverage and the large coverage that we do in the North Atlantic, um, we're able to track these changes uh, because of the consistent way the data has been collected. So there's been many good examples of, of the kind of uh, key stories that have come out using CPR data. And I've just highlighted one of them here as an example. This was Steph Hinder's paper published in Global Change Biology. And um, she was able to interpolate uh, the data onto these maps representing uh, a cold water species, which is here in blue of copepod called Canis vinmarchicus and a warm water species, so it's a species of copepod called Calanus helgolandicus that's often associated with warmer waters. Um, and she mapped those for each decade going from the 60s up into the 2000s. And what she demonstrated is there's a range contraction of cold water species and this range expansion of warm water species. Um, and she linked this with the warming of the waters. It's been, there's been a number of stories that are similar to this and are very important. Often they're linked to, to changes in uh, the food, so food quality, particularly cold water species are thought to have a higher lipid content, so Calanus finmarchicus, for example. So those changes may have knock-on impacts on their predators, fisheries in the area. Okay, moving on to the microplastics. So um, this photo was taken by David Lichwager. He's a National Geographic photographer. He came to Plymouth about three years ago um, and we went out into Plymouth Sound on the research vessel, the MBA Sepia. Um, and this was just a very quick plankton uh, net that we put over the side of the boat and he picked out these specimens and put them into a drop of water and took a photograph and he was highlighting the impact of microplastics on the oceans. So you can see there's a flake here and a fibre and what looked like starfish and decapod larvae and a krill. And you can tell I'm not a taxonomist. Um, but often people think this is what the CPR samples look like and perhaps what we wished our samples looked like. They're very pretty and they're intact. But just to show you, this is actually what the uh, plankton analysts are looking at on a day to day down a microscope. Um, here's the silk mesh, the weave of the silk. You can see a couple of nice dinoflagellates there. And this is what we would term a microplastic. So we would record this as a red strand in our database. And this work on microplastics and, and now what we record in our database stemmed from um, research done by Richard Thompson and his group who's based at Plymouth University. So um, this was published in 2004 in Science. And what Richard and his group did is they took uh, samples from two transects of the CPR survey in the north um, of the UK and they took subsamples from each decade in the 1960s, 70s, 80s and 90s and they counted the microplastics and ran them through a process called FTIR which is an infrared, infrared method for determining what type of plastic it is. And this was really a seminal paper. It kind of first coined the term microplastics. It pointed out that we might have an issue um, and that they, they are increasing since the 1960s. Um, so there's been many, many different papers and research that have stemmed from this um, and it had a huge impact. Um, something that I've highlighted here is just after the 80s, we didn't see the continued increase that you might expect from the inc increased production of plastics. But I'm going to come back to that when I talk about the macroplastics. 
So since this seminal paper by Richard Thompson, um, the CPR survey started to record the presence and absence of microplastics within our samples. So this map is the North Atlantic, um, where we've got a red dot is where a microplastic was present and where we've got an open circle, there was no microplastic seen in the sample. And then again, since 2016, we've now started to count and actually categorize those microplastics. So these are these black dots. So those are uh, related, the size of the dots related to the counts of microplastic within the sample. And you can see we generally get more in the North Sea where we have lots of CPR trawls. And the kind of take home from this is that we're seeing microplastics everywhere. <clears throat> and this has been in a lot of the rich literature as well. Roughly 20% of all of the CPR samples now have microplastics within them. And uh, just to point out, we always present this data with the caveat that these microplastics that I'm showing you here have not been formally identified and uh, there may be a baseline level of contamination. So we do have some research uh, that was done by a PhD student um, who was able to record the baseline level of contamination. But what we're seeing here is above that level of contamination. So some of the issues that are associated with collecting plank, uh, plastic time series, sorry, are that it's very difficult to get a consistent open ocean time series. And as you know, this is a lot to do with cost. So taking out research vessels is very expensive, but also maintaining a long-term time series uh, is again, very costly. And for larger macroplastics, these are virtually non-existent. We've got some really useful um, volunteer data that's been submitted through schemes. And these are often, as you know, going down to the beach, people reporting on the amount of plastics and what they're finding. Um, but there's very few consistent time series. Another thing to highlight is always contamination. Um, and we're very careful um, at re reporting on that whenever we present our microplastic data. And almost all microplastic data sets do have a, a baseline level of contamination. And it's important to, to think about and remember whenever you're using these samples. The other thing to note is that a lot of the techniques that are used to formally identify what type of plastic they are, are quite expensive. So we're not able to do that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with our CPR samples, which led us on to the next piece of work. Macroplastics, so the large stuff. So these pictures were taken by Jules and I think Lance in the workshop. And essentially we started to get more and more entanglements on the continuous plankton recorder. Um, Often these were things that you'd expect to entangle more, so not a big piece of plastic, hard plastic, but fishing line or net or bags. Um, and something that's brilliant about the CPR survey is that we have these tow logs, these tow sheets, and um, the crew will record the sea state, you know, whether it's cloudy, um, how rough the sea might have been. And they'll also record anything that was uh, pulled off of the CPR or any issues maybe when they were deploying the CPR, um, anything like that. And we often get seaweed, bits of wood, whatever, jammed on the CPR, and those will get recorded as well. So what we were able to do is start to look at this. So as I said, there's very few uh, consistent data sets, and many of them are not showing a trend of increasing plastic that you'd expect to see with the amount of plastic that we've been producing and uh, not managing our waste properly. So the earliest kind of studies looking at plastics were in the 1960s and they found um, in the stomachs of some seabirds and turtles that they were getting plastic pieces. Um, there's some also entanglement case studies, particularly with fur seals. And again, they were able to show a time series, as you can see here, but they were not able to show a significant increase. What we did with our database is we did a word search, essentially. We have all of the comments from the tow logs in the database and we were able to pull out words associated with anthropogenic um, entanglements. So things like the word net, line, rope, bag, monofilament or string. We pulled all of these out of the database and created a macroplastic entanglement data set. And it was really interesting. Um, essentially, uh, we were able to highlight some hotspots of entanglements, which is quite important for many marine mammals and potentially seabirds. Uh, we were able to demonstrate some of the earliest recordings of anthropogenic entanglements. So in 1957, 
the CPR recorder was fouled by trawl twine just up here and we had a entanglement by a plastic bag in 1965. Um, all of this data is published online alongside the paper in Nature Communications. Um, and what crucially we were able to show was this significant increase beyond the 1960s and 90s um, into the 2000s of plastic in the oceans. Um, and just to point out these gray bars here are natural entanglements, so things like seaweed and wood. And this work um, had huge impact. We had a lot of journalists uh, wanting to know what was going on and reporting on the study. Um, it was quite eye-opening for me. Uh, I've worked mostly with the plankton data and with carbon data sets and um, it was it was interesting coming at it from a different angle because I'm not used to working with plastic but the thing that uh, it highlighted to me is that uh, the general public were able to relate to plastics and to be able to feel like they could actually do something about it was important. Um, and it also highlighted the kind of circular route of talking about environmental issues. So um, the fact that we're impacting on our environment through plastics could also um, lead on to the fact that we're impacting on our environment through what we're putting into the atmosphere and the warming that we're seeing uh, more recently. One of the other really neat um, applications of the data was this by Keith McNulty. So I'm just demonstrating it here so that if anyone wants to have a go, they can. But essentially he created a web app using R Shiny, which is a free uh, software available and a blog post in his GitHub repository here. So if anyone wants to go and have a play with the data or just learn how to use R and Git um, or R Shiny to build apps, it's a really useful tool. Um, so have a look at that. There's still many unanswered questions, uh, particularly looking at the transfer through the food web. We've got colleagues at PML who are working on this. Um, also the harmful impacts, you know, the toxicity, whether plastic is leaching uh, any kind of toxin into the environment or into our bodies. We know they're everywhere. We know we're likely consuming them. Um, Andrew Turner at Plymouth University has done some really neat work picking out plastic flakes um, so these are actually paint flakes, which are a type of microplastic, and looking at the toxicity of those. Um, we're also starting to link with models from groups in the Netherlands. Um, and there's some neat work by Lauren Beerman, who's been able to identify plastics from satellite. So we're, we're hoping to, to work alongside some of those groups. What next? Well, um, with the network that the CPR has, uh, the logical um, step has been to start to integrate sensors onto the CPR. And it's a really exciting new area that we're getting into. Uh, we've trialed a number of different CTDs measuring conductivity, temperature, fluorescence. Um, there's been a water sampler that I'm sure Rowena is going to talk about with some of her molecular work, which is really exciting. Um, we've now got a new CO2 sensor that we're going to be trialing and we're hoping to test uh, with a PhD student coming on board. Um, so essentially, if the sensor is not changing the flight or the way that the CPR samples, then we are willing to give it a go. Um, obviously, the CPR is moving rapidly at 20 knots and often gets knocked about on the side of the ship. So we need to make sure those sensors are robust. But if people have sensors that they're wanting to trial, then we are willing to give it a go. Just to quickly summarize, the CPR samples are archived and stored and they are an incredibly useful snapshot in time. Essentially, as methods and technologies develop, uh, people are coming with new ideas of things to look at and they're able to go back through those samples and demonstrate um, important findings. Contamination of these samples always needs con careful consideration, so we're very careful about how we handle the samples and, and when we get them out. Uh, the macroplastics, as I showed, did show the expected increase that people had been expecting to see. As new technologies are emerging, um, we're really excited about using the network of CPRs to expand the data set. And just a final take home message, always write in your logbooks. This is, um, it's key really, as, as everything moves more and more to digital, a lot of information is lost. And we're very good at the CPR and we're very lucky that we work with Dash uh, to archive our data but we still have a lot of our information handwritten and stored, um, and that is crucial. Thank you for listening, and thanks again to many of the funders.
Well, thank you very much, Claire. I mean, a fantastic way to finish those four talks. You know, we've gone from, from policy to sunfish to birds to plastic in the oceans. I mean, what better demonstration of the importance of the CPR, but also, and, and it's a slight frustration to me that the, the you know, back to Abby's talk of the this, this sort of Cinderella effect, the importance of having this long-term monitoring data. And, and in my mind, it takes me to a, a presentation that was given by a, a former director of the NBA, Steve Hawkins, and he would list all of these time series going back to the 1900s and how the only things that had stopped them over a hundred years nearly was two world wars and then a cutting government funding. And I, it, it just nags the question in my mind, how do we make sure we maintain that, 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 that the funding for this really critical work for another 90 years. But anyway, that, let's go to questions because I'm sure there must be questions for, for those four fantastic presenters. Uh, yeah, there certainly are. So we've got some questions here. There's there's a couple for Tom initially, but perhaps all of the speakers that um, spoke in this theme could switch your cameras and microphones on um, and then we can uh, see you in one screen. That would be fantastic. Um, so, Tom, first question for you was a, a quite a nice, simple one, hopefully, um, was just asking about the distribution of the sunfish and how far north we think they might have extended so far. OK, um... Well, in terms of the, the data set that we were looking at, it, we're really looking at Cape Clear, which is the southern tip of, our, of Ireland. And so that's where our time series was based. But, you know, in terms of what we know, we definitely have seen them up in, up in Norway and, and Iceland. Some fish will be sighted up there. Might only be five or ten a year, um, but they are being detected that far, far north now. So um, I, I guess the thing to, re to remind ourselves is that they are a migratory species, but they are pushing up that far that far north right now. So um, so certainly around the UK, um, you, you, you can expect to see some fish almost anywhere. Great stuff. Thank you, Tom. And then there's another one here. Well, I'm not sure if I'm getting that audio feedback. Um, asking, why do you think that siphon of four numbers are increasing? Yeah, that's that's a tricky question, and um, so it's it's hard to know to um, to be sure what's what's driving the siphonophore increase. Um, like, if we look at the sunfish, what we think, you know, in terms of the the sorry, I started again. In terms of siphonophores, we're not quite sure. Like, if you look at it, it's it could be linked with prey, um, but when we see that dramatic increase you know you expect that maybe what's happening in that time series is that these siphonophores have pushed into that kind of range within the system because some of these siphonophores again are more of a of, of a warmer water species so maybe the increase is linked to that the suitability of the habitat is becoming better but we're not seeing siphonophores pushing as far north as we're seeing with the sunfish and um, because look the sunfish are migratory so they can move you know, hundreds of kilometers um, in a season, whereas siphonophores are restricted to, to, to where they are. But what we do think that's happened is that we are seeing changes in the oceanography and the strength of the shelf edge current and things like that. So the shelf edge current that runs up along the, the, the shelf, that could be driving some of these things or transporting some of these siphonophores um, uh, around. And that's why we're seeing an increase in some of these species. But it's, it's, it's something that we're just we're beginning to look at because it's, it's um, in terms of these siphonophores, we haven't been looking at them. And it's only recently that we've been looking at these time series. Great stuff. Thank you, Tom. And one final question from David Sims. Um, in coastal and shelf habitats of northeast Atlantic, smaller sunfish appear more common and rely more on benthic prey than pelagic gelatinous prey. Um, and could that explain the lack of correlation of, site of sunfish and siphonophore abundance? Yes, no, that's a, that's a really good point, uh, David. Um, yeah, that, that's the thing. We do see an ontogenetic onto shift in, in terms of the prey of what these animals are feeding on. So sunfish, when they are younger, and in the coastal waters, when you do see smaller sunfish, so they are more likely to feed on, 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 on a variety of prey, including crustaceans. Um, but we do know they also feed on siphonophores, so if siphonophores are there. But it, it could, yeah, it could absolutely explain uh, the lack of correlations. So is a really good point. Great stuff, thank you. And a question that I think, Abby, you're going to love here. Um, so um, somebody from our social media platform is asking, how do you get policymakers excited about plankton? Oh, oh, that's such a good question. And you um, have that on. 
Yeah, well, I'm quite excitable, so I think I think that also helps. Uh, but I try to I try to make it really relatable. Um, so when I give a talk, I usually start out with like a picture of like sponge plankton from SpongeBob. Because I'm like, oh, who knows? Who knows who this is? And people will be like, yeah, I have kids. Um, or try to like get them to think about plankton because what we take for granted in, in Plymouth, especially, is that we see the sea every day. And when I'm working in Brussels or in Westminster or Tokyo or whatever. Um, people are, you know, naturally less connected with the sea. So I think it's really important to kind of spark that like, oh, this does matter to me. And using pop culture is a really good way. I'm modeling one of the plankton shirts right now. Well done, thank you. <laughs> um, Email available yeah. online. <laughs> so using pop culture is a good way or, or, or the white cliffs of Dover or, or the fact that jellyfish are plankton um, and you can see them. And then the next step is to show why plankton are important to, to policymakers. So, you know, fishing is so high profile, pretty much globally, definitely very, very strong in the UK. Um, so the links between plankton and, and fish um, is really, they're really critical to point out. And you've seen a lot of that in the talks today. Um, mola mola is a good one. Like I didn't really know the sunfish link. So I'll definitely be using that when I talk. Uh, to policy because it's a charismatic megafauna. Um, and and I think, was it Charles that talked about the North Atlantic right oh, whales? Yeah. I mean, I was nice. dying. I was like, oh, this is so good for policy. It's like the holy grail is something cute that everybody loves linked to plankton. Um, so I, I try to show why it's important to them and then why it's important to whatever policy they're working on. So if it's the UK marine strategy or um, our fishing policy when we, when we left the EU, um, or the UK Marine Strategy Framework Directive and try to directly connect plankton to whatever it is they're working on very, very explicitly. Uh, so oh, another example would be the sustainable development goals. So just show as explicitly as possible how our plankton can like, or our data about plankton and our research, why do you as a policymaker, why do you need this? And basically convince them you can't do your job without this data. So you need to fund the CPR. <laughs> so I go cool. from SpongeBob to like, please fund the CPR in like 10 minutes, probably. Um, Sounds and, like a good journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and apart from the fact that obviously planks are just incredibly striking, unique looking and all of that imagery that we can use to engage people as well, I think is, is so vital. So great. Answer. And especially, Thank you for that. and I love it when I can get policy people to come to Plymouth because that's even one of the best things you can do is take them into the lab at the MBA when it's all the CPRs and be like, some of these have been used since somebody said earlier, um, was it Jonathan in the Arctic? Some of these have been, you know, were made in the 1940s and look, we're still using them. And isn't this amazing? It's not something that, that needs to be upgraded as like IT advances every year. Like this is an amazing piece of equipment um, that has like a historical past and like suck people in that way a little bit too. All right. So yeah, I, could, I told you I could talk about this forever. So I'll stop. I'm sure you could. I'm <laughs> sure you could. And, and, you know, something as simple as our flow cam that we have here as well, being able to see the water, go live across the, the very thin area. I don't know how to technically explain it perfectly, but then to be able to see that plankton live that's in that sample is, is really hard hitting, I think. And it's just something that, that people have never seen before. So it's it's great plankton. We all, I think we're all converted to loving plankton in this audience today. Um, great stuff, thank you. Um, and we've got another couple of questions here for Sarah. So Sarah, have you seen the reports of odd guillemot behavior recently? And lots being seen very close to shore, which aren't scared of humans, report saying it's been a very good season so there are simply lots of giant juveniles others saying they've been driven inshore due to lack of food do you have any response to that yeah sure so for those that haven't been aware of it we're getting a lot of reports on twitter and social media platforms that there's been lots of dead guillemots washing up down the east coast of the uk and the guillemots have been exerting strange behaviors as well they're being seen up rivers which is very unusual uh, so the big question is why, and there's a number of different hypotheses, but it's very unusual to see large numbers of dead guillemots at this time of year. You'd normally expect them to be out in the central North Sea at this time, and also to see them so close in. We're also getting reports of dead fish along the coast as well. So at the moment, we don't know if it's due to starvation. The corpses are certainly very emaciated and not weighing very much, which suggests that they haven't got food. But at the same time, we're hearing reports that there's flocks feeding very well off the coast and there are fish being seen very close in. 
So whether it's um, food and starvation or whether it's to do with disease or potentially contaminants and pollution at the moment, we don't know, but we're looking into it and we would appreciate any uh, reports of dead guillemots as well at UKCEH. Great, thank you. And Irina had a follow up question on that as well. Irina, do you want to um, just uh, make sure that your microphone is live? Hello. Yes. yes can you can hear me? You. Yes, we can. Thanks very much. I don't know. Sometimes I think there was similar. I mean, like I agree, there could be a, a number of reasons, but uh, sort of some some sort of odd behaviour from sea mammals and seabirds. Sometimes when there's um, as, as was mentioned, contaminants like uh, toxic algae can produce um, uh, toxins that affect the brains and behaviour. Um, so that you know that could be that, or infections and diseases have a similar kind of effect on the on brains. But, uh, perhaps the lack of food and you know. Um, additional stressors maybe affecting um, that is could you comment on that uh, has there been any contaminant rises we've got a project at the moment that's actually looking at contaminants throughout this area of the north sea um, so we have got some nice samples over the last summer and the winter so hopefully we'll be able to answer that question and certainly we're collecting some samples to try and look at this at the moment we don't know but often these things can act in tandem so Extreme weather is known to also interact with, um, for example, parasitism or disease, um, potentially contaminants as well. So that might well be the case. It's interesting that we're only seeing dead guillemots largely. We're not seeing other species washing up in large numbers. So whether that means it's not an algal bloom or something like that, we don't yet know. Great, thank you, sir. Thank you, Irina. Um, and we've got a question from Paul Hart. I know that Paul, you've um, had your microphone on before and asked the question, so I wondered if you'd like to do the same, or I can read it out for you. Are you there, Paul? You can hear me. There we go. Yes, we can. Thanks, Paul. Oh, you've gone again. I'll just read out the question. So um, Cushing in the 1980s elaborated his match mismatch I'm hypothesis. I'm here. I'm oh, here. he's there. Here we go. Sorry, there we go. I, 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 he comes up with a message saying, do you want to unmute? Yeah, I didn't see it. Um, yes, uh, in the 1980s, uh, David Cushing, who was at Lowestoft, proposed his match mismatch theory uh, of mainly relating to place to try and explain the uh, variation in recruitment. So he hypothesized that place larvae have to feed on plankton and the timing of the occurrence of the plankton peak and the fish larval production was critical to the survival of the, the year class. And I wondered, I was just wondering whether this is sort of fed into the general literature or whether it's just something which is known in the fisheries world and no one has bothered to follow up in detail. Well, certainly it has reached across all the different um, sort of ecosystems and things. So the mismatch stuff that I presented has been particularly well picked up in terrestrial systems. And there's some really, really nice examples of work looking at mismatch between actually passerine birds and things like caterpillars and also top predators such as sparrowhawks that's happened in the Netherlands, which are really fantastic data sets. And in terms of the North Sea, I think things have moved on. And perhaps an important point to make that is that mismatch, you need to look at different parts of the cycle. And there's some really nice work by T. Renier, who's found, for example, I'll talk about sand eels because that's the fish species we're most interested in. But they found that sand eel hatch time was actually related to um, seasonal temperatures in the autumn and winter rather than the spring temperatures that we looked at in our study. And that's because it influences gonad and egg development. Whereas the copepod timing, the prey of the sandal larvae, mostly responded to February temperatures. And actually, it's this mismatch occurring because of these different responses to temperatures at different times of the year that seems to be driving changes in sandal recruitment. And that's a really nice example of that. Thank you. Great, thank you. And we've just got one final question here from uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, would you like to switch your microphone on and ask your question? Camera two, if you like, as a panelist. There you go. Yeah, we can see and hear you, Jonathan. Sorry, was that uh, was that the question for Tom? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So Tom, I just uh, wondered whether you'd also considered some of the ocean bio biogeographic information system um, data that's available for sunfish. 
when I open that up and look up sunfish, it looks like the real boundary at the at the northern latitude that cuts across some of those, uh, maybe across some of those isotherms uh, that I think you presented in your talk. I just wondered if that might be a resource that could link um, some of the work uh, from Ireland to maybe the Western Atlantic and even uh, cut across some of those CPR lines that uh, uh, transit across the oceans. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. I, I wasn't aware of it. So, um, you know, it looks fantastic. I'll definitely be digging into that. And um, it'd, be, it'd be lovely to test, you know, because we just had that single coastal observatory, you know, so um, to be able to expand that out. Obviously, um, you know, I don't know in terms of the time series, how far that kind of data set goes back. And but certainly it'd be, it'd be great to look at that. So, I guess yeah. the, the advantage of the data set that you presented is the uh, the effort information as well. Uh, yeah. A little bit different than presence only uh, data for for uh, long uh, or potentially long time series as in OBIS. So yeah, very yeah no, but, but definitely be great to, to have a look at that. I, I wasn't aware of it. So so thanks. Okay, thank you. We've just got one final question here actually from Sonia as well. Sonia, would you like to put your camera and microphone on? I will, um, just apologies, because it's uh, breakfast time here before my son goes off to school, so there'll be some background noises. Um, it wasn't really a question. Uh, I just uh, was commenting that there was some, um, with, associated with the North Pacific Marine heat wave, there's been um, a lot of uh, mass mortality events in seabirds, and some of that, were, they were looking at um, harmful algal blooms as one cause, but the um, the, specific, the species specific responses seem to be more linked to um, trophic linkages and, and you know, poor forage fish and particularly high metabolic demands of one species of seabird that was, was poorly affected. So um, it was really just kind of, you know, matching with what other people were saying earlier. Great. Thank you, Sonia. I hope you get to have a rest once your son goes to that school. I know it's no uh, early hours for you. Thank you for joining us at this late time. Um, so just before I hand back to Richard, just to say that um, if you do want to sign up as a member of the MBA, there is a code CPR90, which is valid until the 20th of September, which allows you a uh, free annual subscription to the Journal of Marine Biological Association. So that's CPR90. There'll be a link shared in our chat very soon. So something you could do with the next 10 minute chat. So we'll have a 10 minute break, uh, sorry, 15 minute break. We're gonna start a little bit later. So 3.45 to join us for our final session, which is the future of CPR. And I'll just hand you back to Richard now to finish up this theme. Thanks all the speakers. Well, thanks very much. I just wanted to, to, to endorse that thank you to all the speakers and to the participants, literally, you know, worldwide from early in the morning to late at night, a really fantastic turnout and, you know, such a fantastic set of talks emphasizing the importance of the CPR, you know, historically. And also, I think, look into the future, particularly with, with Abby's talk for, you know, what the promise is for the next um, for the next 90 years, fingers crossed. So uh, I know I won't be here to celebrate 180 years, but I wish the CPR all the very best. It's been a key, you know, really key part of my own research. You know, we wouldn't have seen that rise in awareness of work on microplastics without that data that came from the CPR that could never have been envisaged at the time Sir Alistair Hardy first dipped his nets in the water. So thank you very much, everybody. Here's to a very happy 90th anniversary and looking forward to the future. Thank you. Oh, yes, become an MBA member. I've been one since I was a student. Your time to do it now. Me too. Thank you, Richard, for that final great endorsement. And thank you for chairing this last session. And we'll see you all at 3.45.
So welcome back everybody. It's now 3.45 and we are in our final session for the day. It's been a fantastic day so far. And the final session is looking at our future. And to chair this session, we're going back to David John. So David, if I can pass back to you. Yes, hello everybody. Um, apologies, <laughs> my light seems to have just gone out. So I look like I'm sat in a cave now, but I'm not, Deep I am sea. in my office. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so welcome back to our last session. Um, thank you all of you for staying with us as we continue to celebrate the, our 90th. As Maya said, we're now going to be looking at the future applications of the CPR. Um, first up will be Dr. Pierre Pellouet, who works here with us at the MBA, but he's based in France. He'll be talking about one of our new projects called ICPR. After that, another MBA researcher, Dr. Rowena Stern, will be talking, looking at using molecular techniques for the CPR. Thirdly, we'll have a presentation from Doris, Dr. Boris Espinas, based in Norway, who will be talking about his novel work on zooplankton ice escapes, linking satellite within situ data. And finally, we'll have Dr. Julie Robodart from the National Oceanographic Centre in Southampton, and she'll be discussing opportunities and innovation in marine biological surveillance. So as the same as our previous sessions, don't forget you can ask questions in the chat. Or at the end, you can raise your, use the raise your hand function and we'll pose questions to our speakers afterwards. So we'll get going and we'll start with Pierre. Good morning. My name is Pierre Elawet and I'm a senior numerical ecologist at the MBA. Today, I'm going to give you a quick overview on the ICPR project. The aim is to, of the project is to integrate new technologies in the CPR survey. 90 years ago, Sir Alistair Hardy had a simple idea. To map near-surface plankton in space and time. That simple idea became a fantastic one because he had a clear scientific purpose to understand the changing fortunes of the fisheries and also a clear vision on how to do it by using a device to be towed behind a ship. 90 years after, that simple idea became the most extensive biological survey in the world, with 61 years of comparable data, more than 300,000 samples containing in information on more than 700 taxa. And at this point, it's very important to remember that the CPR survey is using ships of opportunities or soups. It means that the CPR survey has created a unique network of shipping companies. And this network is the cornerstone of all CPR activities. The idea behind the ICPR is also very simple, to increase our efficiency at monitoring the world ocean. Of course, we want to guarantee the continuity with the previous 90 years, while getting ready for the next 90 years. So, there is a clear scientific purpose to get more information from the CPR, as well as a clear vision on how to do it, to integrate by integrating new technologies within the whole survey. First, we want to get more information from the sea by collecting more data. And for that, we developed, in collaboration with Alex Nemo-Smith from Plymouth University, a new module for instruments. This is our first ICPR in which we added our first module for instruments. This module is composed by a modular payload bay cage that is fitting within a regular CPR, a power housing, a sensor lugger housing, and also a power generation impeller. And this impeller is a key feature for us because it means that the ICPR is self-powered. The first two pictures show you how the module is fitted in a CPR. On the bottom picture, you can see the new propeller in black. This new propeller means that there is no batteries required within an ICPR, which contribute to keep the cost and the weight down and increasing the autonomy. Also, and it's very important, it means that the ICPR is still soup friendly. For instance, we have many rules regulating the usage of batteries on a boat, especially if you are in a CPR hanging on a crane. Also, we don't need any special cable, no specific human intervention. And the main feature is the fact that we have more power available, more power together, new data, 
but also to be more flexible. Our new module is the ideal platform to add instruments on a CPR. New instruments to monitor the ICPR behavior. For instance, we have a three-axis accelerometer, a three-axis gyroscope, and also a depth sensor. And this allows us to better understand how we sample. Also, we monitor the speed and the direction taken by an ICPR by using a magnetometer. And this allows us to better understand where we sample. Of course, monitoring the ICPR behavior is not enough. We also monitor the ICPR environment. For that, we have sensors measuring temperature, conductance, and also we have fluorimeters. And this allows us to better understand what we sample. We developed the module to be the ideal instrumentation platform by being self-powered and flexible. Perhaps the most exciting part of this uh, of this side of the project is the integration in the module of an holocam. The holocam contains a camera that can measure not only the light intensity, like a light regular camera, but also the phase of the light. This is an example of a raw hologram. This is the same hologram without background, and finally, the same hologram at its optimal focal depth. Because of the post processing required, Using a an holocam relies heavily on using artificial intelligence and machine learning. This is why we had an MOS student with the University of Hindenburg, EPCC, and uh, I, he actually finished last week, so congratulations to him. And his project was to focus on developing a artificial intelligence algorithm that can uh, classify the images coming from the flow cam. We also have a PhD student with Plymouth University that is going to start in September, and he will be focusing on using the images coming from the Holocam. We also have other collaboration like uh, with France or Norway. The ICPR project is not only about getting more information from the sea, but also from the lab by integrating new technology to our observations. To achieve this, we started a collaboration with Olympus. The aim for this collaboration is to develop new tools to get more information from the silk. The first thing we want is to get high quality images from the silk. Images from the full sample, or images from a specific individual, or even images from a specific part of a specific individual. We want those images and associated comment and metadata to be added in the new databases of image. This database will be used for training and teaching, but also to feed AI algorithm. And this will allow us to push the next step of AI on silk. AI for automatic particle delineation, automatic measurements, and ultimately automatic identification. All those elements being stepping stones toward the concept of augmented real analysis. The third goal of the ICPR project is to get more information from the existing data. And the first step was to enhance our data management to store and connect more information by creating new databases. So we enhanced to integrate new data. For instance, we have now full taxonomic resolution data for every routine taxa in the CPR database. We also have now the main functional traits associated with our taxa list. And finally, to complement the biological data we already have, we are also creating a new database of, um, of environmental parameters. We also, have, we also, of course, have to be get ready to ingest our new data coming from the sea, as well as the one coming from the lab. But all these are the very clear goal to generate new research. As part of this new research, I would like to introduce a new indicator we've been developing. It's a community stability index developed for CPR data, but compatible with virtually any data set. When extracting raw time series from a specific location, like here in the North Sea, it becomes obvious that it's hard to see any pattern, and this is because the signals are all mixed. However, it is possible to model only the long-term signal of any taxa. 
Then the signals are much clearer, allowing us to clearly identify patterns such as period of high abundances or low abundances. It is also possible to synthesize the information contained in the World Model Planktonic Community to obtain the planktonic community trajectory at long term. And this allows us to identify the extreme direction taken by the community. Then, taking those trajectories, it's also possible to further synthesize the information to obtain a simple indicator of stability. Indicator which clearly identify period of instability in our selected areas. So the indicator will help comparing period of time, but also comparing different areas. Finally, the indicator is an enhancement compared to the one using a period of reference or unable to directly work with missing values. This piece of research is directly connected to our focus on using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Using CPR time series and satellite data, we are developing shallow learning models called NARCs. Those models will allow us to model taxa abundance without CPR observation. We will then be able to combine CPR observation with model data to get an almost real-time community stability index. Getting more from existing CPR data is also about revisiting well-known ecological concepts. For instance, Nicola, our new postdoc, is adding functional traits to our CPR database to explore the structure and functioning of planktonic ecosystem. By focusing on functional groups, Nicola gives us new insights on the role of specific populations in a given ecosystem. In turn, this will give us more information on the potential impact of regime shifts, it will also help us creating new planktonic groups and finally may lead to the creation of a new generation of indicator. Finally, I would like to mention the work initiated by Lawrence, our new researcher. Lawrence is, is investigating the time frequency relationships in plankton time series. More specifically, he's using wavelet analysis to explore the structure of time series and their potential synchrony at large spatial scales. Those synchrony can exist in time between taxa, but also in time between areas. Those analyses are providing information on the different dynamics of planktonic populations, as well as their link with the physical environment. Finally, those analyses may allow us to train artificial intelligence to automatically identify specific temporal patterns. The ICPR is about integrating new technologies in the existing CPR survey. So I would like to say thank you to all CPR staff members and also thank you to you who listen to me. I leave you with the list of all C ICPR team member. Thank you, Pierre. That was a very, uh, very good talk there, really sort of showing the sort of new areas that we've been moving into. And, you know, ICPR really is kind of like the next step in CPR evolution. So that's excellent. Um, so next up, we will have uh, Rowena. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Rowena Stern. I'm a molecular ecologist at the CPR survey. My talk is going to be um, about the possibilities of the CPR survey um, using molecular applications and tools. So um, here we see um, a picture of uh, various different plankton states. Um, molecular tools are really essential for discovering the unknown element of uh, plankton. You've heard about all the amazing discoveries that uh, micros microscopic analysis can um, uncover um, over the long uh, term, but uh, molecular tools have really come into their own um, in the last 10 years, um, yet they are um, a, an essential tool for discovering the unknown elements. Um, if you look at this sort of central plankton picture. Um, first of all, we can identify unknowns. This um, 
strange circular object is actually an acantharian um, cyst, which would be nearly impossible to identify using microscopic methods. Um, we've got a picture of uh, a community and within that community um, you can see lots of organisms but even underneath that there are even more organisms uh, that are unknown. And finally, um, we uh, most importantly we can uh, identify um, markers of marine health um, and this is really what I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, if we have a look at this uh, picture of lots of bacteria um, it leads to um, a, a discovery by Luigi Fasuli uh, back in 2012 who looked at um, uh, uh, pathogenic bacteria and discovered how it's uh, um, increasing um, with sea surface temperature. We have really made huge progresses in um, extracting DNA from uh, CPR samples. In fact, I think we're just over 600 CPR samples uh, that um, have been extracted for either DNA or RNA. And these range from the Arctic to tropics. Um, and a, a variety of researchers, um, not just myself, are in, involved in this effort. Um, so that's paying tribute to that. These are just some of the uh, papers that have um, come out from this type of analysis. Very early on, um, uh, Richard Kirby and Alistair Lindley uh, produced a paper on North Sea echinoderms, identifying them using genetic methods. Um, and uh, Ripley and De Declan Schroeder's group um, um, moved forward with this and uh, analysed uh, these tiny um, coccolithophores called Amelia and Huxleyi. Um, in 2008. These, these methods uh, really served um, to uh, bring forward uh, the CPR survey molecular analysis. Uh, most recently um, in the Southern Ocean, um, this paper by Suter et al. Um, had lo looked at a whole transect of, of zooplankton and, and covered enormous uh, diversity and, and really found how effective this CPR survey is in capturing zooplankton. Um, in the North Pacific, uh, a study I recently led um, along with uh, Stephanie Moore and others in the, uh, the Northwest Pacific uncovered a um, huge range of diversity of, of the toxic uh, algae pseudonychia, and that's really a problem over there. And finally, globally, uh, Luigi Fasuli has uh, analysed samples in the North Atlantic, um, in the South Atlantic, um, and all over and, and the Pacific and all over the uh, world to uncover uh, how the uh, pathogenic um, bacteria Vibrio um, is uh, is behaving in response to to climate change. This is a summary of of uh, how we extract DNA from CPR samples. Uh, CPR samples come in a nice little packet. Um, and uh, they're preserved in uh, a final concentration of 4% formalin. Um, we cut them up. Um, other people just pick off uh, individuals. Um, there could be a range of methods used here. Uh, there's an essential washing step, and it's a very elaborate process that, that takes about a week. Um, and you can see these nice little colour ranges. This is a DNA extraction done um, all the way across the channel. You can see the different phytoplankton pigments that have come out from that and they go through a range of chemical extractions to finally extract DNA. And this big circle um, with different colours um, is the final DNA uh, compared to a range of known standards that are publicly available. Um, and everything in red type that isn't sort of coloured in a, is named, isn't coloured, is a, is a new type. And using that, we can then see um, the most similar thing uh, that the DNA is um, uh, linked to and we can give it a, a possible identification. So um, it's really a very powerful tool because you don't even have to know what the uh, organism looks like to begin with. You can find out at the end. So unfortunately, uh, whilst formalin is uh, brilliant for uh, preserving the morphological features of plankton, it's not so great for DNA and RNA. Um, and this paper sort of summarises um, the, the various different types of damage that uh, that it can do to uh, CP to, to formalin preserved samples. The most important damage is that it, it can um, 
make the DNA smaller. If you see on the right hand side this large piece of DNA and it gets chopped up um, if it's not buffered but luckily the CPR survey was um, uh, already onto that and was uh, preserving, was making sure that the CPR samples, um, the formalin was buffered um, and that has um, maintained um, its quality um, which which would not be maintained if they hadn't done done that. Uh, there's various other different types of, of damage, um, but what can happen here, you can see the on the right hand side, the, uh, the red piece of, of DNA. Um, uh, if the DNA is chopped up, then um, what can happen is that we can miss our target if we want to um, amplify uh, a specific region of that DNA. And if it's if it's too small or, or um, it, it, it might be missed. Uh, the other option is that it can, um, the formalin sort of cross links with proteins and other pieces of DNA and it blocks um, sort of any enzyme action that we want to do in order to extract um, a specific part of that day, uh, DNA for analysis. So the key messages here is um, for the future to capture DNA uh, as near as possible to the collection time uh, to um, reduce that level of damage that, as um, the damage increases with time. I'd really like to sort of talk a little bit uh, um, more about uh, studies that have been done on, on, on Vibrio and um, because it's really been one of the most successful examples of how the CPR survey um, is useful in, in measuring uh, the health of the oceans. Vibrio globally um, is, is increasing. Luigi Vasuli um, discovered that in, in 2016 and this is because it's very much um, uh, a species that directly is affected by ocean temperature. Um, in the United States, uh, Vibrio infections have also gone up by 85%. Um, there are three main species, uh, Vir Vibrio cholera, Vibrio parahemolyticus and Vibrio vulnificus that are especially pathogenic. They cause a, a range of gastrointestinal diseases and skin lesions. Um, and then um, most of them are caused by consuming contaminated um, shellfish. So um, although, as I mentioned, there's thousands of environmental strains, um, some contain toxin genes, and these can be transferred between strains. So that creates an ever-changing kind of environment in which toxic uh, a non-toxic strain can suddenly become toxic. But there's been sporadic cases of Vibrio infection, and I've put um, here the colours, um, green for Vibrio parahemolyticus, yellow for um, Vibrio cholera and the years that, that, that it happened. So um, even though the Pacific Northwest is a, um, has very cold waters, nevertheless, these are occurring and it's not clear why. Um, if we look at this diagram, um, we can see that um, sort of Vibrios are a part of a, a larger system. Uh, climate change um, impacts a number of different factors such as temperature and salinity and pH and they all affect the marine ecosystem at different levels um, all the way down to the cell with a cascading effect and what happens at a sort of a large scale can affect how um, cells behave um, and respond to that. Um, so one of the, the key things is, is that, that um, um, at temperatures over 15 degrees Vibrios can double their, their population and that expands the number of possibilities for uh, pathogenic strains to emerge. Um, so I'm going to move on to a study that we're currently carrying out. Um, it was um, uh, started um, with a, a rare sort of cholera outbreak in March 2018 in um, the Pacific Northwest coast of, of Canada and uh, off Vancouver Island. Um, and uh, people had consumed um, herring eggs, which are normally safe, but um, in this case, um, people got sick. Um, the Centre for Disease Control and various other agencies um, took some samples of the environment and, 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 for, and for sick people. And they discovered uh, that the people were infected by a Vibrio cholera strain. I should point out that I know that cholera has a, um, you know, um, most people think of cholera as this 
the subtrop the tropical cholera, which is um, extremely um, extremely dangerous and and often fatal. Um, this type of strain is is not is a self limiting uh, strain. It's not the epidemic form, um, so it's uh, it's a non O one O one three nine cholera strain. The O one O one three nine is is the epidemic variety, but nevertheless, it still causes um, gastrointestinal diseases. Um, but the outcome is better. Um, so I can say that the source of this actual strain um, is is unknown. Um, it could be a local a, a spontaneous local species or strain, or it could have uh, moved in from other places in the world. So um, this project was to uncover uh, this, the sources and dispersal pathways of this. Um, so um, what we did, um, and you can see the map here, is we actually uh, managed to um, extract DNA uh, from, uh, you can see over the star, that is the actual infection site, but from the nearest um, um, CPR survey sample uh, transect, you can see the, the square area there. Um, and we used a range of years, so, so 2012, which is a cold year, 2015, which is a warm year, and then also 2017 and 2018. Um, so 2000 and, um, what we found was a, sm a small amount of uh, Vibrio cholera in April 2017. Um, and then the pink bars um, show um, we, we found um, a level of uh, Vibrio cholera in 2000. And 18 in spring, which was around just a month later after that um, infection occurred. So um, Vibrio cholera is still around in spring waters, even though they're cold. And the, you can see the pink, one of the pink um, bars are quite high, and we found quite high levels of one. And we thought that although we found the Vibrio cholera uh, presence, um, we don't know uh, enough about it to identify it to strain level. So what we had to do is um, uh, a process called whole genome enrichment. Um, so um, that in concentrates uh, the, 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 DNA, the Vibrio DNA. So I'll just show you here, um, in picture A, you can see here's our mixed plankton sample. Uh, we extract the DNA and in the middle we attach that DNA to um, Vibrio specific um, probes. Um, and in the third picture, um, we start to, um, the probes um, extract out just the Vibrio content and we get an enriched sort of Vibrio um, enriched sort of DNA sample. Um, and picture B shows an example from another paper from Vesu uh, Luigi Fasuli in 2017, who tried this method before. And the dark green bars show um, the level of enrichment um, that we got compared to what we would have got if we just used um, sort of plain um, DNA or un, uh, unenriched DNA. And what, what, what that means is we can also enrich for uh, the particular markers for uh, toxigenic um, um, genes. And that will enable us to identify uh, where the toxic genes have come from and where they spread to. Um, our next step is now to, um, you can see this, this very sick person here, is a link it to the strains that were found um, in the sick people and also to some environmental factors. There's a number of things going on around that time. In 2015, there was a bit of a marine heat wave that was sort of offshore. Um, we don't know whether that's affected it and it, it might be difficult to tell, but there might be some sort of traces of... Um, biological or abiotic factors that may have um, contributed to the, these sort of um, pathogenic strains being there. However, um, in a recent study by Luigi Vasuli, um, he towed a CPR sample um, with, our, uh, with um, Lance Gregory, um, um, who was really in, um, instrumental in making sure those samples were towed all along um, Lake Tanganyika in Africa. Um, this shows you the sort of the towing kind of program all along the length of it. Um, and on the right hand side, um, these were the strains that he, he managed to extract from the CPR samples. And out of interest, they also towed non formalin uh, towed samples, but uh, um, he didn't really find anything from there. Um, as you can see, everything in red is this strain and the, the species next to it was Vibrio cholera. 
but it was um, an in, likely an environmental strain. Everything on the right hand side um, uh, is the is the red with a red bar are the the toxic epidemic Fibrio cholera, and you can see our um, the the type that we found here was more sort of environmental and uh, potentially uh, not pathogenic, but it's still um, a useful example of how we can extract specific genomic information from CPR samples um, and we can link them to a wider database and, and really find out how what's going on with, with pathogens in, in marine waters. So moving on here, uh, one of our future efforts is to improve DNA extraction methods. We're, we are trialling this method called isotacophoresis uh, with Purigen Biosystems in California. Um, this is a really simple method and, and quick method to extract DNA uh, and it uses the electrical charge of DNA uh, as a property to, uh, you can see the top images, it's all the DNA is mixed in the sample and using a variety of sort of buffers, uh, separation buffers and electrical charge you can get nice pure nucleic acid, you see the, um, the bar below um, from that um, and really sort of unchanged and this really sets the paradigm for how um, molecular research can be done on CPR samples. We have a system where we can collect the samples, um, they're, um, they're um, stored and, and extracted in parallel, um, almost after collection. Uh, DNA is extracted and uh, in the case maybe of um, with Vibrio, uh, we prepare libraries of Vibrio enriched uh, species for sequencing. Um, and that can, we can carry out a, a microbial community analysis where we identify what species and strains they are and link them up with a dis um, and find out, you can see the map there, what, uh, where they are and where they come from. And, and we can sort of link these up with, with uh, further efforts, for example, in the Centre for Disease Control or the European Centre for Disease Control or for NOAA for, for better predictions um, on the conditions. Um, and you know to warn shellfish for early warning systems for shellfish farmers for example. Thank you very much Farina, that was a, a fascinating talk. I'm always very impressed when we can say that we can identify 800 different types of plankton using taxonomy. And then I see these molecular results and I just say, ah, I've got a long way to go. OK, so next up, let me just check, uh, is going to be uh, Dr. Boris Espinas uh, developing large scale zooplankton isoscapes using observational data. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Boris Espinas and uh, I'm a postdoc at uh, the University of Tromsø in Northern Norway. Uh, and I will present my work uh, which are about uh, developing large scale zooplankton isoscapes uh, using observational data. So I will start by a brief introduction on uh, stable isotopes. So stable isotopes are naturally present in the environment. So we have what we call the common isotope, which is found in higher abundance. So in the case of the carbon, it's uh, carbon-12. And uh, we have uh, uh, other isotopes, which are characterized by a different uh, number of neutrons. And if there is one more neutron, then we'll get uh, heavier isotope, uh, for example, the carbon-13, which is a stable isotope. And if we do the ratio between the heavy isotope and the common isotope, and we compare this ratio to a standard uh, ratio, then we get what we call the isotopic ratio, which in this case will be the delta fertility. And uh, in the nature, the autotroph preferentially use the light isotopes against uh, the heavy one. And uh, a result of that is, uh, you can see here in this sketch, uh, if we have a mesocombs with a phytoplankton uh, community, and uh, which is limited by uh, nitrate concentration, and you add nitrate in the mesocosm. 
then the phytoplankton will use uh, first the light isotope, or the common one, and uh, at some point the nitrate will become limiting, so they will have to use as well the heavier isotope. And the signature or the isotopic value, delta 15n of the phytoplankton, will start to increase. So when we are uh, like away from the from the coast in the open ocean, uh, we can say roughly that uh, delta 15n is correlated with a nitrate concentration, or at least it works in an uh, environment where the uh, nitrate is a, a limiting nutrient. And uh, delta 15c is correlated with a CO2 concentration, which is in turn uh, driven by the, the water temperature. So what I just described takes place in the left part of the slide. It's uh, isotopic isotope uptake by the phytoplankton. And uh, what we can observe then is uh, accumulation of heavy isotope along the food web. So it's what we call uh, enrichment uh, between the trophic levels and uh, is due to uh, the excretion of light isotope. So for example, we have the plankton feeding on phytoplankton, uh, excreting light isotope, and then there is the accumulation of the ADP1. And so an increase in, of the isotopic ratio. And since we uh, know uh, roughly the uh, enrichment factor between the different trophic level. If we have isotope uh, value for juvenile salmon, for example, and phytoplankton, then we can uh, uh, estimate the trophic level of the juvenile salmon. So in this case, it's uh, trophic level three. Then the isoscapes. So the isoscapes are the uh, special distribution of uh, isotope value. So there is an example here of uh, uh, nitrogen or delta 15n isoscapes. Uh, so uh, it was made by uh, sampling uh, the studio area and uh, sorting out the copepod and looking at uh, uh, delta 15n value for this uh, copepod and then interpolating uh, between the sampling station. So to do the isoscapes, it's needed to uh, need a collect sample over the studio area. Uh, preferentially within a relatively short time period. Uh, that's uh, the isoscape's uh, consistence. And uh, also to have organisms that, are belong to the, that belong to the same trophic level. And the uh, last point is to take into account uh, the integration time of isotope value, so the tissue turnover. Uh, that can go from uh, day four to trough, a few days a week for uh, zooplankton, and it can differ a lot for larger organisms depending on the type of tissue you are uh, you are using. The feather for the bird, for example, or the, the muscle or the plasma in blood, it's a lot of different possibilities. So the isoscapes can be used for different purposes. Uh, for example, to identify the sources of key elements. So in the case of the Delta 15C, uh, it can be used to, um, to track uh, coastal water, uh, drifting offshore. Uh, for the delta 15n, it can be, for example, the type of uh, nitrogen compounds which are used in the system. Uh, so diazotrophy, for example, will have a different type of values than, uh, uh, than nitrate-based uh, system. Uh, to define an index for certain productivity, so we have seen that when uh, a system is productive, then the isotopic ratio tends to, uh, to increase. To provide a stable isotope baseline for trophic structure study, uh, so if you have uh, if you have value for, uh, for example, a species of, uh, of fish uh, over your study area, uh, and you want to know at which trophic levels are feeding, then you will need a baseline, and so the isoscape can provide that, and you can subtract the value from the isoscape to uh, your fish value, and uh, estimate the trophic level. And the last point is to uh, track fish or the organisms uh, when they move into the ocean. An example would be uh, otoliths, uh, so where you can look at uh, isotopic value uh, for different parts of the otoliths that correspond to a different part of the life cycle of the individual. And you can associate this value with uh, or see where they are distributed into your azoscapes and uh, estimate the, 
the animal movement. So a concrete example uh, of application. Uh, it's a study uh, that I've done in the Northeast Pacific. So I was working at UBC at that time. And uh, the context of this study was uh, an important decrease in Sukai salmon stocks observed over the last decades, so for some of the stock at least. And uh, very little was known about uh, how they are distributed in the open ocean and uh, what kind of uh, uh, trophic environment they experience. Uh, even so, they spend uh, two or three years in the open ocean. And to uh, get more information about that, we uh, decided to uh, develop isoscapes over 20 years, mainly based on the CPR uh, uh, samples. So we uh, we obtained uh, about 300 samples, uh, focusing on large herbivorous copepods, and uh, we analyzed these uh, copepods for delta 15 c and delta 15 n uh, values. <clears throat> And to produce isoscapes, instead of just uh, you know, simply interpolating between the, uh, the station, uh, we wanted to add some more uh, statistical power into that by using predictor. So we, uh, we looked at satellite data and produced some parameters such as uh, SST, chlorophyll A, uh, sea level anomalies for the eddies, uh, the bathymetry, uh, we also investigate the uh, mixed layer depth based on uh, ergo floats and uh, wind data. So we produce isoscape for 20 years. Uh, so you can see here example with uh, three years for delta 13C in the top and delta 15N in the bottom. Uh, you can see that the coastal river were not considered uh, because the dynamics there is much more complex uh, due to uh, tertiary input and uh, potentially suspension from the bottom. And also we are very interested in, uh, in getting some contrast in the open ocean because it's, uh, it was our study area and where the salmon were distributed. Uh, there is some uh, pattern that appears uh, with, uh, which can be due to eddies, for example, which are productive area. We also have influence from the um, continental shelf, let's say, and uh, uh, sometimes from uh, warmer water input from the south. So we wanted to uh, see if we can use these azoscapes as an index for sound productivity. And so uh, to do that, we uh, look at the correlation between the isoscape value and the abundance in a large copepod. And two region appears, uh, one in the middle of the Gulf of Alaska, where we have a positive correlation, and one along BC coast with a negative correlation. So the positive correlation in the Gulf of Alaska is rather intuitive, uh, because if the system is uh, productive, then delta 15N will be higher, and it will be uh, potentially a more favorable condition for the large copy port to, uh, to develop, and we'll find more, more of them. But uh, it didn't work along the BC coast. Uh, so this area is, uh, is pretty dynamic. Uh, there's a lot of uh, physical processes there happening. Uh, so there's upwelling, but it's also in a transitional area between the, the north and the south with a current uh, moving from one year to another. And so it, tend to, uh, it tends to hide uh, the change in isotopic value, which are due to uh, uh, only to productivity. So it shows that it can work, this correlation works within an equation, but this kind of transitional area, uh, not so much. So once we have produced these isoscapes, uh, we need to know where the, the salmon, a different stock of salmon were distributed. And I will just uh, very briefly go uh, through that, but we use correlation between delta 13 c and uh, SST to estimate the uh, uh, feeding runs of salmon uh, during the last year at sea. So once we know where the salmon are distributed, we can uh, extract isoscape uh, value. And so it will be zooplankton value. And uh, so it will be our baseline and compare that to salmon uh, isotopic value. 
so that we have measured in the scales when the salmon are back to the, the river system. And if we subtract the plankton value to the salmon value, we obtain the trophic level of the salmon. And we have been able to show that there was some uh, differences between the stocks and uh, that it could explain the, the different trends observed with uh, some stock uh, doing better than others. So uh, now what I am doing, uh, so I'm based in Northern Norway. Uh, I got a Mercury Fellowship to uh, develop isoscapes in the North Atlantic. And I'm still collaborating with uh, MBA uh, to do that. So I access to uh, about 600 uh, CPR samples, so mainly Calanus Marchicus. Uh, they have been analyzed for Delta 15C and Delta 15N. And I want to produce isoscape for three different seasons. And I will, uh, I will try to uh, uh, compare different uh, statistical approach to see uh, uh, which one is working the best. So there are two applications included in this project. One is about exploring changes in Atlantic puffin winter diet. So the isoscape will provide the uh, isotopic baseline. And uh, we measure uh, isotopic value in uh, uh, puffin feather. And using both, we can estimate the trophic level of the puffin and see if there is a changing changes sorry, between us. Uh, we also want to uh, estimate uh, uh, molting uh, ground location, so where the puffin are uh, replacing the primary feather because they cannot fly for a few weeks and uh, they are very exposed to uh, environmental conditions, so it's important to know where that happened. And uh, with this information, we hope we can help uh, to get a better understanding of uh, why the uh, uh, breeding success is decreasing in the last years. So maybe link with uh, uh, some carry carryover effect uh, with a, a lower fitness due to uh, harsher condition during winter. The second application is about using um, pre-isotopic composition, so zooplankton, to, uh, to understand the distribution, similar distribution of uh, Atlantic mackerel. So it was observed in the last year a shift of uh, the population from the, or more like extension actually, from the uh, east part to the west of the North Atlantic. And uh, if we have isoscapes covering like this, uh, this shift time, we, uh, we um, can use the data from the isoscapes to say that maybe there was some changing happening in the west part of the North Atlantic that could explain uh, why the, the mackerel start to uh, be distributed there. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank you very much for that, Boris. That's fascinating talk. So something very, very uh, novel for the CPR. And it's amazing to see that actually taking that new novel technique, you're still able to apply it back to ultimately to fisheries, which is what the CPR survey was actually started for all along. So that's amazing. Okay, we'll move on then to our final talk. And that's uh, Dr. Julie Robodart from NOC in Southampton. So over to you. Do you see that okay? Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Julie. Great. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about opportunities and innovation in biological surveillance. I'm going to start with this image on the right, which is um, by Kelly Lance at Ambari. And it's uh, one of my favorite images because it's got plankton in it, obviously. Uh, it's got fish and it's also got um, a bunch of different observing tools. And uh, I'm really into technology. So it's a beautiful image to me. Um, I'm the head of ocean technology and engineering at the NOC. Um, 
and I wanted to kind of start with a look forward and we're going um, to the next 10 years. Um, so the CPR is gonna have its 100th anniversary and usually you can say what's gonna happen in the next 10 years. If you were to ask me maybe in 2010, I could, I could start thinking around that. But um, to be honest, I have no idea what's gonna happen in the next 10 years in marine biological observing. Um, <laughs> there's, everything's escalating at the moment. So there's a lot of investment in data binding and um, analysis in um, technologies for marine bi biological observations. So it's gonna be a different world, I think. And partially that's because the ocean decade um, and the Futures of the Seas and Oceans initiatives. So these are basically uh, programs that are uh, trying to uh, coordinate globally to look at um, different things that have to do with the ocean. But, um, but there are several programs that have to do specifically with biology. And, um, and I've listed some here that are relevant to the CPR survey. Um, in addition, uh, there's the SDG 14, Life Below Water, um, and there's also some around um, the food sources. So, uh, so there's, there's this interest in um, fisheries and, and marine life. So there's a lot of challenges with new initiatives. So when we go out to observe biological um, phenomena in the oceans, uh, if you've got a new program, you've really got to think about standardization and interoperability. Those are um, major things that uh, allow you to look at different uh, data from different areas and, and understand them. Um, often there's inconsistent metadata, so patchy um, uh, measurements that are taken um, in collaboration with the biological observations. Um, at the beginning of these initiatives, there's low time and space resolution. Um, data access um, and analysis is usually a problem if they're complex types of data. And then um, the integration into policy is key because that, as uh, Abigail pointed out earlier, requires knowledge, not just data, right? So you can't just um, inform policy based on the data itself. So um, the CPR survey has this rich history where it's been able to actually um, collect all sorts of metadata um, and uh, CTD data and, uh, and now even fluorometry in collaboration with, uh, with all the CPR survey um, uh, transects in, on the ships of opportunity. Um, you've blown me away with the 700 taxa. I know, David, you said that uh, it doesn't seem like much, but actually uh, I usually do some targeted analysis and 700 taxa is a lot. That's a lot of biodiversity. Um, and honestly, with our sequence data, sometimes we can't identify them. So, uh, so these are actually really useful data um, compared to sequence data sometimes. Um, I looked up at uh, my favorite organism, Trichodesmium, on the top right here, and, uh, and Trichodesmium, you know, you've got a time series going to 1958, and here's all the North Atlantic uh, transects. It's insane, the, the temporal and spatial coverage. So you guys have kind of um, laid the groundwork for a lot of the biolog biological observations, and there's going to be a lot that um, these new initiatives can learn from the CPR survey. Um, and there's going to be a lot of upscaling. So what I'm calling upscaling is basically uh, changing how we do biolo biological observations by leverage leveraging different data types. So there's different types of biological data, but also uh, satellite drive data. So the CPR survey is, um, you, you guys today have shown a bunch of different uh, demonstrations of using satellite uh, data to even, um, yeah, measure phytoplankton, but also uh, to look at zooplankton, which is really cool using um, proxies from CPR data. Um, Argo float data are, um, are really helpful because they tell you where ocean currents are um, to look at more regional and mesoscale phenomena. Um, but in addition, uh, Argo floats are um, soon gonna be integrated with, uh, with particle imagers. So we'll have um, also some, uh, some plankton data from the Argo floats themselves that we can use for um, upscaling. Um, and then molecular observations and fixed observatories. So this is um, the EMOBON, which is a brand new um, European marine uh, sequencing biodiversity observation network. And, um, and the idea here is that uh, this is a, these are fixed locations, marine labs that um, have all sorts of biodiversity data. And now they've been augmented with sequence data um, through EMOBON and that's led by the EMBRC. Um, and that's just started in June. So, all of these complementary data types are really gonna be able, allow us to do novel things with biological observations. 
so there's this interplay between the environment with um, with the uh, imaging data and um, I guess so the, this the context the environment um, as well as uh, the imaging and molecular so you can pull out from here um, things like large scale change using satellite data um, you can understand the chemical contests using in situ sensors. Um, biodiversity data and um, a historic record using the CPR survey. And if you uh, integrate these with molecular data, you can add on some uh, functional potential and activity as well as, um, as uh, environmental response. So these are uh, DNA, RNA, and protein data that kind of tell you what the organisms are doing and what they're capable of. Um, the Ocean Biomolecular Observatory Network is basically um, been kicked off as part of the one of the Ocean Decade programs, and it's um, it's doing this exact thing. So it's trying to enhance fixed observatories with sequence data, so uh, DNA, RNA, and protein data. Um, it's going to be doing training and uh, technology development uh, in order to uh, increase the uh, observatories for um, biomolecular data. And it's a good time to do this because, as you guys are all well aware, uh, it's, there's, a, there's a global pandemic. Um, so the pandemic has actually um, really initiated a lot of um, capacity building with sequencing of novel strains, but also it's, uh, it's demonstrated how uh, impactful it could be when we work as, um, as a global uh, worlds of scientists to actually look at different strains and how they're um, how they're moving around the world over time. Um, data visualization is key and these data are um, usually shared in real time as uh, the sequences are generated. So it's really inspirational to see that. But in addition, um, the timing is great because there's a lot of um, initiatives to sequence uh, genomes of all of life. Uh, and this is based usually on voucher specimens. So these are organisms that are taxonomically identified that we uh, know are important. And then, um, and those genome sequence data actually enable us to, to do more with um, the in-situ biomolecular data than you would be able to do otherwise. So if you filter down some seawater, uh, we get a lot of data from that, but often we don't know who the data is assigned to. So this, um, this basically gives us a better database to identify those sequences. Um, environmental DNA is basically that. It's filtering down um, seawater, sequencing DNA, and um, or doing um, targeted analysis of, of DNA in that seawater. So you're filtering seawater um, because you know the org and organisms have been around there and they've uh, sloughed off their tissues and things like that. So there's gonna be uh, biomolecular fingerprints in those, uh, this data. So um, eDNA has been used to measure a threatened species, uh, Chinook salmon um, off the Pacific. And compared to uh, nets, it actually is giving pretty good data when you use quantitative PCR. Um, so we're, both based on both uh, abundances and biomass of these fish, um, you could get a decent correlation um, uh, with quantitative PCR data on um, just measuring abundances of the DNA. This has been demonstrated using sequencing tools too of the 12S ribosomal RNA of fish um, in, uh, around New Jersey and uh, New York. So in red there, you're looking at the net data, the, and this is a, a normal um, fisheries uh, abundance count, and then you're looking at eDNA river, uh, eDNA data in green and blue, and both habitat preference and seasonality were um, were were um, correlated in a lot of these uh, data points. And last, uh, Atlantic cod around um, the Faroe Islands, it's declining fishery, but um, but they were able to um, see an eighty percent agreement in detection using. Um, the traditional tools for fisheries abundances and qPCR there. Um, and as uh, Rowena demonstrated just a few minutes ago, um, you can actually do this for harmful uh, organisms too. So I'm going to give you two examples of uh, Alexandrium minutium. So we've been able to detect um, the DNA of Alexandrium um, directly from seawater uh, in less than 40 minutes from uh, sampling to detection. Um, and then if you, uh, if you look at uh, um, template DNA directly, you can actually amplify 
um, and detect using this little miniaturized genetic sensor. That's a, there's a picture of it in the middle here that we developed in ocean technology and engineering um, in, in less than five minutes. And that's a bit faster than what um, our, our traditional instrument on the bench. So this is a, a toxigenic organism. Um, and so you could get really quick data um, from seawater to detect it um, in the environment. And most recently, um, this is, sorry, these first studies are from Matt Wilson, who's, uh, who's working in ocean technology and engineering. And these last data are from uh, Ahmed al Rafi, um, who's a student with us. So he's been able to uh, develop uh, an assay to detect the gene responsible for demogue acid syn toxin synthesis. So demogue acid is a neurotoxin, as, uh, as Rowena pointed out, and this is um, the uh, abundances of the DAB-A gene, which codes for that uh, toxin biosynthesis, it um, those correlated with uh, not only the abundance of the toxigenic uh, pseudonitsia, but um, there was a decent correlation also with um, democ acid concentrations when you looked at the RNA. So this tells you a bit about activity of those um, toxigenic organisms. And um, as part of Tech Oceans, this project that kicked off in the fall of 2020, we're, um, we're kind of expanding on these uh, molecular tools and the, um, and the technologies to try to make miniaturized uh, microfluidic genetic sensors. Uh, genetic sensors already exist. So this is an environmental sample processor and uh, you can't have a talk about technology uh, for biological observations without mentioning it. So um, it takes a sample, filters seawater and it can preserve that um, filtered sample or it can um, extract the cells to a ribosomal RNA fingerprint. So to get a community um, analysis or it could do quantitative PCR on the genes. It can also do toxin detection, uh, and there's assays for democ acid, um, sandwich hybridization assays, and it sends the data back to you in real time. So this has been demonstrated um, in Monterey Bay for pseudonitsia. So that's, this uh, pseudonitsia is a neurotoxin, but it's, it's been linked to mortality in sea lions around Monterey Bay. Um, there was an ESP uh, deployed here at station E1 and at the Santa Cruz Wharf, and these are um, concentrations of democ acid, the larger, the circle, the more demoic acid. So um, you could see changes over time and then across the bay. But there was also um, a, a decent relationship between demoic acid here um, and pseudonitsia, uh, but not um, demoic acid and the abundances of other organisms. Um, so this is work by John Ryan uh, in collaboration with Rafe Cadella and, uh, and Chris Scholen. Um, the generation three ESP is tiny. It's this little thing right here and it sits in the nose of a long range AUV. Um, this AUV can go thousands of kilometers um, and, uh, and this uh, ESP takes 60 of these cartridges, which is each of these can collect one sample. Um, so it is able to filter again and apply RNA later so that you can take that sample and do molecular biology with it when you get the device back in the lab. We have a, a device to do something similar. So this is um, our biomolecular auto sampler, and this is the benchtop version and the submerged version. Um, this submerged version has been uh, deployed on auto sub 6000 just last month. Um, and it filters and then, um, and then samples uh, or preserves a sample um, for lab analysis again. Um, it's been pressure rated in this pressure pot to 4,500 meters, and it was deployed to 3,000 meters and took um, samples there and at the oxygen minimum zone on auto sub as part of I, part of I Atlantic last month. Um, these sequence data are pretty useless without some contextual data, and so we've um, got uh, in ocean technology and engineering, we're always developing these microfluidic lab on chip sensors, and these are all the different analytes, the different chemistries that it can, they can measure. Most recently, we've been able to measure subnanomolar iron and ammonium, so those are the newest sensors that are going to be rolling out soon. And um, I just kind of wanted to end to talk about the CPR program in relation to net zero and to um, the digital ocean. So these are two initiatives that are gonna be um, pretty important in the UK, I think. Um, so net zero oceanographic capability, usually people are thinking about uh, autonomous vehicles when you think about net zero. So the idea is to 
decrease our carbon footprint because we are environmentalists. Um, but in reality, there's these uh, really cool initiatives to make these uh, zero emission cargo ships even. Um, this is out of Norway that just was recently uh, left the docks in August. And then um, we've got Infinity, which is making the Armada fleet uh, meant to be deployed with a bunch of sensors, but they also can have samplers um, off the back. So they're large enough to carry a CPR. So this is really exciting. Um, and in addition, the ocean the digital twin, people usually think of this as an ocean modeling effort, and that's absolutely part of it. But um, it's also meant to ingest all the complex types of data that we're generating, especially biological data, because they're really difficult to work with including historic data. So things like um, your CPR database um, and then responding to and reporting those data. So making online tools that are easily digestible by, by the public. Um, and so this is great, but it's also um, a little frightening because if you see a, a change in biodiversity, like a decline, you might um, it might be something that has to do with um, a normal oscillation of oceanography, but uh, but the press might run with it and make um, yeah some scary uh, projections and um, and scare people. Yeah, so basically, I, I wanted to get back to this idea that it, it is really um, helpful to integrate all these types of data, but actually, um, there's it's not just the biodiversity and taxonomy data that uh, the CPR. Um, uh, program provides, but that knowledge that, um, yeah, that Abigail mentioned earlier, that that is very key for a uh, brand new biology program. So we just, uh, we, I think we need to be uh, careful about what we say with the data and what our time scales are for, um, for detecting change. Um, and yeah, with that, I'll thank the funders and OTE. But thank you for your time. Thank you very much for that, for Judy. That was uh, fascinating, some amazing things there. I'm, I'm already thinking about maybe we could put an e the ESP on the CPR <laughs> and perhaps part of the Atlantico project. We can have a think about that. <laughs> okay, so Maya, I think you hope you've got some questions for our, um, our team. microphones if you're a speaker for that final session um, and then I will go through the questions there's a few questions that have been answered but I'm just going to ask them again just for the benefit of others to hear um, so Michael you asked a couple of questions um, there is one about providing references for community stability index which Pierre has answered saying that he's currently writing paper um, so thank you Pierre and um, there is another one from you Michael about ha have you resolved how the CPR silk samples Vibrio cells are they attached to the copepods and Rita Colwell showed years ago that copepods are a natural host for Vibrio. So, Irina, do you want to just explain your answer to Michael there? Uh, yes. So, um, uh, before, I think we, we used a, a kind of a more a sort of a, a method that um, quant a, a, it was a relative quantification method. Uh, I think that we, um, this, in this particular project, we used a, a marker that um, on the Vibrio that directly binds to um, Vibrio chitin. Um, so, uh, sorry, excuse me, the copepod chitin um, out on its uh, outer surface. So everything that we detect is um, uh, Vibrio that is bound, that is bound to uh, copepods. Great stuff. Thank you, Rowena. And David, you had a question in the chat. Did you want to ask that live to the panellists? Yes, I could do. I just have to read it again. What I put? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I was wondering, do you, do you think we'll ever get to the stage where we'll be able to run sort of in situ, either molecular or other techniques and use them to identify plankton to species level and then use that through routine monitoring? So you imagine sort of using the CPR network of vessels so you could cover all the open oceans, but having something so robust that you could actually swap taxonomy and physical samples for for some other some other system so who's that question to well it's i suppose it's for well julie yourself I, rowena boris i think <laughs> rowena could talk about the biology and i could talk about the technology maybe yeah okay <laughs> so i think biologically it's perfectly possible 
um, it would never replace uh, traditional taxonomy because there's so much more information that you can get from the microscope uh, to do with it, sort of the condition of the, um, the cell, although even, even then you could make progress um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and associated things. But I think um, already you can detect things. Um, the level for doing it, you know, on a, on a kind of a, a sort of a, a monitoring scale, I'll, I'll leave Julie to, to answer that question. Yeah, so at the moment, really, we need the databases to be a little bit more rich um, in the surface ocean. It's not as bad of a problem as the deep ocean, but um, but it's still a problem. Um, but the in situ uh, sequencing, I mean, I did have a slide that I took out that um, basically there's components that exist. So there's an, an automated extraction device. There's a, a library preparation device and a sequencer that um, uh, Minion has have developed, and they're all miniaturized. Their idea is to get them in remote environments and field based, um, and so we're closer to it than a lot of people think. I think, but um, but yeah, it is a challenge. It's not going to be um, something that's going to happen in the next year. I don't think. Lovely. Thank you, Julie. And we've just got a hand up there from Chris Reed. Did you want to switch your microphone on, Chris? Camera as well, if you like, as a panellist. You're still on mute there, Chris. There we go. We can hear you. Yeah. Oh, hopefully you can still see me. I'm still awake. Yeah, we can. Well done. Yeah. Uh, uh, I... Uh... I just, it, it's fantastic to see all the uh, super ideas for technology. Um, uh, I, the, the one concern I have about all of these is that it will, uh, everybody, many of the people who will be funding the CPR program, the base, the base CPR program, will use the, these uh, ideas as uh, an opportunity to say, well, we, we, we can use technology instead of the CPR. Somewhere we've got to get the message over that you need to do the two things hand in hand. And the, the other aspect, which I was very familiar with when, uh, when, when I was uh, helping to run the CPR, uh, that when you are developing technology, uh, you're spending as much money as you are on the CPR program uh, in terms of staff. And uh, at, at, at the same time, uh, and that will continue into the future. And the, the processing of the data takes a lot more as well. So you, you need to double your, uh, if not treble, the amount of money that you've got to run the CPR program as you've got at the moment. I, I'm, I, I'm certain that this will, that costs will all come down in the future, but they haven't come down uh, in the last 20 to 30 years uh, of, of technology. Uh, to get to the fantastic position that we're in at the moment. So uh, I think all of this needs to be taken into consideration and in, in the in the future development. And somehow we need to be able to guarantee that the core CPR program that's given us this 90 year time series is maintained using the same methodologies. I don't I know how it can be done, but that's really important. Thank you. I was going to actually say that um, this is um, um, this is a key thing uh, that key, that Chris has mentioned. As soon as you, if you exchange technologies, you've essentially lost almost a hundred years of of data right there from not just the CPR survey but multiple long term time series. So there has to be a way of incorporating and and doing things in parallel. Um, so um, so. And so I agree, and maybe you're swapping different disciplines as well. There, there will always be need a need for experts at some level. Right, thank you. Oh. I could have wanted to add to that really quickly. That um, yeah, I think that this is a huge area of you know it's it's an issue because I'm in a technology group, right, and I'm writing technology proposals. But um, but yeah, I think we recognize it, and we know that the um, the the importance of the data, and I think that um, that that can't be trivialized. And I think, I mean, Willie and I have written a few proposals now to uh, to collect data in tandem because yeah, like Rowena said, it's not, we're not at a point really where we can use these uh, sequencing technologies at least um, to replace the taxonomic data yet, not in these, um, these larger time series, I don't think. 
Great, thank you very much. Just while we're talking about the future of CPR, can I just remind you, please, in the chat function, we've got a link to our survey um, and it would be fantastic. We've got 60 participants at the moment here. It'd be really wonderful if we get as many as possible, many people as possible, complete that survey. It would be a huge help to us. It's very quick. It's very easy. It's an online survey. Um, so if you could do that before you sign off today, we would be very grateful. If we got 60 responses, we will be dancing around in offices. So if you could do that, then that would be great. Thank you. Um, Willie, you've got your hand up. Would you like to put your camera on and microphone on? Yeah, I, do, I would just like to respond to some of that. And one thing to remember Chris, and I think it was probably you that told me that uh, there's a lot of technologies that have uh, come and gone, uh, and CPR has stayed there robust and consistent throughout. Uh, and, and the thing to remember, it's, it is the benchmark that everybody else is trying to emulate. Um, and, I, I, and I think anything, and, and we had a bit of a discussion about this earlier today, um, I mean, anything is to augment, it's using that word augment, but, but and, and sort of build on the what is already an excellent program. But I, I mean, I think you make, you make a really important point as well, Chris, around the, you know, the, the amount of uh, funding that's put into sort of developing these new technologies uh, could fund several CPR programs. But I, I think ultimately, that's what I mean, that's what funders want to see. Is, is where where it's going in the future and and how we can actually get to a, a level where we can uh, start uh, forecasting the the global ocean and to do that you're going to have to really um, find ways where you can get much more automated before you can get to a level uh, where you can do that there was a um, one and, and, and Julie and I have been in these discussions with one of the, the UN decade programs we're involved with that, you know, if there was as much investment went into forecasting the weather as there was to forecasting biodiversity, we would be able to do anything we wanted. You know, the, uh, you know the, if you think the, the amount of funding that goes into meteorological forecasting and modeling, um, it is just extraordinary. And you, I mean, you can find out, you, know, you can forecast what the weather's going to be like in a month from now almost, maybe not to sort of huge, well, certainly not in Devon anyway, they always get it wrong. But um, so, so yeah, I think I, I, I'm not, I'm not too concerned about it because actually anything that's done along these lines just really sort of highlights the, the value of the CPR. Um, so, so yeah, but I, I'm kind of preaching to the converted here. Um, Thank you, Willie. And we've got a, a question from John here. He says it's a naive, naive whole organism biologist question. A very good question, though. How much of an issue could the eDNA of extinct marine life be in the use of this technology to tackle biodiversity questions? Yeah, so it, it is an issue, so especially in sediments, right? Um, there's yeah, a whole field called ancient DNA that's looking at um, old DNA. So um, yeah, it's a problem, but in um, in most pelagic realms, um, especially in the surface ocean where there's UV light, um, it uh, free DNA degrades pretty quickly. Um, and I think that with bacterial degradation, they've shown that um, that eDNA has a lifetime of a few days. It's, I think it's 48 to 72 hours usually, um, but that's just the typical uh, eDNA sequence. So there's definitely gonna be some there that's that's older um great thank you julie um we've got a question here from phil as well he's just asking the key is um the human resource as was mentioned earlier and if you lose the interest of the next generation you won't have taxonomists um and just just from my perspective as, as i mentioned about the science journal for kids it's engaging sort of different audiences with our science as much as possible um but i wondered if any of the panel have got anything they'd like to add to that I, I think that you guys have these gorgeous images, right? So um, you think of Richard Kirby and all these uh, beautiful uh, plankton images, and that is the stuff that makes people do marine biology. Um, nobody's looking at sequence data and saying, I want to be a marine biologist, right? Um, so I think that there is that, that inspiration there. And, um, and what I 
don't understand is, um, I mean, for us, I think it's obvious, right? But I don't understand how that isn't, um, you know, it's always uh, NASA and astronomy and that's the cool, you know, looking at the stars is the cool thing to kids. But, um, but plankton, I mean, they're right here and, they're, you know, you need a microscope, but, um, but yeah, they're so much more interesting to me. Um, and I think, yeah, their, their beauty is just, yeah, it's, so I, I do think that that's, I think it is there. It's just a matter of, um, yeah, the, the long-term um at training i think once they get to college and and things like that like keeping that that interest okay thank you Judy. and is, is there anybody else that would like to add to that at all yes i just want to add something in um I, I mean, I agree with what Chris said about the technology and keeping the core of the CPR intact, because at the end of the day, this is the tr strength of the CPR. But um, technology can attract young people too. This is very important. We are talking about, for instance, taxonomists, but the taxonomists of yesterday, they might not be the same as the taxonomists as tomorrow. Uh, when you see the autocam, when you see the flow cam, we need taxonomists to work on those data. We, we need taxonomists to help artificial intelligence to automatically identify uh, taxon. And uh, you, the, to me, the future of taxonomy, it's also having taxonomists connected to the molecular side of things, taxonomics connecting to the imaging side of things, taxonomics coding, coding AI to identify things. So maybe it's because we have the, a quite an old vision of what a taxonomic is, a taxonomist is. I think taxonomists are there for a long time and they will be, they will be here in 90 years for sure. Great, thank you. And one of the taxonomists that we have got here has been around some time. That's Gerald Bolt. You've got your hand up. Do you want to ask a question there, Gerald? I don't know if you can unmute your microphone, Gerald. I'm not sure if it's working at the moment. David, did you have your hand up? And we'll come back to you, Gerald. Yeah, it was it was it was just very quick, just to sort of agree with Pierre. Um, you know, it's not just sort of the plankton work, but actually, there's lots of, of areas of marine research as well as probably terrestrial and all sorts where people are using image analysis, and a lot of the work is really focusing on sort of producing, um, you know, databases of images, image libraries, and all of those works need to all those images need to be checked by taxonomists and signed off. Um, and that's not going to go anywhere soon, you know, so, so we're going to need tax funds for a long time yet. Great, lovely. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions um, specific to this theme, but as we're sort of coming to the end of the day, um, does anybody have any sort of wider questions about the CPR or any, any thoughts about the future of the CPR or even any comments about today and the birthday, then please feel free to raise your hand or put a question into the Q&A function. We've got some messages coming through. Um, just just a, a, to note about um, entering into that survey. So if you add to your, if you fill in that survey, you also get entered into a competition to win one of Debbie Mason's prints as well, which were shared on the slide in between the um, the themes. Um, so that's that's there, and I can't see any more questions. Anybody got anything else they'd like to add? No, well, that leaves us with all our questions and answers and discussions for today, which is wrapping us up with pretty much perfect timing. We've been on time for every single theme today. So thank you, everyone, for being incredible timekeepers. It's been a fantastic day. Thank you to all the people behind the scenes. I'm going to pass you back to David now um, for any final comments for our CPR 90 celebration. And I hope to see you in 10 years time. Thanks, Maya. There's not much else to say from me, just to say thank you very much for everybody for turning up today and giving up your time to, to hear what we've um, what we've been up to and how we wanted to celebrate our CPR 90th. Not ideal that we couldn't meet in person, but, you know, I think we've made the best of it. Um, yeah, amazingly, it's all gone to time. And I think actually having people send their, their speeches in was um, is, that's definitely the future. You know, no timing issues there. That was great. Um, so I think that's probably it. So unless anybody on the panel had anything else to say, um, I just echo what Maya said and let's look forward to the hundredth. Thank you.
Thanks very much, everybody. We look forward to welcoming you to the MBA as soon as possible and uh, we'll enjoy the cake on your behalf. So thank you for joining us today. See you all later.